and slowly everyone is sitting down. Begeer Raten, Hewaal. Good afternoon. Welcome, friends, on behalf of BAC, Basis for Actuele Kunst in Utrecht, the Utrecht University, Centraal Museum Utrecht, the Unrepresented Nations and People's Organizations, and the team of the New World Summit. And I hereby welcome you to the second day of the sixth New World Summit in Utrecht on the subject of stateless democracy. My name is Jonas Staal. I'm artist and founder of the New World Summit. I also gave an introduction yesterday. Today will be much shorter to summarize just for the people that are joining us new for this second day of the, of the program. The New World Summit, for those who don't know it, is an artistic and political organization founded in 2012 with the task to develop what we call alternative parliaments for stateless and blacklisted organizations from all over the world. And the space where we are sitting in this construction is such a proposition of an alternative parliament that we'll be using for our discussions in the coming days. We are in a uh, historical space where in 1579 the Union of Utrecht was signed, which is regarded as one of the important historical moments in Dutch history when it came to the creation of the modern Dutch nation state. We're here to challenge the foundations of this notion of, the, of this model of the nation state, to explore the crises of democracy in our current state structures and to explore possible alternatives. Yesterday, we started our first day on the subject of stateless democracy, during which we discussed the crisis of democracy in the current war on terror. And the subject today is called stateless democracy, and it forms the heart of this New World Summit, in which the Kurdish revolutionary movement and its political project of democratic confederalism takes a central role. Democratic confederalism was explained by revolutionary and founder of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, PKK, Abdullah Öcalan, as democracy without the state. The explanation of democ democratic confederalism. Democracy without the state. Hence, stateless democracy. The term that brings this, uh, that the, the, the, the theme, the main subject of this summit and this day in particular. Stateless democracy has, as an ideal, has been developed over decades of political struggle from the foundation of the PKK in Bakur, in North Kurdistan. And for those who would not know that, to place that geographically, then we're talking about Southeast Turkey. But in this Congress, we talk about Bakur, North Kurdistan, to the 2011 Rojava revolution in West Kurdistan. That would be Northern Syria, but here we speak of Rojava, West Kurdistan. Its ideology is founded on the fundamental critique of the nation state as a nationalist, patriarchal and capitalist structure and stateless democracy, different from the nation state, proposes a form of decentralized self-government based on principles of gender equality, self-defense and communal economy. <clears throat> the history, practice and future of this model of stateless democracy will be introduced in detail today with the help of three prominent representatives of the Kurdish movement, Dilek Öcalan, uh, Zuhar Kobani, who is replacing Saleh Muslim, who is stuck in Geneva at this, at this time, where <clears throat> on behalf of the Democratic Union Party, he should be part of the Geneva Free Convention discussing the future of Syria, and it's a great shame to the international community that the Kurdish revolutionaries who are at the forefront in this struggle to build a democratic Syria and a democratic Kurdish region within it are not part of this negotiations, but we're proud to have them present here with us today. And Dilar Dirik, the third representative, we're deeply honored with their presence, as well as with the presence of their panelists, Jody Dean, Sadet Karabulut, Leila Khaled, Jennifer McCann, uh, Gorka El Jabarieta, Quim Arufat, Mireya Vehi, Angela Dimitra Kaki, and Karim Abdiam. Yesterday, in this parliament, we were surrounded by pages from the Guantanamo diary, written by Mohamedou Ultslahi, prisoner in Guantanamo Bay since 2002. We saw around us his handwritten words from this diary. We saw how they were covered by black squares, the residue of censorship of the United States government, an image that gave testimony to the failures of democracy in the current war on terror. Today, around us in this space, we're surrounded by very different images. What we see are the flags, the new symbols that came about as a result of the Kurdish revolutionary struggle and the ideal of stateless democracy. We have dis displayed these symbols as a 
confederation in the spirit of democratic confederalism, stars and suns crossing from one flag to another, forming a new composition that symbolizes an urgent and a very real and a very concrete new political horizon that we have the pleasure of discussing here today. From left to right, we have the Star Union of Women, the Yakitia Star, the flag of Rojava. After that comes the flag of the People's Protection Units, the Democratic Union Party all the way in the back is the flag of TEFDEM, the Movement for Democratic Society. One step further are the communities of Kurdistan. Then we have the Women's Protection Units, the YPG, the Communities of Women of Kurdistan, and the rev Revolutionary Young Women from Rojava. And at the back of this space, behind me, there is an ideological map of the model of democratic confederalism, the model of stateless democracy, designed by Dilar Dirik and designer Remco van Bladel. Following the shape of a tree, it shows, it visualizes a new model of power that takes the commune as its roots. It is the second time that Dilar Dirik, our final speaker of today, has co-designed parts of our parliament. And for us, that shows the importance of combining the domains of art and politics and activism to realize new visual models of political and ideological representation. It's a great chance to learn of status democracy today by some of its most knowledgeable representatives. But while we do so, we also keep our thoughts to the, we keep in our thoughts the current situation in Rojava and in Bakur. On the front lines of Rojava, the People's and Women's Protection Units continue to fight Daesh, the so-called Islamic State, to liberate occupied villages and cities. And on the background, the Erdogan regime, let's not even give it the pleasure of talking about the Turkish government, it's a regime. The Erdogan regime blocks all travel in and out of the region, stopping building supplies and humanitarian aid necessary to reconstruct this war-torn region. In Bakur, the, that very same Erdogan regime has started an all-out war against its Kurdish population, both in response to the success of the Kurdish revolution in Rojava, as well as the success of the pro-Kurdish Democratic People's Party, the HDP, that was able to enter Turkish parliament during the last two elections, uh, despite the enormous threshold of 10%. The Erdogan regime explains obstructing Rojava and murdering its Kurdish population as its own war on terror. The PKK being designated a terrorist organization in the United States and the European Union. And thus it allows its NATO partner, carte blanche, in enacting the most brutal form of state terror, putting whole cities, such as Jazeer and Ahmed and Silopi, under siege and killing hundreds since last summer. It was only last Tuesday, January 26, that we celebrated the one year anniversary of the liberation of the city of Kobani in Rojava, which was courageously defended with the most improvised means by the People's and Women's Defense Forces Protection Units for 100, 134 days against brutal attacks of Daesh. The Rojava revolutionaries have often described the struggle in Kobani as a struggle for humanity, as a fight against Daesh, but also a fight for a new political model that could bring peace to the Middle East East and inspire emancipatory politics the world over. And it is our conviction that it is now time for the world to return that favor, to return the favor for fighting the battles for which we are also partly responsible, especially in this case, we are at the foundational place of the modern Dutch state that supported the war on Iraq, that destabilized that region, made it possible, created the conditions for Daesh to come into being in the first place. And now we blacklist those people that are actually fighting the, the, the threats that we have created ourselves. That means, and there's concrete things that we can do and that people in this room can do. Ending the EU funding to the Erdogan regime, such as the three billion euros that we handed them over to stop refugees from coming into Europe. Refugees that are fleeing wars for which we are in part responsible. There's other things we can do. The recognition of the Rojava region as an autonomous region, not as a state, but on its own conditions, the recognition of the Rojava region on its own terms. Delisting the PKK, 
Justice for Sakina Jansis, co-founder of the PKK, murdered with two fellow comrades, Fidan Dogan and Leila Soilemes, on January 9, 2013, in the heart of Paris. We also commemorated that day this month. And freedom for Abdullah Öcalan, revolutionary leader of the movement, imprisoned in, and isolated in Turkey since 1999. The New World Summit has worked with representatives of the Kurdish revolutionary movement since 2012. Its ideas have shaped our organizations in so many ways. The very idea of this parliament, of a parliament without a state, or at the very least questioning the state, a stateless parliament, it was directly inspired by the ideals of stateless democracy and our many discussions with representatives from the movement. To organize today's program, our special thanks go out to our long-term collaborator, Sharon Hassan, European representative of the Democratic Union Party, as well as Maslum Django, also a representative of the PYD, Adam Uzun of the Kurdistan National Congress, Kanan Tastan of the Kurdish Federation of the Netherlands, as well as Ronahi Mohammed of the Young Women's Movement. And of course, our thanks and our thoughts go to our friends in the democratic self-administration of Rojava that our team has had the privilege of visiting three times, Osama Mohammed, Judy Osse, Hussein Adam, many others with whom we organized the last New World Summit in the autonomous region and with whom we are currently building a new public parliament in the city of Derek that will be inaugurated with the next New World Summit. The next New World Summit will be in Rojava again in April this year. Our great gratitude in that regard goes to Amina Ossem, chair of the Committee of Foreign Affairs of Rojava's Jazeera Canton. Amina was the one who was supposed to give the opening lecture today, but she was not allowed to cross the border to leave Rojava. And that is symptomatic for the embargoes that the autonomous region is facing. Amina is one of the most inspiring and one of the most visionary voices determined to overcome these borders and all that these borders stand for. And we will read out a message of her to all of you on the final day of this summit. To lead us into the program of today, of the second day of the New World Summit, in Utrecht, it's my pleasure to introduce you the chair of the day, Joost Jongerden, assistant professor of the Rural Sociology Group at the University of Wageningen in the Netherlands, and specially appointed as an associate professor at the Kyoto University in Japan. He has written extensively about the history of the Kurdish struggle in Bakur and Turkey, the development of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, and its influence in establishing democratic confederalism, stateless democracy in the autonomous Kurdish region of Rojava in northern Syria. Joost Jongeren is one of the most knowledgeable, one of the most precise voices in the Netherlands when it comes to contextualizing and helping us to understand the history of this movement and what this movement stands for. In October 2005, he took part in the fifth New World Summit in Rojava as a member of the international delegation, and it's a really great pleasure to have him here today as a chair of the first panel of the day. Joost, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Jonas. Thank you, uh, Jonas. Gerati uh, Rojbash, welcome. Good afternoon. It's indeed a great pleasure to, uh, to be here. Um, Jonas already told you that I joined the delegation of the New World Summit in uh, October 2015 to Rojava. And um, in this setting, with these flags, with these images, it almost feels like being back in Rosh Ava. Let me, let me briefly say, introduce the guests for uh, today, um, and then I will continue with a, with a short introduction. We have uh, Dilek Öcalan. Uh, she is Member of Parliament for the People's Democratic Party, and she will be the main speaker of uh, today. And then we have two discussants. It's uh, Jody Dean, a political theorist and professor of uh, political sciences from the United States. And we have Sadat uh, Karabolut, an activist and a member of parliament in the Netherlands for the Socialist uh, Party. Um, Jody Dean and Sadat uh, Karabolut will be the discussants for uh, today. I will give a more elaborate introduction uh, later when we go to their speeches. Um, but we we'll, would like to start with a short introduction on 
the Kurds on Kurdistan, on the Kurdistan liberation movement, which somehow is the architect of that new paradigm of democratic confederalism, um, also referred to as stateless uh, democracy. And when you give a talk on Kurds and Kurdistan, it's somehow apparently tempting to start by telling that the Kurds are the fourth large population in West A uh, Asia with 30 to 40 million of people, that Kurdistan is in the northern part of the Middle East, but I will not um, give you more of this textbook knowledge. Today we want to discuss stateless democracy, and because we want to discuss stateless democracy, I want to tell you, I want to tell you about Ekin Van, a female guerrilla killed and stripped of her clothes, after which security forces dragged her naked body on the ground and left it in the town center of Varto in Bakur. I want to tell you about Hoji, uh, uh, Haji Lokman Birlik, a 24-year-old youngster who was active in cinema as, a, as, an, as, as an actor and as a producer. And he was killed by security forces who opened random fire at civilians. And they dragged his body behind an armored vehicle through the city of Shirnak on October 4, 2015. And there are many Ekin Wans. And there are many Haji Lokman Birliks. As we speak today, 28 wounded people are trapped in a basement in Gisr already for eight days. They're trapped in a basement in Bakur, in southeast Turkey, in a basement. And of these 28 people, and I wrote today on the text, six already died. But one hour ago, we received the news that another person died. So seven people already died, and the others are in life-threatening conditions. And the municipality of Gisra every day sent the ambulance several times to the place where they are trapped. But the Turkish military forces, security forces, do not allow the ambulance to reach those wounded people, neither do they allow medical treatment. And as we speak, they are bleeding to death. Since the emergence of the modern state system in the Middle East, the Kurds have been exposed in a systematic manner to denial and degradation, to violence and death. And that's not related to having rights, it's related to, the, to not having the right to have rights. They do not have the right to claim the right on their language. They do not have the right to claim the right to self-administration. And they do not have the right to claim a right to a livable life. And it's in that context that the Kurds in Bakur, the Kurds in Rojava, that they claim self-administration. The solution process, a term which was used to refer to talks and negotiations between the PKK and the Turkish state, installed hope in the minds of many. Yet hope turned into a nightmare where blank when blanket curfews were imposed on major Kurdish cities, accompanied by the, develop, by the deployment of shadowy special forces, the Lions of Allah, Esedullah teams, the Lions of Allah, a force about who, no, whom nobody knows who are exactly in, but according to information which sometimes triples down bit by bit, uh, part of the forces are recruited from ISIS militants. So the deployment of special forces along with heavy shelling, sniper fire, preventing people from burying their deaths and getting to hospital, and a litany of other such rights infringements. That's in Bakur. 
In Syria, we see a war between sectarian forces, between those who try to stay in power or try to stay the state as such, and those sectarian forces trying to become the state. Islamic State or Daesh, al-Nusra, and they compete in atrocity. And as Jonas also said, it's a shame that in the negotiations, which are starting in Geneva, the sectarian forces are invited, and the sectarian forces are invited to discuss the future of Syria, while the PYD, the Syrian Democratic Forces, the Kurds, who stand for a plural, secular democracy, are until now excluded. A shame. In Iraq, we see the same, sectarian war. And Iran, well, we received the news about the end of an embargo, but there's also the non-news about the routine executions of political uh, opposition, among them many Kurds. And if I have to make an assessment of the current situation, I would like to paraphrase Marx. Not only the history of capitalism, but the history of the modern nation state, and I cite, is written in the annals of mankind in letters of blood and fire. End of citation. And against this background, something interesting is occurring, something fascinating. And not only interesting and fascinating, but something which is interesting and fascinating occurs outside of us. It's about the them. But there is also something occurring which is about hope. And hope comes from inside. And it's hope because it's about democracy. It's about the rethinking of democracy, which is taking place in the context of the revolution in Rojava and also in the context of the struggle of the revolution in Bakur. And that's the struggle for a stateless democracy, the struggle for an active citizenship or democratic confederalism, or what name you would like to attach to that. The movement, which is somehow the architect of this new idea of active citizenship, of stateless democracy, is the PKK. And I will say a few words about the PKK before I will introduce our next uh, speaker. And we think often about the PKK as a political party. And of course, it is a political party. But over the years, it has been developed into a complex of parties and institutions. So we have the PKK, the Kurdistan Workers' Party, um, but there's also the women, the female sister party. Um, we have the Democratic Union Party, PYD, which comes from the tra tradition. We have parties in Iraqi Kurdistan and Iranian Kurdistan, which comes from these traditions. We have legal unions, a women movement, youth organizations. There are legal political parties, and they all share the same political horizon, the same political idea. They are independent from each other from an organizational perspective, but they move in the same direction. And that I refer to as PKK, but also as the Kurdistan Liberation uh, Movement. That new paradigm is developed by Abdullah Öcalan. His name is already mentioned several times, the imprisoned leader of the PKK. Uh, maybe it's good to listen to what Öcalan has to say about that new paradigm and also the background from where it comes. And in one of his publications on the democratic civilization, Öcalan says, as a critique, Contrary, and I cite, contrary to what is thought, capitalism does not mean economic development, but the systematic denial of economy. The nation state, he says, does not equal democracy, freedom, and human rights, but is the denial of these values. And what we see with the nation state in the European, in the Middle Eastern context, is something like a centralized assimilation machine. It aims to transform cultures into culture, languages into language, and it borders or it surveys 
um, borders and its people. The alternative, the alternative is also, hey, that is that the idea of stateless democracy, which is also fought through by PKK leader Erdogan. And what Erdogan says is that people are to be directly involved in decision making and decision finding processes of society. And Erdogan says that this relies on self-government of local community and it's organized in the form of open councils, town councils, local parliaments and long, larger congresses. And this he refers to as demo uh, democratic confederalism. I will not say more about democratic confederalism and self-administration right now. I think it's time to give the floor to, uh, to uh, Dilek Öcalan. As I said, she is a member of parliament from the HDP. It's a secular progressive democratic party in Turkish parliament. And she is in parliament a member of the parliament's committee on equal rights for men and women, as it is called in Turkish. HDP is a, or each day the DP is a radical democratic party. It's secular. It introduced a gender equal co-chairing system in politics in Turkey. And in line with that, it has a 50% gender quota. And to 1% quota for LGBT community in the party council. HDP is an associate member of the party of European Socialists and a consultative member of the Socialist International. The HDP is facing structural criminalization today from the side of the Erdogan regime of Turkey, which accuses the party of being under the command of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, PKK. It's not. But as I said, they share the same political horizon, the political ideas. HDP participates in national elections. It passed the 10% threshold. 13% it took in the elections of June 2015, in which the AKP lost its absolute majority and could not continue to rule as it was used to rule. And the AKP corrected this result by means of an elective robbery of HDP votes under the disguise of constitutional procedures. And one of the responses, one of the responses of the Kurdish movement to state power has been the development and the declaration of self-administration. And I'm sure that Dilek Öcalan will tell us more about this idea of self-administration. Dilek, the floor is yours. Ez dukhazim seri da zumane khwa zikmaki wa hamia slav bkim. I would like to first greet you in my mother uh, tongue language. Uh, warmly greet you all. It's on? Yeah, okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Did you all hear what I said? No. Okay. He, she said, I would like to first greet you all in my native uh, mother tongue language. Uh, and I would like to all, uh, I would like to greet you all very warmly. Serida hevale mei jin, disa hevale mei khortu juwan, u hemu beshtervanan ve hemia brezdari slav dikim. Ez dibejim du navbere ve de iru nikasheki pirgring eme çebikin, duyu varidaji ez gelik kevkhash u serbelindim. First of all, I would like to uh, greet our uh, young people, uh, our women, and I'm very happy to be here to have a very interesting discussion today. Disa de Bakure Kurdistan da sherek dijwar berdevam dike. Dwi sherida de shehiden demokrasiye ez bibirtinim u ber tekoshinevan ez bejnekha de tevinim u despeke min khas ez sheiden tekoshineji ez em birbinim. Um, there is a war going on in, in uh, northern Kurdistan, uh, in Turkey, Bakur, 
Um, and I would like to um, extend my respect to the, the uh, martyrs of democracy uh, who have lost their life um, to give us a better future. Hepimizin bildiği gibi Orta Doğu'da şu an derin bir siyasi, toplumsal, ekonomik ve kültürel kaos ve kriz yaşanmaktadır. As you all know, uh, nowadays in Middle East there is um, a, a deep uh, chaos, uh, not only politically but also socially, uh, economically and culturally, um, and, and, and crisis is, is going on. Bu kaos ve krizin temelinde Orta Doğu genelinde ve bölge devletleri özelinde statü koyu korumayı esas alan bir siyaset anlayışı ve yapılanmasının hakim olması yatmaktadır. The reason for this chaos and crisis is because the, the states, uh, the nation states and, and Middle East, um, they want to protect um, they, their status quo um, and, and they want to continue the, their um, hegemonial powers and, and the region. Dolayısıyla egemen klasik siyaset anlayışının toplum tarafından faydalı bir iş olarak görülmesi sorunu çözen bir mekanizma olarak algılanması yaklaşımı yoktur. Therefore um, the dominant um, mentality or hegemonial mentality um, that doesn't respect uh, the rights of people in the region is, it is not seen to be accepted by the people of the region. Dolayısıyla bunun için de bu tarz bir siyaset topluma yabancıdır ve toplum ondan uzak durur. Therefore this type of um, this type of mentality is strange to uh, people and and people stay away from it. Amaçları böyle dar ve devletçi, antidemokratik çerçevede çizilen bir antidemokratik çerçevede çizilen bir siyasetin siyasetçilerine düşen ise halk adına halka rağmen ve halk karşıtı bir faaliyet olmaktadır. Um, the goals which are status uh, and also narrow um, and against uh, people's interest um, will not be uh, also supported by, by people um, uh, who, who, are, who are not taking part in this, in this, um, in this, um, uh, in this struggle and, and they will never be successful um, despite people. Toplumun değil, devletin çıkarlarını esas alır. Because they're not taken into account the uh, society's interest, they are taken into account um, the state's interest. Devlete kulluğu meşrulaştırır. It, it makes um, people being the slave of the state legit. Dolayısıyla toplumu siyasetin dışına iten, siyaseti statü, statü konun korunması çabasına indirgeyen, tekçi, eril ve antidemokratik baskıcı ve inkarcı planlamanın bir zihniyetin aşılması Orta Doğu için bir zorunluluktur. Therefore it is mandatory for Middle East um, to overcome uh, a mentality that uh, that keeps the society uh, outside the politics and and that um, is based on monist type of thinking it's anti-democratic is oppressive and is also denier of of, um, of of the people who uh, would like to be themselves. Birinci Dünya Savaşı'nda Saispikot anlaşmasıyla Orta Doğu'da yapay sınırlar çizen emperyal güçler halklar ve kültürleri bölmüşlerdir. During the first world war um, the with the agreement of Sykes Picot um, there have the, the artificial borders have been uh, put in place by uh, imperialist uh, powers and uh, and then uh, those powers have divided cultures and and and nations Artık bu yapay sınırlar dağılmakta <coughs> ve yeni dinamikler çerçevesinde şekillenmektedir. These artificial borders um, are now um, being broken uh, and new di dynamics um, are, are being formed. Yeniden belirlenecek sınırlar halkların gönüllü birlikteliğini esas alacak bir şekilde olmak zorundadır. The um, new borders that will be determined um, uh, have to be based on voluntary togetherness of people 
um, and and uh, and no in another way. Aksi takdirde başta Kürtler olmak üzere bölgedeki bütün halklar yeni acılar yaşamaya devam edecektir. Otherwise, starting with Kurds um, and other nations within the region will continue to suffer from this situation. Orta Doğu'daki mevcut devlet yapılanmaları Avrupa'daki ulus devletlerin kötü bir kopyası gibidirler. The uh, nation states exist in uh, Middle East are a bad copy of um, states in Europe, uh, nation states in Europe. Ulus devletin Orta Doğu geleneğiyle bütünleşmesini ifade eden mevcut bölge devletleri ve bu devletlerin geleneksel yapıları Orta Doğu halklarının özgürlük, eşitlik ve kardeşlik özlemlerinin önünde birer bariyer gibi durmaktadırlar. The um, structure of the states in Middle East uh, and their uh, traditional uh, way of governing their people um, is a very uh, big barrier um, in front of uh, peoples uh, equality um, and, and, and freedom um, and so on. Orta Doğu'daki hiçbir devletin demokratik bir sistemle yönetilememesi ne kadar haklı olduğumuzun da göstergesidir. The fact that there is no state in Middle East that is uh, being run democratically shows how right we are. Türkiye ve İran gibi görece seçimlerin yapıldığı yerlerde ise devlet iktidarını tekeline alan oligarşik bir vesayet sistemi vardır. Uh, in, in countries like Turkey and Iran where there are uh, elections, uh, so-called elections are being uh, made, um, are, uh, are, are just a way of keeping the oligarchic power in place. Orta Doğu'da halklar arasında hiçbir zaman bir sorun yaşanmamıştır. In Middle East there have never been problems between nations. Sorunun kaynağı mevcut devletlerin varlığı ve politikalarıdır. The source of the problem is the existence of the states, uh, nation states that exist in the Middle East. Irak ve Suriye'deki kaos bu devletlerin halka dayan, dayanmadığının da göstergesidir. The, the chaos in Iraq and, and Syria, uh, Syria is, is a big proof of the fact that these, um, these uh, states are not based on people's uh, will. Halka dayanan, meşruiyetini halktan alan hiçbir devlet düzeni kolay kolay yıkılamamıştır. The uh, states that are established based on people's will, um, they will never lose their legitimacy. Orta Doğu'daki devletlerin, halkların demokratik taleplerini boğan sistemlerine karşı alternatif bir sistem bugün Rojava'da yaşanan devrimle doğmaktadır. In, in Middle East, in response to the, the states which are very oppressive to uh, people's uh, demands, um, the uh, alternative is democratic confederalism. Rojava'da kanton özerk bölge yönetimlerin kurulmasıyla kanton bölgede yaşayan halkların özgürlüğü ve eşitliği teminat altına alınmıştır. With the establishment of democratic um, uh, democratic autonomous regions in Rojava, um, the freedom and equality of nations living there is being guaranteed. Özel yönetim bölgelerinde halk seçilmiş kurum ve meclisler aracılığıyla kendisinin yönetir. In um, autonomous uh, democratic regions in, in Rojava, people um, uh, find the opportunity to self-govern themselves um, with the uh, institutions they establish or with themselves uh, in those institutions. Rojava Anayasası'nın giriş bölümü bile bir halklar ve özgürlükler manifestosu niteliğindedir. The introduction of Rojava's constitution is like a, a manifestation of uh, people uh, and freedom. Anayasanın giriş bölümü şöyle başlamaktadır. The introduction of constitution starts like this. Din, dil, ırk, inanç, mezhep ve cinsiyet ayrımının olmadığı eşit ve ekolojik bir toplumda adalet, özgürlük ve demokrasinin sesi için demokratik toplum bileşenlerinin siyasi, ahlaki yapısıyla birlikte çoğulcu, 
özgün ve ortak yaşam değerlerinin kavuşması için discrimination or separation on religion, uh, language, uh, race, uh, sectarian or gender um, and for a society that is ecologic uh, and for a, a society which lives with freedom and which uh, lives in democracy and um, in, in, in for, for the elements of uh, democratic, um, democratic society uh, with the um, politically and, and ethically um, having uh, a pluralist original um, and, and um, having common values, um, ha having respect for women rights uh, and, and, and kids um, and making sure women um, have uh, established uh, rights which are which cannot be changed. Kadın haklarına saygı ve çocuk ile kadınların haklarının kölele, köleleşmesi için savunma, öz savunma, inançlara özgürlük ve saygı için bizler demokratik özel bölgelerin halkları küt Okay. Yeah. For the uh, respect uh, of rights of women um, and, and, and kids um, for the um, defense, self defense and respect to beliefs Uh, we, the, um, the nations of democratic uh, autonomous regions, Kürtler, Araplar, Süryaniler, Asuri ve Arami, Türkmenler ve Çeçenler olarak bu sözleşmeyi kabul ediyoruz. We as Kurds, Arabs, Assyrians, uh, Türkmens, um, Çeçens, we accept this uh, agreement. Demokratik özel bölge yönetimleri ulus devleti, askeri ve dini devlet anlayışını aynı zamanda merkezi yönetimi ve iktidarı kabul etmez. Democratic autonomous uh, region administrations uh, do not accept nation state, military um, and, and, and religious um, state mentality uh, and also uh, the, the central, central authority. Uh. Özel yönetim Siyasi partiler, halk meclisleri, etnik ve inanç grupları temsilcilerinden oluşmaktadır. The um, democratic, um, the democratic ad autonomous administration consists of political parties, um, uh, people's assembly, um, et et etnic and, and belief groups are being represented there. Yönetim tabandan örgütlenir. The administration uh, starts uh, being organized from the bottom. Buna yeah. göre köy, belde, ilçe, mahalle ve kentlerde halk meclisleri ve komünleri oluşturulur. In this respect in villages and towns and, and, and cities and, and districts of cities and in also big cities um, assemblies, people's assemblies and, and communal uh, um, groups are being established. Köy temsilcilerinden belde, belde temsilcilerinden ilçeler, ilçe mahalle temsilcilerinden ise kent meclisleri oluşur. From assemblies of villages, um, they uh, form uh, the assembly of towns. From the assemblies of towns, they uh, form uh, assemblies of, uh, of cities. Um, and, and in the uh, districts of, of cities, they also form um, uh, assemblies which eventually become the assembly of the big cities. Yine kent meclislerinin içerisinde ayrıca siyasi partiler, etnik ve inanç grupları, kadın ve gençlik meclis ve örgütleri, sivil toplum örgütleri yer alır. Also uh, many other uh, people are being represented in these assemblies. For example, um, women, um, the, the Young, uh, young people assembly, um, uh, non-profit organizations, um, different uh, ethnicities and, and belief groups are being represented. Özel sistemde her etnik ve inanç grubu ile gençlik ve kadın yine sivil toplum örgütleri ve meslek grupları da örgütlenmelere giderek meclisler içerisinde yer alır. Also in, in democratic um, autonomous system or democratic con confederalism, every uh, ethnicity, uh, belief group, um, uh, young people, 
uh, non-profit organizations, um, uh, different type of professional uh, groups um, have the opportunity to um, be organized and be represented. Kent meclislerinin temsilcilerinden de özel bölgelerin genel meclisleri oluşur. And from the cities um, assemblies, um, the um, regions general assemblies are being uh, constituted. Aynı zamanda yasama meclisi olan özel bölge meclisleri de bölge yönetimini oluşturur. Um, the, the, the the legislator, uh, which the the the regions assembly, which is also the the legislator, um, is forming the uh, main uh, administration of the region. Yönetim siyasi parti etnik, kültürel ve dini yapıların temsil oranlarına göre belirlenir. The administration is determined on the basis of um, the uh, the uh, ratios of um, ethnicities, uh, culture, different cultures, or uh, different uh, belief groups. Demokratik özellik, merkezi, bürokratik, tekçi devlet mekanizmasının ve ona yön veren milliyetçiliğin reddi ve onun yarattığı sorunların aşılması anlamına gelmektedir. Democratic confederalism uh, means that we we um, we are overcoming a bureaucratic, uh, monist, uh, devlet uh, state mechanism, um, and and um, and also uh, a mentality, a nationalist mentality, which actually uh, gives the direction to that type of uh, state uh, mechanism, um, and and it's also um, a response to all the problems created by that type of uh, structure. Çoğulcu, demokratik, eşitlikçi ve dayanışmacı bir anlayışın siyasete hakim kılınmasını hedeflemektedir. The purpose of democratic confederalism is to have a, a pluralist, uh, democratic, um, equal, uh, solidar um, uh, mentality to be um, to, to be um, uh, to be established uh, within uh, the political arena. Devlet yapılanmasının Çoğulculuğa, farklı renklere ve seslere açılması, tekçi devlet yapılanmasının çoğulculaştırılması iddiasındadır. The, um, the state mechanism um, that, that will be open to pluralist type of uh, mentality, different colors, different voices will be, um, will be against a monist uh, state mechanism uh, which actually with this will become pluralist. Yine yetkinin merkezde toplandığı bürokratik ve hantal mekanizmanın aşılması yerinden yönetim ilkesinin yaşam bulmasını amaçlamaktadır. The purpose is to um, overcome a bürokratik and sloppy uh, state mechanism um, and uh, establish instead of that um, a, a, a local uh, administration uh, principle. Devletin kendinde merkezileştirdiği yetkilerinin halka paylaştırılması, halkın siyasete çekilmesi, siyasetin çekim ve çözüm gücü haline getirilmesidir. The um, authorities that state has uh, actually uh, pulled it itself or, or gathered in itself uh, are to be shared with people. Um, uh, to make sure people are involved in, in politics um, and politics to become uh, an attraction center for, for people who are involved in that politics. Dört yılda bir sandığa gitmenin demokrasi olmadığı çoktandır dile getirilen bir husustur. Going for election every four years is already known for a while that is not the democracy. Tüm vatandaşların kendi yaşam alanları ve sorunları başta olmak üzere söz sahibi olması, uygulama ve çözüm gücü haline gelmesi, devlete bağımlılığın en asgariye indirgenmesi hedefleyen bir siyasal mekanizmanın açığa çıkarılması, demokratik özelliğin siyaset ilkelerini oluşturmaktadır. What constitutes the principle of democratic confederalism is to make sure um, citizens are deciding uh, for what, what kind of life they want to live uh, and what kind of um, uh, environment they want to live and not only to decide for that but also to make sure they are 
the ones who are executing uh, the decisions around it. Demokratik özellik başta Kürt halkı olmak üzere bölge halklarının bir araya gelerek kendi demokrasilerini kurma ve kendi toplumsal sistemlerini organize etme hareketidir. Democratic confederalism starting with Kurds is the movement to make sure regions people they come together and they decide for their own uh, future uh, and system and they organize their own system. İçte demokratik ulusu, dışta ise ulus üstü yapılanmayı ifade eder. Within um, the uh, democratic confederalism, uh, it aims uh, to establish a democratic nation and, and um, towards outside, um, it is um, a, a, a nation, uber nation type of uh, structure. Toplumun siyasal, sosyal, ekonomik, kültürel, inanç ve mezhepsel, etnik, cinsiyet özgürlüğüne dayalı, ekolojik, komünal alandaki örgütlenmelerinin birliği ve örgütlenmiş toplumun kendi kendini yönetme organizasyonudur. Democratic confederalism is, a, um, is, is, is something that um, society um, is self-governing itself. It's based on uh, equality of different ethnicities, uh, the, the freedom of uh, gender, um, uh, establishing an ecologic and, and communal um, uh, society. Türkiye başta olmak üzere Orta Doğu'daki devletlerin merkeziyetçi yapısına alternatif olarak yerel demokrasinin güçlendirilmesi, toplumun yönetime daha aktif katılımı ve kararların yerelden alınması demokratik özelliğin temelini oluşturur. Um, in, in, in response to um, the, the um, states uh, central, uh, the states that have central authority uh, like Turkey, um, establishing local um, reinforce as an alternative uh, having um, reinforced local democracies and making sure a society can actively participate in, in, in political decisions and making sure decisions are actually taken locally is the uh, foundation of democratic confederalism eğitim sağlık bütçe gibi konuların merkez yerine yerelde tartışılarak karara bağlanması ve uygulanmasına dönüktür um, deciding on, on topics like the, like uh, education, uh, health, and budget locally uh, and executing them locally is also part of democratic confederalism. Özerk bölge ve kentlerde farklı halklar ve inanç topluluklarının yönetime katılması, kadınların tüm karar mekanizmalarında eşit temsili, eğitimin öz yönetime bırakılması yine önerilerimiz arasındadır. Some of our recommendations, among others, are to uh, make sure um, in different cities, different um, uh, nations and, and belief groups are represented. Um, the women are equally represented. Uh, the education is left to, um, is left to uh, local authorities um, and, and um, is, is among what we recommend. Toprak, su ve enerji kaynaklarının özerk bölgelere devri ve özerk bölge yönetiminin denetiminde yereldeki asayişin tümünü sağlayacak resmi yerel güvenlik birimlerinin kurulması bu birimlerin anayasal kurallar çerçevesinde ihtiyaçlara bağlı olarak kurulmuş merkezi savunma ve güvenlik birimleriyle koordineli olarak çalışması yine başlıklarımız arasındadır. Some of other uh, considerations we have for democratic con confederalism is to um, transfer the uh, administration of land, water, and energy to, um, to autonomous regions, um, to make sure also security is arranged and, and executed by um, the autonomous uh, regions' powers um, in accordance with the uh, constitutional rights. Um, and, and, and also the security forces should be um, working in coordination with the central security powers. Orta Doğu'da Kürtler başta olmak üzere halkların özgür iradelerine pranga vurulmuştur. 
in Middle East, starting with Kurds, um, the um, the free will of of uh, the, the free will of of people ha has been uh, strictly consigned, confined. Orta Doğu'nun merkeziyetçi ve üniter devletleri yerelde neyin iyi, neyin kamu yararına olduğuna karar vererek bu yetkisinin sadece kendilerinde olduğunu düşünmektedirler. In Middle East centralist and uh, unitary uh, uh, type of states um, have the right to decide what is good and what is bad for um, local um, for, for, for local people and, and what is also good for people um, and, and that's the system they run. Yerel yönetimlerin güçlendirilmesi talebi merkeziyetçi devletin adeta kabusu olarak ortaya çıkmaktadır. The reinforcement or uh, reinform, reinforcement of local administration is therefore uh, as a nightmare for uh, centralist or central uh, the, the states that are run by a central authority. Bu nedenle Türkiye Avrupa yerel yönetim özellik şartını sınırlı kabul edebilmiştir. Therefore, Turkey um, has um, has accepted on a limited basis the the um, the condition, the autonomous European local administration uh, autonomous conditions. Bölünme fobisi Orta Doğu'daki her devletin ölüm fermanı olarak addedilmektedir. The the fear of um, being divided is um, is is is, an, is a nightmare. The, the the central centrally run states they see. Um, they, they, they, they feel they, they fear being divided um, as their end. Halkların özgür iradesine dayanmadan kurulan bu devlet halkların taleplerini tehdit olarak algılamaktadırlar. A state that is not established based on uh, people's uh, free uh, demands sees their demands uh, as uh, as a threat to itself. Biz devletin bütünlüğünün Toplumun güvenlik ve istikrarının baskı ve zorlama ile değil, devleti demokratik olarak yeniden yapılandırmak ve halkın siyasete katılımını sağlamakla mümkün olacağına inanıyoruz. We think in order to keep the state united um, and to make sure the society is living in, in, in a secure society and has stability um, is to establish re-establish a democratic um, a, a democratic state which makes sure people are actively participating in the administration demokratik özellik başta kürt halkı olmak üzere toplumun yeniden yeni bir örgütlenme temelinde siyasetle buluşması anlamına gelmektedir democratic confederalism means uh, starting with, with kurdish people is to um, is to make sure people will um, re we start uh, participating um, in, in, in in politics um, and and uh, and and being actively involved. Demokratik özellik bir model olarak Türkiye ve Orta Doğu gerçeğinde siyasetin hak ettiği yeri alması, hak ettiği değeri kazanması anlamına gelmektedir. Democratic confederalism. Um, in, uh, as a model in Turkey and in Middle East um, is to, uh, is to uh, earn um, the, is, is, is to earn the place that it deserves um, uh, the place that it deserves yeah. yes. bu nedenle demokratik özelliğin siyasetini ana esaslarıyla tartışmak demokratik özellik altında gerçekleşecek siyasetin içeriği kadar biçimi ve işleyişini açığa çıkarmak da son derece önemlidir. While it's the content of democratic confederalism is important, what is also um, even more important is to discuss the um, main uh, principles that actually constitute the democratic confederalism um, uh, together with how actually it is run and, and shaped. Orta Doğu yeniden şekillenirken başta Kürtler olmak üzere halkların özgürlük özlemleri artık hiçbir gerekçeyle engellenemez. While Middle East is, is being reconstructed, 
um, starting with Kurds, uh, people's, um, people's desire to freedom cannot be prevented anymore. Orta Doğu'nun uygarlık değerleri yeniden reforma edilme sürecine girmiştir. The, the civilization values of Middle East um, is, is currently being reformed. Halklar ve kültürler mozaiği olan Orta Doğu kendisine biçilen rolleri bir tarafa bırakarak artık kendi coğrafyasının baş aktörü olarak uygarlık ailesinin hak ettiği yeri alacaktır. Middle East, which is a mosaic of uh, people and, and cultures, um, should stop playing the role that it's been given to it, but start uh, defining its own role by itself. E, şimdi temel hatlarıyla e, demokratik özellik, yerel yönetimler ve Rojava modeli üzerine kısa bir giriş ve kısa bir bilgilendirme yaptık. E, benden sonraki arkadaşlarımın değerlendirmeleriyle birlikte tartışmalarımıza devam edebiliriz. I just gave you a brief introduction to the democratic confederalism which is uh, being um, used in Rojava um, and, and following me uh, my, my other, other speakers will, will give a response and afterwards we can discuss further if you have any questions. Dilek Öcilan, uh, thank you very much for your, uh, for your uh, talk. Let me highlight a few things Dilek said. And since we have time, I would also add another question before we go to the next uh, speaker. And I think Dilek, she started by problematizing the existing state system in the Middle East, which she named a bad copy of the nation state model or the nation state form in, uh, in Europe. And she presented self-administration as an alternative referring to the social contract in Rojava. She read the first article from the social contract. And I think what is most striking maybe from the social contract in Rojava is that it does not start by defining the relations between a state and individual citizens, but as a social contract of self-administration, it tries to define the relations between people and how people together can live a livable life. And that's, I think, central to the social contract. It's a contract about how to live together beyond the nation state. It's based on the acceptance of difference, Dilek said. It's based on rethinking, redefining of roles people have as citizenship, citizen towards each other, as women, as ethnic or religious groups, as professional groups. It's beyond the monolithic and centralist nationalist state form, Dilek Öcalan argued, and instead of that it's plural, it's gender equal, and it's based on an ecological or ecological principles. More or not voting once in the four years, but citizens who decide and at the same time execute decisions. So in a way it's about bringing together politics, the right to decide and power, the right to do at the local level. That's new, that's challenging, that's fascinating. Since mostly when we discuss today democracy or our politicians today discuss democracy they think that the global problems we are facing need global institutions further away from our local lives. And in Rojava, in Bakur, 
they try to bring politics to the level of our daily lives again with forms of active citizenship. That's democratic confederalism, Dilek Erdogan said, I think, if I summarize it well. She also raised an interesting thing, at least I found it interesting, fascinating, discussing at the local level on budgets for education, for health, and that reminded me to a system which was years ago developed in Porto Alegre in Brasilia. Participatory budgeting in which the people in assemblies together decided on the priorities in their city and the municipality executed them. They did not decide on them, the municipality executed them. But people decide and execute with the municipality in the case of Porto Alegre, but in Rojava, people themselves. This is a rethinking of democracy, bringing it back to the level of people. But then I have a question, because we have time, a question for, uh, for Dilek. Uh, from the position of the HDP, she is in the end, she is a, is a member of parliament from HDP. And the HDP is represented in the Parliament of Turkey, it's participating in the state institutions, and at the same time, it's claiming self-administration. So how is that relation between the HDP and self-administration, and how do you practice that in Turkey from the position you have as an MP? Öncelikle teşekkür ediyorum. So, yeah. First of all, thank you. HDP modeli de tam anlamıyla e, bir kültürel mozaik olarak değerlendirebiliriz öncelikle. First of all, we can also assess the um, HDP's uh, People's Democratic Party's model uh, being a, a mosaic of cultures. Çünkü e, HDP'nin yapısında belirttiğimiz gibi e, tüm inanç ve etnik gruplar yer alıyor ve Yok sayılan azınlık grupta şu an Türkiye'de azınlık olarak sayılan birçok grup kendisini var etme sorunlarını çözebilme ve bu sorunlarını da anayasal düzlemde bir sonuç almak için bir alternatif olarak görüyor. Because um, all different ethnicities uh, but different also different belief groups uh, as well as minorities uh, which are uh, basically having a danger of, of being extinct. Uh, are able to express themselves in, in uh, People's Democratic Party's movement. Çünkü bütün halklar yüzyıllardır birlikte yaşadığı topraklarda yine aynı şekilde birlikte yaşamaya devam etmek için sorunlarını ve taleplerini de birlikte çözebilmenin bir fırsatı olarak yaratıldığını düşünüyoruz. Because uh, people think this is an opportunity um, to um, again gain, gain the, um, the, the society that they um, lived in for uh, hundreds of years in, in peace, um, and they want to uh, basically find that society back. Ve biz ulus devletlerin pan zehirini oluşturan halkların bir arada yaşamasını, halkların öz iradeleriyle, öz güçleriyle kendilerini temsil etmeleri imkanını sağlıyoruz. We provide uh, conditions to, to people uh, which they can come together and, and self-administer themselves, which is, uh, of course, a big threat to nation-state. AKP iktidarının yapmış olduğu tekçilik zihniyetinin tam tersine çoğulcu ve birlikte ortak yaşamı savunucusu olarak e, tarihte de ilk örnek olabilecek e, ölçüde olduğunu söyleyebiliriz. We are um, against... Um, Turkey's ruling party, uh, justice and development parties, a monist mentality, um, and we are maybe the first uh, first movement which um, provides for an opportunity to uh, live together um, and, and, and form a life together with different uh, people from different backgrounds. Bu projenin Kürt halk önderi Sayın Abdullah Öcalan'ın projesini olduğu olduğu da belirtmek isterim. I would like to express that this project is a project of Mr. Abdullah Öcalan. Ve bu projeyi 
sonuç aldığını 7 Haziran seçimlerinin sonrasında tamamen tüm halklar tarafından tanındığını ve kabul gördüğünü de sizlere belirtmek isterim. We have noticed that this project has, has been well received and accepted by different people following the June 7 election. Çünkü tüm halklar, etnik gruplar 7 Haziran seçimleriyle birlikte yaşayabilme, artık çözümlere birlikte çözüm olabilme alternatifini seçerek ve HDP'yi yüzde 13 gibi bir oy oranıyla 80 darbesinin bugünlere kalan e, baraj e, zihniyetinde yıkarak bu e, projenin sonuç aldığını sizlere belirtmek isterim. By uh, voting for uh, People's Democratic Party um, and, and, and get, making sure, uh, gi giving them a, a, a, a voting percentage of 13%, they showed that they are willing to uh, work against uh, the, the, um, the powers that were established in Turkey following the uh, 1980 um, uh, coup that was done by the army. Um, and, and this, this uh, June 7 election was a good indication that everybody uh, is willing to change something. 80 darbesini birazcık açacak olursak, 80'lerde Kürdistan'da büyük bir soykırım, bir yok sayma siyaseti yürütülürken yine tekçilik, devlet anlayışı dayatılıyordu. To explain you 80, 1980 coup a bit further, Uh, in those uh, times, uh, also Kurds being, uh, were being massacred, um, and also uh, they were um, actually uh, not being recognized, um, and, and uh, it, it was um, as, as bad as it was for Kurds like now. Devlet dışında farklı bir grubun, farklı bir örgütün ben de varım demesi devlet tarafından yok sayılıyor. Sesini yükselten her tür grup ya işkencelerle, gözaltılarla cezaevine atılıyor ya da bir şekilde faili meçhul denilerek öldürülüyor ve mezarları dahi şu ana kadar bilinmemektedir. Any voices that were against states were considered nihil and, and not existing um, and any uh, those voices were being imprisoned, uh, massacred um, and, and some of them we don't even know where their graveyards are. Ve daha Birçok sayabileceğimiz insanlık dışı uygulamaların yaşandığı o dönemler tüm insanlığın yok sayıldığı hukukun, demokrasinin den söz edilemeyen bir dönem olduğunu belirtmek isterim. We, we, um, we can say that those times were times that you couldn't really think that there was a democracy, there was um, the, the state of law. Um, and, and, and, um, and, and people were being um, were not being accepted as they were. Bugüne dönecek olursak, bugün Kürde, Kuzey Kürdistan'da yaşanan vahşetin de 80'lerin kat be kat üstünde olduğunu ve bunun e, öz yönetimlerle bağlantısını kısaca sizlere belirtmek isterim. If we come to today, uh, what's happening in Kurdistan is actually way Uh, worse than what was happening in the 1980s, uh, and this is uh, have to do with um, democratic confederalism idea. Devletçi zihniyet de biliyor ki savunan, kendini savunan ve zulüm zulümkarlar karşısında dik duran bütün halklar bu devlet zihniyetinin hedefinde olmuş ve yok sayılmış soykırımlara tabi tutulmuştur. A statist uh, state knows that. Um, The, the people who are, um, are, are not accepting um, the, the, um, the, uh, the in, uh, injustice that the state is trying to establish um, uh, uh, also um, knows that uh, those people are creating a big threat for the existence of the state. Şu an Kürdistan'da yaşanan öz yönetim direnişlerinin Öz kimliğimi kendim yaratabilirim, kendi kendimi ben yönetebilirim şarıyla başlatmış olduğu diren, direnişi de işkalcı güçler hiçbir şekilde kabul etmemektedir. Therefore, uh, what is happening in Turkey um, nowadays among Kurds who are saying that 
I will self-rule myself and I'm able to do that, uh, that is being oppressed by Turkish state and, and not being accepted. Ve diyebiliriz ki Guinness rekorlar listesine girebilecek Kürt halkının direnişçi, kendi kimliğine sahip çıkan ve ağır bedel ödeyen hiçbir halkının e, bugüne kadar yaşanan e, bu bedeller karşısında e, başka halkların olduğunu düşünmüyoruz. We think that what Kurds have done uh, has a value that can be uh, even contained or, or be booked in Guinness records books because we don't think any other nation in the world has done so much that uh, Kurds have done so far. Ve Kürt halkı da bu direnişini zaferle sonuçlandırana kadar da öz yönetimlerini, kendi kendini yönetme taleplerini sonuna kadar direneceğini de teminatının 21. yüzyılda başarıyla sonuçlanacağını da belirtebiliriz. What we can also express is that Kurds will never give up from their struggle to self rule themselves and, and gain their freedom and we think that the 21st century will be the century that we will gain these rights. Aslında öz yönetimlerin bugün değil yıllar önce hayata geçirilmesini talep etmiş ve bunu her defasında da dile getirmiş olan Kürt halkı bugün artık bu kadar ödenen bedeller karşısında bunun sonuç alması için kaybedecek hiçbir şeyimiz kalmadı şiarıyla bedenlerini siper ederek bu direnişi sahiplenerek çözüme kavuşturmak için çaba gösteriyor. While the idea of democratic confederalism is not new and has been actually um, part of the struggle since very long time, and nowadays uh, Kurt says we have nothing to lose and we will therefore fight till the end until we get the rights. Temel haklar istenmez, talep edilmez, alınır şiarıyla o nedenle biz Devletlerden ya da ulusal güçlerden bir talebimiz olmayacak. Biz öz yönetimlerle bu talebimiz kendimiz yerine getireceğiz. The basic rights cannot be demanded but can be taken. That's how we think. And therefore we will not demand anything from the um, central monist powers but we will take it from them. Dilek Öcalan, I would like to thank you very much. I have to interrupt you uh, here, but I'm sure that the word will come back to you. Maybe you a final sentence to finish off, but we need to continue with the discussions. Tamam, ben de zaten sonlandırmıştım. Sonuç olarak da e, HDP'nin bu projenin arkasında olduğu ve HDP'nin kendisinin de bu proje olduğunu belirtmek isterim. Okay, I was about to finish and I would like to, I would like to say that uh, HDP fully supports this democratic federalism idea. Again, thank you very much, uh, Dilek uh, Öcalan. There are Two things I would like to highlight from the uh, from the answer she uh, she gave, and what I understood from it is that well, HDP it's it's represented in Parliament, but it's not just, if you may say, just a political or political party as we know it, which is led by professional politicians. The HDP, I think, she emphasised, it's also an assembly. It's the place where the the many peoples who had been silenced in Turkey, who didn't have a voice, who did not get a voice, could come together and express themselves. So the HDP as an assembly where people come together and discuss their past, present and future. At the same time, Dilek Öcalan emphasized that the HDP in this form is the antidote for nationalism. That's also what she emphasized in the beginning. So two things. But I would like to continue with uh, Jody Dean as the first discussant. And she is a professor in, of political science at the Hobart and William Smith Colleges in the United States. And she also held the position of Erasmus Professor of the Humanities in the Faculty of Philosophy at Erasmus University in uh, Rotterdam. In one of her latest books, The Communist Horizon, she argues that we need to return to 
brought visions of a different society, a different future, a future which is a collective effort. And she eschews the sort of, or all sorts of liberal individualism. In both the Communist Horizon and another book, Crowd and Party, Dean argues for the importance of the party, I think, as both in both uh, uh, ideological and uh, organizational manners. Ideological in the sense of the ability to keep alive collective desires and organizational as being the coordination mechanism between the horizon of collective desires and the daily practices through, through which we want to realize or enact them. And may I ask you, Jody Dean, to give an initial response to the speech of Dilek Ergilan and the imagination of a stateless democracy. The floor is yours. Great. Th um, thanks, thanks very much. And um, thank you, um, Dilek Oshalam, for your um, very inspiring and wonderful um, remarks. Um, I'll have some very specific kinds of questions um, and then a couple of broader reflections. Um, on, um, specifically, could you tell us about the process um, involved in the social contract? The how is um, how it what, what are the, the groups involved in putting together the social contract, and how um, how that came about? Like, was there kind was there like a, a ratification, or was it different communities, or did um, some um, some people put it together and then take it out and people talk about it. So I'm interested in hearing more about the social contract process and how that became a social contract understood as a contract by multiple groups. I'm waiting till he translates that. So. And does that make, is, that, is the question clear? Yeah? Um, good. Okay, so that's the fir the um, the first question. Um, but sh should I finish all my remarks first, or maybe it's good to finish the remarks first and Is then to give an, a, a response? Yeah. Okay. So then, and then the the second kind of concrete question is about what the different. Um, I'm not sure exactly what they were called, if they were called the people's assemblies or the different um, local gathering groups or the, people, the administrative groups. What did they decide? At one point, you were talking about different assemblies at different locality, localities that build up. And you mentioned that eth different ethnicities were there and women and NGOs, young people, every group. And so I'm wondering, what did they decide? What are their decisions? Um, can they do they decide on taxes? Or can they decide whether or not to, um, I don't know, tear down buildings, build buildings, um, you know, distribute food, take things from other people? I mean, what's the, um, how does that work? And then one last question is, um, could you tell us a little more about um, um, the economy? Now, I, I understand that um, Rojava is in a, um, you know, has a war economy and also a kind of communal economy, um, but could you tell more about the um, economic relations? Um, and one, one reason I was thinking is um, when you talked about the different groups, you emphasize different um, ethnic and gender groups and even NGOs, but um, I didn't know what to think about different class groups or um, people by economic sector. And so I was hoping to hear more about that. Yeah? Okay, so, so those are my kind of general, uh, my, my um, specific questions. One of the things that I was struck with um, is uh, what now appears to me as a kind of disconnect between um, democratic confederalism and the term stateless democracy. Because what I heard um, was a description of democratic confederalism as a state model, that it wasn't a non-state model at all, but a different configuration of the state. Um, and so I, it, and I think that, um, and so then I start to wonder, okay, 
you know, is it, are these really the same thing? Is this the same project from different aspects? Um, and, if, and if it's the same project from different aspects, then what would one aspect mean? I mean, to say um, stateless democracy can seem like really anarcho-radical or something, and, but is it that, or is it actually just mobilizing civil society in a kind of civil society politics that has been, uh, was widespread in um, the former Eastern Europe, um, parts of Western Europe and Latin America in the 70s and 80s as a politics against the state. And that politics was about mobilizing society um, in a way to try to, to have social revolution. But that politics also came up against the state and the market in different, in different places and in different times. It wasn't ever able to replace the state um, and clearly wasn't able to replace the market. In fact, became another vehicle for privatization, the increased commercialization and commodification of society and um, intended to backfire. So one of the things that I'm puzzled with and hope you know, to learn an, an answer to or figure out um, over the next few days is how to think about this um, claim regarding stateless democracy and what exactly does it mean and what are the ways that it um, comes up against the state. I mean, point out a, a couple of other places where I think that um, there are contradictions in this that can be really fruitful, right? I mean, on the one hand, it seemed to me that the, the claim like, okay, we, the Kurds, we're not arguing for an independent state. We just want kind of autonomous self-government governance. On the one hand, it seems like a smaller claim, like I'm not challenging you, Turkey. On the other hand, it's huger, right? It's like we're challenging the entire structure of the Middle East and Europe, right? So it's much more radical. So it, it has a dimension of being either very kind of calm, we're pulling back, it's not a huge radical claim, or even more radical insofar as it wants to change the entire nation state, um, the entire nation state structure. And that's, and I don't mean that, I mean that just descriptively. I don't have an, um, on that point, I'm not trying to make an ideological point one way or the other. I think it's really interesting how the same politics can push um, in one or the other direction. Something I think may be more problematic. Am, am I on too fast? Is, are we okay? Um, so, so, is, oh, slower? Sorry, sorry. Um, yeah. Oh, now I feel like slow. <laughs> so, um, is I'm, I'm curious about and would like to learn more about the relation between the claims for um, you know, different religious groups and ethnic groups you know, can be you know, respected and part of the process and we've got this plural, pluralist ideal plus um, you know, feminism or gender equality or um, how do you pronounce the name? Jainism? What is the, the, the Kurdish term? How do you say it? Genealogy. Genesia, um, genealogy. Ge genealogy. Okay, people have a sense of what I'm trying to say. Um, so how does how do those things fit together? Because it would seem to me that the claim for women's equality is an extremely radical claim that cuts across lots of different um, ethnic and religious and cultural practices. And it's not a matter of saying, okay, every cultural practice is okay. It's like actually no. Like, if you've got a cultural practice that's rooted in male hierarchy, yours doesn't count anymore. And so how do you, how do you all grapple with that, um, that dimension? Does it say, okay, yes, the, the um, women's equality, that's the first platform. And then if that's the case, it seems that it's not, that the actual ideology is one that says not everything goes, it's not pluralist, it's one that's committed to substantive values of, of um, women's equality as the basis of society. And so th there's a, an ideological centralism that's a necessary container for the other parts of, of, um, uh, you know, of, of, the, of the ideology or of the belief systems. Um, one last question, or I, and I don't know if this one is general, is general or specific, and it's about localities and um, local um, determ locals determination, local autonomy, and what exactly that 
means and can mean. I mean, on the one hand, localities can be materially really different, right? Some can be terribly poor and some can be really wealthy. So, you know, shouldn't there be a redistribution of wealth between localities? And um, so that it's not that the case that, you know, the fact that some have been, you know, utterly devastated by, um, you know, colonial or imperial power, that they remain in that awful position. Um, and what if localities, you know, want to preserve a kind of identity from other people? I mean, that, that strikes me as part of the position or part of the the description that I heard of, of um, democratic confederalism that I don't want to travel, um, or I, I, I fear its use in Europe and the United States because that's an argument for, okay, no refugees here. We're gonna be local self-determining and, and we determine that our lives have to be separate from yours. So there, there are things that I think are, are really interesting in the context and I worry about Thinking, of, I worry about the extension or the idea of, of um, this democratic confederalism as a model. And so I guess I would close and to say, okay, model in what way, and model in what model for whom. And I think the model in what way that is wonderful is finding a set of ideas which they've done that can be both seemingly normal or seemingly reasonable and also really radical at the same time. That's, I think, a, a really you know, smart and inspiring um, aspect of the, of the revolution to model. But other specific aspects, I think, might have, um, may not work in, in every context. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jody. Um, A lot of fascinating questions we will engage with uh, in a moment. But first, I would like to go to Sadat Karabalut and give her the opportunity to give a response. Um, Sadat Karabalut is member of parliament of the Socialist Party in the Netherlands. She's spokesperson on social affairs and integration. And uh, before she became an MP, Sadat Karabalut was member of the municipal Council of the City of Amsterdam, active in the Student Union, and Chair of the Federation of Democratic Workers, um, or the Federation of Democratic Workers Associations, I have to say, DDEF, an organization established by progressive workers from uh, Turkey. And may I ask you, Sadat, to reflect on the speech of uh, Dilek Öcalan on the imagination of a stateless democracy, the practice of a stateless democracy, and how you can relate to that as a representative of the Socialist Party. But I also want to share with you another concern. Um, I, I, I came from a conference at the European Parliament uh, a few days ago. It was an inspiring conference, it was a nice conference, but there was something which annoyed me a lot and made me very uncomfortable. And it had to do with the stance of most of the political fractions or many people in the different political fractions at the European Parliament, when they look at the political problem in Turkey, they look at the, pro the, the, the problems in Turkey from a security discourse. So we have a problem with terrorism, and Turkey gives a rightful dis response, but it has to be proportionally. That's the main, the main, the main uh, perspective from which they look to the problems we are facing today, and they seem not to look at the problems we are facing in the Middle East, in Kurdistan, as a political problem for which we need to find political solutions. So I would like to challenge you also on that, Sadat. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, first of all, it's very crowded, and I think that's a good thing. First of all, I want to thank you, uh, Jonas Stel, and the others for this organization. Of course, Didek Öcalan for her inspiring speech and all of the people that are here. I think this also shows that many people like me, uh, socialist or non-socialist, they are searching for a new, better world. And I think that we all know why we are searching for it. Uh, this is the part of uh, uh, the subject that we are talking about. I will uh, I would have asked these politicians, in response to your last question, uh, in Europe, so is it proportional? Uh, 
Is it proportional what Turkey is doing by killing a part of her own community? Because the Kurdish people are a part of Turkey. I will return to that subject later. Um, as a member and uh, member of parliament for the Socialist Party, I can tell you this, that uh, our political goal is not a stateless democracy, but, and that is what we have common, I think, we are struggling for democratization of the society, of economy, of the politics. I think this is a big issue, not only in the Middle East, but, but also in Europe. And before I get to some questions for Dilik about uh, their uh, model of democratic confederalism and how it is working now in the Middle East, uh, I want, first want to um, point to the actual political situation. Because I've been uh, there in Turkey, I, I'm Dutch, but um, I have uh, Turkish-Kurdish roots. My parents, they are from Dersim. Uh, the Kurdish part of Turkey. So I follow also, not only as socialist, uh, but also as a person, I'm very interested in the developments in Turkey. And I've been in Turkey several times, and also last year in Gizre, in Nusaybin, and in Diyarbakir, where now people, people are still slaughtered. And I was shocked, really shocked, because I didn't get it. Before I was there, I didn't get it. I didn't got that state can uh, act uh, as if there are no rights, no rules, no human rights. It is not in my system. So somewhere you don't believe it or you don't let it in. But I've seen it there. I have seen that, that uh, women are being humiliated, that children are being killed, and that the state is using um, a power and killing people without a cause. And I think that's also the main struggle of the Kurdish people and also part of other people that are living in the Middle East. And Dilek talked about it, that they can be who they are, that they can live, that they can speak their language, that they have equal rights. And I'm very inspired by the struggle in Rojava. One and a half year ago, the Kurds were heroes and they still are. But they were recognized by the whole international community. Everybody knew and still know that the Kurds are the only struggling power and people in Syria and in Iraq against the IS fascist. And how sad is it, how sad it is, that now, one and a half year later, Turkey, who is killing a part of her own people, gets 3 billion euros as an aid, and they let them, my government, but also other European governments, let them rule Turkey as they want. That Saudi Arabia, who is the... Uh, uh, um, father, the uh, uh, um, spiritual father of the IS and the Wahhabism can join the peace conference in Vienna and Turkey also, but the only struggling power is not there. That is unacceptable. And for us, for me, that's the evidence... <laughs> That's the evidence that the countries who also are responsible for the chaos and the killings in the Middle East now don't, don't want peace, but are continuing their politics with weapons. And I think this has to stop. And there are uh, some things that have to happen in short term. Of course, first of all, the Kurds and all other people who are part of the Middle East, they have the right for self-determination. They must be part and serious partner, and so also Rojava, of the international community of the peace talks. That is number one. 
The second is the peace talk. The first thing that has to happen is that the weapons, uh, that there comes a, a, a ceasefire without condition. Because every day, every day and still now, people are being killed and children are being killed and there are people starving from hunger. So we don't, like my government did yesterday, we must not send more bombs, we must send food and aid. And not $3 billion to the Turkish government, because they have their own interests and they are not really interested in getting a solution for the people, but they want to prevent that the Rojava, for exa example, gets really a success, and they, they are taken seriously by the international community, give that, that money to the people, to the international aid organization, because there are lots of needs for the refugees there. And uh, a last thing, the Western gov governments, and uh, Dilek said, uh, the, the uh, fa failed sta states in the Middle East are a bad copy of the uh, Western democracies. But I can say that uh, the current political fa failed states are, of course, the cause of the current situation and the wars in the Middle East. But it's a pity, it's a pity that our governments are also copying these failed states. So our governments must not go for their own interests or the interests of the United States for getting more oil and other resources from the region, but they must say, okay, we go for peace and we want the self-determination uh, of the people. And if you do that, you also must stop uh, exporting weapons to failing states like Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Qatar because we are knowing, we know who use these weapons. And these are some things that I think uh, are very important to stop the wars in, middle, in the Middle East. And I think that's the first step for indeed the self-determination so that the people, all people who are part no, the Middle East is uh, of different people and they must decide what and how they uh, want to govern. And in that perspective, it is, of course, very important that Rojava is taken seriously by the international community. Because I'm very impressed, I saw this documentary a while ago, uh, I think, yeah, one and a half year ago, on Vice News about the up. Uh, coming of that uh, um, uh, self-dependent uh, uh, autonomous regions in Rojava, the cantons. And the nice thing is that is what we are all talking about in Europe. Yes, we want diversity, we want equal rights, we want different people in a, a pluralistic, secular society to have their own ground rights and to, to, to live as they want and to get the democratic rights to make your own decisions. And that's what they are in this very, very difficult situation in Syria and the cause. They are doing that, they are showing us that. So if the European community, if my government, if the Euro uh, European governments and the other big states like the United States, if they don't take these people serious, who can they take serious then, only themselves and their own interests. And then I come to the uh, interesting system or uh, model of uh, autonomous regions and democratic confederalism. I think, um, as I said, we are also in Europe, but especially my party here in Holland, searching for a uh, new solution for the anti-democratization of the society. It's very difficult, uh, we have, uh, it's very different, we have a different society here, but for me it's always inspiring to look at Turkey and the Middle East, how they are doing. Uh, but we, uh, as uh, uh, Western countries, we, we don't know the autonomous regions, uh, or self-named <laughs> autonomous regions, they are always part of existing uh, nation states. 
so aut autonomy within a region can actually only be reached with agreement of that central government. Otherwise, it's independency or uh, separation or uh, things like frozen conflict. But the interesting thing of uh, the speech of uh, uh, uh, Dilik Öcalan, and of course, of course, of the success of the HDP, is that they showed that it's not impossible to live together. That it's not impossible that Muslims and gays, men and women, that they can have the equal rights, that they can respect each other, and that they, they, they can gain support of lots of people from different uh, backgrounds within the democratic process, within the parliamentary. And of course, the reaction of Erdogan and his regime, they totally freaked and they totally panicked. Because if we show that it can and Hadap has showed it, then you must do that and you must democratize. Because if you can give people rights that they want, they will live together so we can end this F war. This Kurdish question, uh, question. all people want it in Turkey. I, I know it. Turks, Kurds, Alevi, Sunnis, nobody wants to die their children, that, that, that their children die. And that's why he took out the card of, again, stopping the peace process, starting the war, and to Turkey and our government, we want this. We want them to stop the killings in the region. We want the Turkish government to stop the war. We want them to retake the peace, peace process, to stop the guns, also the PKK, of course, so that we can go on on the democratic way. And about the uh, autonomous regions and democratic conformalism to Dilek, I have some questions. Can you because formulate them in about one minute? Yes, uh, yes, yes, sure. It is, is, it, is that model actually, because you know the, the, the subject is stateless democracy, but yeah, Turkey is a state, and you, are, you want to function in that state, HDP is a democratic party, is it possible within the state? Or, I also heard something uh, like something above the state, what do I have to imagine with that, or what do you mean uh, did, uh, uh, with it? And, if the answer is yes, what is necessary, what is necessary to indeed uh, give the people the power to, and that's how I uh, understood you, to decide about the daily practice of their life? And how to organize then the rest of Turkey? Uh, and of course, um, how can we help, we, as uh, uh, parliamentaries of Holland, but also the other European <coughs> countries, to support your struggle uh, for democratization of Turkey and for the rights of self-determination of the people of the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sadat uh, Karabulut. And I would like to give the floor again to uh, Dilek Öcalan, uh, and she received a lot of questions. And it would be unfair to ask her to give a response in, let's say, five minutes, but I will be unfair. Uh, so I would like to ask you to, well, to try to Response in brief in about five minutes so that we have a bit of time for questions from the audience. Öncelikle çok adil değil çünkü Yodi dilin belirttiği birçok konu açıkçası çok açılması gereken ve çok çok geniş konular. O nedenle hani beş dakikayı aşar diye düşünüyorum. To start with, uh, I don't think it's very fair to have five minutes um, because especially the questions raised by uh, Professor Yodidin are questions that uh, ca can be and should be further clarified and elaborated on 
and therefore would like to speak a bit more than five minutes. <laughs> Şimdi öncelikle Rojova Anayasası'nda nasıl bir özellik sisteminin ortaya çıktığına ilişkin bir sorusu vardı. Ona kısaca birkaç cümleyle açıklık getirelim. First of all, you had a question about the social contract, or as she refers to as Constitution of Rojava, and how that has been put to life. We would like to start answering that question. Elbette ki bugün Rojava'da yıllarca süren Baas rejimi ve faşizmi ve son birkaç yıldır da süren işit saldırıları ile sistemin kurulması engellenmek istemiştir, istenilmiştir aslında. With the Baas regime as well as the ISIS forces, this model was tried to be prevented to be established for for a while. Ancak Rojava Tüm bunlara karşı kendini yönetme adına yoğun bir mücadele içerisine girmiş, tüm işgalci saldırılara karşı YPG YPG öncülüğünde savunmasını geliştirirken aynı zamanda da toplumsal inşaatın gerçekleştirilebilmesi için de büyük bir kararlılıkla çalışmalarına devam etmektedir. However, in order to overcome all these um, uh, preventions, uh, Rojava and, and its people have started a very a determined struggle uh, in order to um, in, in order to come to the stage uh, where we are now and they formed uh, forces like YPG and YPJ to be able to self protect their people. Yani öz yönetimi açacak olursak öz yönetim yaşamın tamamını ilgilendirdiği için yani yaşamın bütün e, alanlarına dokunduğu için e, Rojava e, şu an Rojava'da uygulanan sistem e, idarenin nasıl ya ayrıldığına bakacak olursak yasama, yürütme, yargı arasında demokratik ilkeler esastır ve politikalarda eş başkanlık sistemi ile yönetime kadın katılımı aktif olarak sağlanmaktadır. To uh, further clarify self administration or self um, ruling um, it is based on uh, the, the, um, the, the, the division of powers uh, the legislator, um, the execution, um, and the justice uh, or judge, um, and and it it is putting democratic principles around these three division of powers to be able to form a democratic society. Yürütme alanında kurulan bakanlıklarla topluma daha iyi hizmet etme, toplumun tamamına daha iyi, iyi e, inebilmek için de. Ee, bir hizmet amaçlanmaktadır. With the establishment of uh, ministries, um, we uh, they, they try to um, reach to uh, every part of the society to be able to better serve them. Sizlerin de bildiği gibi Rojava üç kantondan oluşuyor. Cizire, Afrin, Kob Kobani kantonudur. As you all may know, uh, the the um, Rojava. Is, uh, is formed is consisting of three cantons Jazeera, Afrin and Kobani. Ee, öncelikle e, bu kantonlarda toplumsal yaşam nasıl oluşuyor? Buna değinmeden önce bazı e, maddelere kısaca sizlere değinmek isterim. Before I start explaining how uh, social life is in these cantons, uh, I would like to uh, explain a couple of points. Suriye demokratik, özgür, bağımsız ve irade sahibi bir devlettir demokratik parlamenter bir sistemle yönetilir. Um, Syria is a is a democratic um, state um, and is um, is is run uh, by democratic institutions. Demokratik özerk yönetim 3 kantondur. Cizir, Kobani, Afrin bunlardan oluşur ve Suriye'nin topraklarının bir parçasıdır. Um, democratic um, democratic uh, um, autonomous administration consists of uh, three cantons um, and and they are part of Syrian um, they are part of Syria Kamışlı demokratik özellik yönetiminin Cizre kantonunun merkezidir Kamışlı which is a city is um, is the center of um, Cizre canton Bu kanton Kürt, Süryani, Ermeni, Çeçen, Müslüman, Hristiyan ve Ezidilerin ortak yönetimidir 
this canton is, is the common um, administration is, is common administration of Kurdish, Assyrians, Armenians, Chechens, Muslims, Christians and Yazidis. Um, Kantonda yaşayan halklar ve inançlar arasındaki ilişkiler halkların kardeşliği, ortak yaşam ve dayanışma temellidir. The, the uh, nations uh, and different groups that live um, in the cantons um, are um, uh, the, the, the relationship between them is based on um, living together uh, and brotherhood. Cizre kantonunun resmi dili Kürtçe, Arapça ve Suriyanicedir. Bunların yanı sırada diğer diller de güvence altına alınır. The um, official languages of Cizre Canton. Uh, is Kurdish, uh, Arabic, and, and uh, Assyrian language. Uh, however, the other languages are also um, are also secured and can be used. Kanton yönetimleri ve merkezleri arası ilişkiler demokratik özellik esaslarına göre gerçekleşir ve savunma gücü de YPG'dir. The relationships between uh, the, the administrations of cantons uh, and their centers is um, is uh, run with the principles of democratic um, uh, de democratic democratic autonomous um, uh, principles toplumsal sözleşmede gençlerin siyasete ve yönetime katılmaları güvence altına alınır uh, the, um, the, the, um, the act of uh, society uh, with the act of society it is ensured that uh, young people uh, can participate in politics and can be part of the administration as well. Ve daha uzun sayabileceğimiz birçok alanda belirttiğimiz hususlarda bu belirttiğimiz çerçevelerde toplumun ihtiyacına göre e, yaşamı şekillendirir ve o şekilde devam etmesini sağlar. In addition to what we have just explained in all other areas is also used to uh, form the way the life is is is is, uh, is being lived and administered in in the region, and e, also it is adjusted on a need basis. Birkaç tane toplumsal olaylara örnek verecek olursak, çocukların çalıştırılması, çocuk yaşta evlilik, çocuklara yönelik psikolojik ve fiziki işkenceler de yasaktır. If to give you a couple of examples, um, for, um, the the uh, childrens cannot work. Um, the um, the children, uh, uh, chil children or, or young brides, being a young young bride is not allowed, um, and these are uh, under the um, are uh, ensured by the by the constitution itself. E, bir başka soruya hani kısaca değinmek istersek e, demokratik konfederalizmde ekonomi e, ekonominin genel olarak Rojava'da nasıl e, hayat bulduğuna ilişkin. Uh, we'll explain to you how actually uh, economy um, finds life in, in, in Rojava and how it's being used. Kapitalist ekonomiye özel mülkiyete karşı grup ya da topluluklar ekonomisini savunan bir sisteme sahiptir Rojava. Against uh, capitalism and, and uh, uh, individual property rights, it is, um, it, it is based on the uh, communal rights. Bundan kastımız tekelleşmeyi hedeflemeyen, azami karı esas almayan, kontrolü kendi elinde olan, üretimle bağ içinde olan, kendine yeterlilik esas alan, toplumsal ihtiyaçlar üzerinden gerçekleştiği için kullanım değerini esas esas alan bir ekonomi ya da mülkiyettir. It was a long one. Uh, yeah. uh, what I mean by this, it's a, it's a system that doesn't um, aim monopoly, uh, it doesn't aim uh, profit maximization, uh, but it aims um, the, um, the, the production in line with the needs of the society. Böylesi bir mülkiyet yapılanmasının zaten özelliği fazla kalmayacaktır. This type of uh, property uh, structuring will, will not have uh, too many features. Kapitalist ekonominin tekel karının hedef almadığı veya tahrip etmediği hemen hiçbir şey kalmamıştır. Uh, the, the capitalist economy and, and the uh, prof, profit that is targeted by monopolies um, and, and any that sort of things are not existing in that economy. Ekolojik dengenin bozulması, çevre kirliliği, çığ gibi büyüyen işsizlik, 
hedefsiz artan üretim, toplum sağlığının hiçe sayan tarımsal üretim, aşırı tüketim, tarımsal üretimden kaçma ve benzeri konularda da demokratik konfederalizmde alternatif ekonomik yaklaşımlar geliştirmek durumunda kalınmıştır. Other areas that um, the democratic confederalism is used as an alternative are, are things like the, um, the, the balance of the, um, the, the keeping the balance of ecological world, uh, making uh, sure that unemployment is, is not increasing, um, the um, un, un, untargeted or uh, uncontrolled production, um, the uh, uh, an establishment that doesn't really care about the health of people uh, is all um, is we we are working towards principles that can be alternative to all of this i'm i'm afraid that we are running out of time already 15 minutes too late we, we it will not be possible to answer all the questions but we would like you to answer one question the last question that was the question i think posed by uh, sadat karabulut also about the role of us, the role of the Netherlands, or us, social movement, political parties, representatives, activists, what could we contribute to the struggle? And could you answer it in brief, because we have to well, to finalize the panel. Aslında bir önemli sorusu daha kalmıştı. Ee, kadın eşitliği e, konusunda. Onu aslında kısaca da olsa belirtmek isterim. E, çünkü toplumun yarısını kadınlar oluşturuyor. E, ve m, belirttiği gibi de e, şu an e, toplumun yok saydığı da yine toplumun yarısıdır. O konuda da birkaç e, e, cümle kurmak isterim. There was another important question raised that was about uh, women, uh, because women constitute almost half of the society, and it's very important for all of us. Therefore, I would like to spend a little bit of time to answer that question. I can't say no, I think so. <laughs> I will say, answer the question, but please make it, uh, keep it brief. Demokratik konfederalizm, cinsiyet özgürlüğünü esas alan kadının nesneleştirilmesine, köleleştirilmesine, bir obje gibi sunulmasına karşı kadın özgürlüğünü savunan bir sistemdir aynı zamanda. Democratic confederalism uh, is a system that bases freedom of, of gender um, as, a, as a basis and, and uh, it, it strives for um, making sure that women is not uh, made slavery, made slaver and is not used as an object uh, but has uh, freedom. Devletçi uygarlık tarihsel süreç içerisinde de kendi hegemonyasını oluşturmak için ilk yöneldiği kesim yine kadınlar olmuştur. The, the statist uh, civilization in the history, um, in order to establish its own hegemony, he um, they actually targeted women as well. Köleleştiren kadınla birlikte doğa, insan, toplum, birey ilişkileri, ahlaki ve politik doku bozulmuş, yerine iktidar ve güç odaklı yaşam felsefesi yerleşmiştir. With the slavery of women, um, the, the society uh, has the the the, um, the the natural links within society have been broken, and all the other relationships like uh, the um, nature, uh, human relationship, society, individual relationship have also uh, been deteriorated. Sayın Öcalan'ın da belirttiği gibi hazineler kaybedildiği yerde aranır demektedir. Kaybolan toplumsal hakikat olarak özgürlük ise kaybolduğu anda aramak gerekmektedir. Just like Mr. Öcalan says that a treasury uh, should be searched for in the place they are lost and therefore uh, we should be searching for those values in the place where they were taken away. Demokratik konferadelizm kadın eksenli bir sistem olduğundan bu yüzden de kadının özgürlüğü önemlidir diyoruz. Democratic confederalism, since it's based on, uh, on, on, on women uh, as well, uh, and therefore it should protect women's rights too. 
Ee, daha da geniş değerlendirmeler var ama biz diyoruz ki e, toplumun yarısını kadınlar oluşturuyorsa toplumda e, söz sahibi olması gereken de öncelikli kadınlar olması gerekiyor. Uh, I can tell you a lot more about it, but because we say women uh, constitutes half of the society, they should also um, be given the rights they deserve. E, Saadet arkadaşın e, sorusuna artık e, geçelim. E, zamanımız dar olduğu için daha geniş değerlendirmek isterdik. I will now go to the uh, Saadet Karabulut's question. Uh, we, if we had time, I could have spent more time on it, but I will briefly answer. E, Devletsiz demokrasinin e, aslında e, Türkiye'de bir devlet e, olduğunu ve burada da e, öz yönetimlerin nasıl e, yer bulmasına ilişkin bir sorusu vardı zannedersem. Diğer soruyu mu? Diğer soruyu mu? Biz ne yapabiliriz? İki, i̇ki sorusu var da ama. Uh, she is gonna, well, should she answer all questions? Or? Please answer them but be very brief. Uh, i̇kisini cevaplayacaksınız. Son soruyu cevaplayacağız. Biz sizler için ne yapabiliriz? <gülüyor> Son bir soru. Biz sizler için ne yapalım? Son soru. Çok kısaca o zaman aslında öz yönetimlerin devletlerin de işini kolaylaştırdığını ve bir anlamda da devletin yükünün azaltığı sistem olarak dile getirebiliriz. O nedenle devletin sınırlarıyla, bayrağıyla, toprağıyla herhangi bir sorunun olmadığı, zaten herkesin bulunduğu mekanlarda, bulunduğu topraklarda kendi kendisini yönetebilmeleri de e, hiçbir şekilde anayasaya, demokrasiye aykırı bir durum olmadığını belirtmek isteriz. Um, the uh, democratic confederalism is, is not against the state. Actually it helps the states to be run more efficiently and more properly. Um, and it, it, it, in, in many terms, in many aspects, uh, it's a way of um, making life easier within the state uh, with additional attributes. Son olarak da Avrupa devletlerinin e, şu an Türkiye'de uygulanan vahşete sessiz kalmaması ve orada uygulanan hukuksuzluklara karşı e, ses çıkarması ve gerekli tedbirlerini de alması e, o temelde de m, Türkiye'nin e, demokratik e, bir e, rejime evrilmesi için de zorlamalarda bulunması elbette ki e, şu an Avrupa'nın yapması gereken temel işlevdir. What European Union and Europe should do uh, is not to be silent to what's happening in Kurdistan and, and do what they need to do and, and put pressure on, on Turkey's um, anti-democratic um, uh, anti uh, way of treating people um, and they should be taking an active role uh, helping uh, people there to get to a democratic society. Elbette ki şu an Kürdistan'da yaşanan bu vahşetin, bu savaşın e, birer parçası olan Avrupa devletleri e, bunlardan da haber, haberdar e, konumdadırlar. E, bu neticede de e, tekrardan bu bozulan bu sistemi tekrardan onarmak için de artık bir an önce ellerini taşın altına koymaları e, ve direkt alternatif çözümler sunmaları gerekiyor. Değil basın açıklamaları, yanınızdayız, destek veriyoruz değil, direkt birebir e, bu sürecin içine dahil olmaları gerekiyor ki yarın için çok geç olabilir. Obviously, uh, Europe is part of the creation of the problem uh, and therefore they should um, not just make press releases saying uh, you know, it should be stopped, but they should stand next to us, um, work with us to make sure uh, we end the, uh, the massacre of Kurds in the region, the really bad treatments of Kurds that is going on, ongoing now, but they should do much more than what they do now, uh, which is just press releases and, and so on. Beni dinlediğiniz için çok teşekkür ediyorum. Hepinizi tekrardan saygıyla selamlıyorum. Biraz zaman aşımına uğradım. Ee, onu da artık <gülüyor> mazur kör. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Dilek uh, Öcalan. Thank you very much, Jody Dean. Thank you very much, Sadat Karabulut. Um, we come to the closing of the, the panel of uh, today on the history of stateless uh, democracy. I'm not going to try to make a, a summary of what has been discussed uh, over the last few minutes, but I would like to 
to, to, to, to wind off with, with an issue which was also raised where by, uh, or was raised by uh, Jody Dean, the, the democratic confederalism. Is this, is, this, is this stateless democracy or is this about a different configuration of the state? A question which I think, well, it's, it's, it's, it's, it's, uh, it's an ego in my, uh, in my mind. Um, if the state, or if you define the state, and I try to find a way out of this for myself, also with a lot of question marks, if the state is out about the monopolization of violence, of resources, of decision making, and if we see something unfolding uh, as a fragile experiment in Rojava, which is, which is different from that, um, should we not then try to find another name for it? As much as we are used to making a distinction today between the economy and capitalism, should we not make that distinction between government and the state and somehow look at what's unfolding in Rojava, see as a new form of government, but not really like the state form we are living in which is dominant, also in our imagination, dominant uh, today. It's a question mark. Uh, I think also an issue which could be discussed at another occasion, we could also discuss it in the, in the break, and that's what we're going to do now, having a break, and we have a lunch. And the lunch is, uh, is being prepared by an artist and a cook named Shim Hendricks, the lunch is for free, so you're all invited, and we will be back and a look at Jonas at 4.15. So enjoy your lunch and see you later again.
place squeezing. Welcome, welcome to this uh, block two of uh, today. I would like to just briefly uh, introduce um, Vincent, Vincent van Gerven Uy, somebody um, whom I happen to collaborate on a number of uh, projects uh, together. Vincent is um, connected to the organization of the New World Summit, I believe, since 2012 as both the advisor and, um, and uh, editor. I'm going to uh, look at this because it's a very long um, uh, list. I should cut them. I'm not going to do that. Vincent van Gerven Uy is a philologist with a background in music composition, linguistics, conceptual art, and philosophy. Um, he has addressed various, various uh, topics, such as Albanian socialist realist heritage and contemporary regimes of violence and torture in politics and literature. And interestingly enough, it's specifically the topic of violence that brought us together in various collaborations, whether it was uh, a project of artists' organizations international in Berlin a year ago, or the posthuman glossary where we're looking at the notion of violence under the contemporary posthuman condition. Uh, Vincent is co-director of Punctum, Punctum, Punctum, Punctum Books, <laughs> director of the Department of Eagles, that's a project bureau for the arts and humanities in Tirana, and director of multilingual publish publishing house Uitgeverij. He's also a funding direct uh, founding director of the journal Dotavo, a journal of Nubian studies, and as I said, affiliated with the uh, New World Summit for a number of years, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, yeah. um, thanks, uh, Maria, for the very, very kind introduction. Um, welcome back, everybody, to the second session of uh, today, um, Stateless Democracy and Self-Defense. Um, I think, I, or at least, of course, I'm predisposed to feel this, but I feel that this question of violence has been hanging over the discussion, at least yesterday and today, to a certain extent that um, if you at some point would want to assert yourself as a community in a state that does not want that, then this is a question that comes up rather rapidly. Um, and I'm, we have several organizations here and speakers in our midst that have traveled from very far and sometimes under very difficult conditions that, um, that, that can testify to that. And I think this is, this is a very important aspect. So um, let me just very, very briefly introduce um, this panel. Um, as I said, it's called Stateless Democracy and Self-Defense. Um, our first speaker today will be uh, Zuhat Kobani. He is the, EU re the representative of the PYD uh, in, the, in Europe. Um, and there will be several people who will respond to him, and I really hope that we can develop uh, a good conversation out of it. Uh, the first respondent will be Laila Khaled from the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, uh, Jennifer McCann from Sinn Féin, and uh, we have a flying mic somewhere over there in the hands of Gorka Elege Barrieta from Shortu from Basque Country. Um, and obviously I hope that we can also find the time to, to, uh, to get some questions from you, from the audience. Um, but before I introduce you to our first speaker, I would li like to say a few words about the, the thematic of self-defense, because I think it's important somehow to position this in, in somewhat of a clear way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make an attempt at this. Um, and and I'm, I'm apologizing, Laila, because I will say a few, I will use a few theoretical concepts also. Um, in his famous essay, Critical Violence, um, Walter Benjamin makes a distinction between the law-making function of violence, pursuits for natural ends, as, such as the establishment of a state through a constitution, and the law-preserving function of violence, pursuit for legal ends, such as the violence exerted by the state to preserve its laws, the police force, for example, especially in so-called democratic states, go beyond both functions. And, and, I, and I quote, Police violence is emancipated from both conditions. Its lawmaking for its characteristic function is not the promulgation of laws, but the assertion of legal claims for any decree, and law-preserving because it is at the disposal of these ends. 
Benjamin calls both lawmaking and law preserving violence mythical. It is mythical precisely in the sense that it creates narratives, myths around itself that are supposed to justify its otherwise unjustifiable violence. In Greek tragedy, the founding of a democracy based on slavery is mythologized through the judgments of Orestes on a hill in Athens. In American comedy, the founding of a military industrial complex based on slavery is mythologized through the founding fathers. Contrasted with this mythical violence, we find a form of violence that Benjamin refers to as divine or sovereign violence. He gives two examples, and I think these two examples are very important and they're very much connected. Um, the first example of self-defense in the face is, is the first example is self-defense in the face of a murderous oppressor, a violence that breaks the mythical cycle of destroying states and rebuilding them. And I cite, on the breaking of this cycle maintained by mythical forms of law, on the suspension of law with all the forces on which it depends as they depend on it, finally, therefore, on the abolition of state power, a new historical epoch is founded. Self-defense, if we follow Benjamin, is therefore fully antagonistic to the concept of the state. So self-defense is by definition targeted at the state. Um, perhaps we can say, and I would like to make this a possible starting point for the panel, but I, I imagine there, there are so many other ones. Um, so a possible starting point could be that self-defense is by definition stateless. The second and maybe even more important example of divine violence that Benjamin gives us is education. I quote again. This divine power is attested not only by religious tradition, but is also found in everyday life. The educative power, which in its perfected form stands outside the law, is one of its manifestations. Thus education and self-defense, education and self-defense, are correlative, codependent. It is impossible to educate and be educated without self-defense, and self-defense is impossible without education. What testifies to the existence and necessity of such a relation between self-defense, education, and the condition of statelessness are the current attempts of the state, of many states, to destroy educational systems. In the Netherlands, in Turkey, in the United States, in fact, everywhere. This makes the link between self-defense in terms of culture and in terms of violence all the more important, I think, for our discussion today. I also want to say something briefly about the space where we are. It has, it has been commemorated several times by Jonas. We are here in the space where six Dutch provinces signed the Union of Utrecht, a free association of independent provinces to share resources in their struggle against a common oppressor, the Spanish Empire. This insurrection against oppression precipitated the beginning of the blossoming of Dutch art and culture, also known under the name of the Golden Age, which, by the way, also introduced massive slave trade, um, as was pointed out yesterday by a very astute member, I think, of the audience. Um, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam prominently featured what is considered the masterpiece from this period. It's called The Night Watch by Rembrandt from 1642. This colossal iconic painting, now the most important painting in the Netherlands, some say, shows us the militia company, the militia company of the second district of Amsterdam, that is a self-defense force organized by a free city against an imperialist oppressor, situated within an atmosphere of religious harmony, signaled by the brotherhood of the two main figures of the painting, the Protestant captain Frans Banning Kok and his Roman Catholic lieutenant Willem van Ruitenburg. It is more than ironic that during a recent publicity event accompanying the reopening of the Rijksmuseum, sponsored by a major corporate bank, the self-defense militia of Nightwatch was rebranded as a police force, chasing down in full ceremonial outfits a petty thief through the air-conditioned spaces of a shopping mall. This complete and perhaps willful misunderstanding of what a self-defense militia is and its perversion into a police force is perhaps iconic for the way in which the Netherlands has changed 
from a free union of independent stateless provinces founded on collective struggle against imperialism into a centralized police state that we find ourselves in today. Um, to, to, to contemplate and to learn from another free union of independent provinces in a struggle against imperialist oppressors through self-defense with an emphasis on continuous education, religious harmony, gender equality, and the belief in the crucial importance of statelessness, and this, of course, we will unpack, I think, with our, with our other speakers as well. Um, this brings me to our main speaker of today, which is Zuat Kobani, the representative of the PYD here in Europe. And I would glad to give him the microphone. He will be... He will be translated by the incomparable Sivan Said. <laughs> do, you, do you have a microphone? Yeah, good. Thank you. We have a lot of organizations that have been able to do this, and we have a lot of people who have been able to do this. We have a lot of people who have been able to do this. I was about to speak Kurdish. Thanks everybody for uh, being here and thanks for organizers of this uh, great uh, summit. And we are very happy to have some good uh, dialogue with everybody here. Just uh, before I start this, uh, very recently, maybe uh, just now, this afternoon, I had a phone call from uh, Rojava, from the uh, YPG and YPG, YPG and YPJ, and I said to them that we have a very good discussion about you, and they send their salute to all of you. Uh, we have very important discussions about uh, theoretical or theories of, of this uh, behind not only the practice at the moment. So I'd like to start my talk in this way to make more better understanding. <laughs> The first point I would like to address is about the crisis, the, the social crisis, not only political and not for Kurds only, but for most of uh, the other parts of the world and still is not being uh, uh, solved. Uh, in Europe, uh, to solve the social issue in this country, in, in, in the world, uh, Europe had a very good attempt. For about 400 years, the struggle for sorting the social issue in, in, in, in Europe uh, has been seen so many stages. Renaissance, reform, democracy, democracy, democracy, and uh, we have seen so many stages like reform, like uh, seeing, uh, making discussion about democracy and finally Republican and even empire. All these kind of the discussions by stages is being done, but still the crisis is in there. It's not been fully solved. Despite some progress has been happened, but still we can all uh, accept this reality that we have some chaos or some crisis here and still hasn't been solved and still it's worth it to talk about it and think about alternative. Yeah, we can see not uh, is, when we say we have a uh, issue of social and within this we can see the health and politics and all other sub uh, branches of the whole society we can see 
crisis is exist at the moment. Esasi ve priskirikel gorei me bengehi khosh capital modernite digire. We think according to our understanding the uh, based on this all chaos we can see is coming from the modernism capitalism modernism modernism. Eger lhamber we amnegne alternative ki am alternative capital modernite cheneken am nikan chare serkirne priskirikan u av mesala zore ko am dkhazin nikash bikin chare ser bikin. If we are not looking for alternative for capitalism Modernism, uh, mo modernist capitalism. We cannot find the better solution for what the chaos we see now. Capital modernist serse lingon ho de pasire. This uh, notion of uh, capitalist uh, modernist is having three pillars. Yek ser dewleta netau. First is about nation state. Yek ser industrialism. Second is industrialism. Yek ji ser rabh al azam. The third one is about uh, increasing the interest or. The, the money economic interest f system akrabu dawlata natau bu sababa ku sharin mazin chebin bu sababa qirkirna gallak millat an chebin the nation state system as a first pillar became a cause and reason for making the genocide and very huge blood shed in in the history we can see at least from last century very easily we can see for the last 200 years how much these uh, victims we can, we can see due to the nation state and notion of building this state. Industrialism is the notion of industrialism made the big danger or the, um, dangerous on the whole the globe actually, especially in, in, in terms of ecology. Collecting the interest and the money in, in the hands of few people became a reason for making a big hunger and big inequality in the, in the world. Therefore, we can see this system uh, with having these three pillars is became, in general, we can say that is a bad, negative, and made all this chaos in, in the world. No matter if they change their names to the democratic parliament, democratic society, democratic republican, whatever you call it, if the notion is still the same, you cannot see the real solution for it, and the problem is still there. Therefore, we are thinking of having an alternative system, alternative understanding of, of, of the problem, not only changing the names and faces. System alternative, I'm the one page, linking to capital modernity, what sort of people are we? Am system democratic modernity, I'm the one page. As an alternative for the pillars of the capitalist modernist, uh, we have uh, three different alternatives based on the philosophy. First one, we have democratic autonomy as an alternative for the nation state. Democratic confederalism? No, no. Say it again. Democratic modernity alternative. Democratic modernity rather than capitalist modernity as an as a alternative. Yeah, listen, the Uleta Neto, the Uleta Kaumi, and the Hazine Netawa Democratic. First, uh, instead of the nation state, we want to have a democratic uh, nation. Lishuna Ku Yak Rangbe, Yak Dengbe, Yak Albe, Pranib Havra Jian Kerme, Jberj Ev Bengay Hosh Javake, which Hazai degree. Instead of having unification for one color, one, uh, one nation, one language, all this unification, we try to look at the diversity and multicolor and multi notions. Lishun industrialism and Rustiako can be ecology rabbe yak. On, uh, in, instead of having industrialism in a, in a notion of capitalism, we think of alternative of uh, having a, an industry which has a parallel with protecting the nature and the ecology. In terms of economy, the alternative is to think about the economy and the business dynamic uh, to uh, meet the need of the people. This system has mainly focused on the people and society. Why we just make priority for society? 
ام کو مقارنہ کی بسیط نابر جوا کی دولت دبکن ام بزان بن کو لازم ام جوا کے بدم پیش لیٹس میک ا سمپل کمپیریزن بٹوین سٹیٹ اینڈ سوسائٹی اور پیپل ٹو انڈرسٹینڈ دس بیٹر یک دیرو کا دولت کو مری بنے پنج ہزار سال ہے ہم دیرو کا جوا کے ملین سال ہے وین وی جسٹ سی دا ہسٹری آف اسٹیٹس اباؤٹ فائیو تھاؤزینڈ ایئرس بٹ دا ہسٹری آف سوسائٹی اینڈ پیپل آ می بی ملینس آف ایئرس دولت بے جواک نہ کانے جیام کے اما جواک بے دولت کانے جیام کے سٹیٹ کین نو سروائو ود اؤٹ سوسائٹی اینڈ پیپل بٹ سوسائٹی کین سروائو ود اؤٹ سٹیٹ جواک ایک بے طبقہ بے صنف کانے جیام کے فقط دولت ایک بے طبقہ نہ کانے جیام کے سوسائٹی کین لیو کین سروائو ود اؤٹ کلاس بٹ سٹیٹ کین نوٹ ود اؤٹ کلاس دولت بازار اندر چھ بھی ہے بازار بے گن نہ کانے جیام کے بے زراعت گن بے بازار کانے جیام کے سٹیٹ از بین بلڈ ان ا سٹی بٹ سٹی کین نوٹ سروائو ود اؤٹ ولیجز اینڈ رورل ایریا بٹ رورل اینڈ ولیجز کین کین سروائو ود اؤٹ سٹیز اگر کو مری بھی رہیں گی لے بن رہے جوا کا احساس ہے جبوئی وے جی ایم سسٹم اخا کونفیڈرالزم جوا کی سر جوا کے داتی نہ وین یو لک ایٹ ان دیس وٹ وی جسٹ سیڈ وی کین تھنک دیٹ سوسائٹی از مور امپورٹنٹ اینڈ یو ہیو ٹو گیو پرائورٹی ٹو دا سوسائٹی اینڈ پیپل اینڈ وی کین اسٹارٹ فرام دے اینڈ فوکس آن دس نقطہ دن از خازم بلی بکم چما کونفیڈرالزم جوا کی ایم دیویژن انادر پوائنٹ آئی وڈ لائک ٹو جسٹ میک کلیریفیکیشن وائی وی سی کونفیڈرالزم ڈیموکریٹک کونفیڈرالزم ام جوا کے دنیر ان بشے کی طبیعت ہے وی تھنک دا سوسائٹی از پارٹ اف دا نیچر جرتے گوتن طبیعت زندی طبیع الحیہ وی کال ات دا لائف نیچر جالیہ کی دن رجی دبجن طبیعت دو امین او وی کین سی دا سیکنڈ نیچر ٹو دا سوسائٹی دقت بکن طبیعت چھتے کی کونفیڈرال ہے وی تھنک دیٹ دس نیچر از ا کونفیڈرال بائی اٹس سیلف دی ہندری اویدا دی ہندر جوا کے دجی چاوک کو طبیعت کونفیڈرال ہے جواک جی وہ ہمان ہمان رنگ ہے کونفیڈرال ہے سیملر ٹو دا نیچر دا سوسائٹی از ملٹی کلر اینڈ کونفیڈرال ہیز ا نوشن اف کونفیڈرالزم بائی اٹس سیلف بائی نیچر سسٹم ہے سسٹم دولت نتوے نکانے خل سر جواک بدے مشاندن جواک را ترس دکھاوے دا نیشن سٹیٹ سسٹم کین نوٹ بی فلی اپلائیڈ آن دا سوسائٹی اینڈ از گوئنگ ٹو ہیو ویری مچ لیمیٹیشنز جواک نہ و خدا جواکی کی پولیٹک اخلاقی ہے بائی اٹس نیچر سوسائٹی از پولیٹیکل اینڈ اٹس مورل دقت بکن جواک ان دسپی کے جواک ان اخلاقی پولیٹک بون جنہا بیتر ویری لانگ اگو اف یو لک ایٹ دا دا ویری لانگ ہسٹری یو کین سی سوسائٹی بائی اٹس سیلف واز مورل سوسائٹی اینڈ پولیٹیکل سوسائٹی پولیٹیکا چی ہے نقاش کرنا و قرار ساندنا دا پولیٹکس دا ڈیفینیشن اف پولیٹکس اکارڈنگ ٹو اس از اباؤٹ ڈسکشن اینڈ ہیوین ا ڈیسیژن اخلاق چی ہے بریار ان کو تدستینی جبوی بقرال ان تپیک بین اینڈ دا مورل از دا ون وین دا ڈیسیژن از بین میڈ مست نوٹ ہارم سم اورس اینڈ میک ا بینیفٹ فور اورس جواکن بری بہبر نقاش دکرن گندام بنرن عاشیران بنرن نقاش چد بو ان ها دهندر دولت دا جواک نقاش نہ کہ تنیا ہنکس دسلادارن او نقاش دکن ارادہ گل وندا کرنے پریویسلی پیپل ڈائریکٹلی ویر میکنگ دیر اون ڈسکشن اباؤٹ دیر اون ایشوز اینڈ دے ویر میکنگ ا ڈیسیژن فار دیم سیلف ایٹ دی مومنٹ وی کین سی ان دس نوشن اف نیشن سٹیٹ سم فیو پیپل اون بیہالف اف دی سوسائٹی میکنگ دیر ڈسکشن اینڈ میکنگ ڈیسیژن وداؤٹ کمنگ بیک ٹو دی پیپل جبوی بیجی ارمان جمع کو ہم جارے کی دن جواکے کی اخلاقی پولیٹیک بدن آوا کرن وات وی ریلی وانٹ ٹو برنگ بیک دس نوشن اینڈ میک دا سوشل اینڈ پولیٹیکل اینڈ مورل مورلی سوسائٹی اگین اب نقاش نو جواکے دور نہ کرن ہم باور وہ بے گاوے کی جبوی کو برے جواکا اخلاقی پولیٹیک دا بچے دس ڈسکشن وی ڈو اینڈ از جسٹ پارٹ اف ایٹ اینڈ آئی تھنک دس از ا گڈ وے فار میکنگ دس سوسائٹی بیک اینڈ میک ایٹ ریالٹی اگین وی وی بی بی دغت کیل سر دولت جبوی بالانس کو نور دولت جوا کے دور چیکر ان دس کین بی ا پریشر اون دا سٹیٹ ٹو تھنک ٹوائس اینڈ میکنگ دا بگ گیپ بٹوین سوسائٹی اینڈ سٹیٹ لیس اینڈ لیس جبر دولت بی ا لوسیانا بیکوز دا سٹیٹ از لوسیان سٹیٹ ایٹ دا مومنٹ یعنی ایریش اندکے شر اندکے ہائے جوا کا خوشی تھی اینڈ دے آر ڈوئنگ اٹیک اینڈ ڈوئنگ سو میکنگ سو مچ وار وداؤٹ لوکنگ ایٹ دا انٹرسٹ آف دا پیپل 
دهندر جوا که دا مثلا دهندر جوا که دا پروبلم پاراستن رواج شده که خدایی. Within the society, the notion of self-defense, legitimate self-defense, is something natural. جبر مگود جوا بشه که خدایی دهندر خدایی دا جی پاراستن روا پاراستن جوهری شده که خدایی. Because we say the society is nature by itself or the second nature, and we can see even within the nature, the self-defense is something natural. دقت بکن دهندی خزای دا هر نباتک هر حیوانک سیستمی که خوی پاراستنه. If we look at the nature and and even some some trees and some other part of the nature, we can see they have a self-defense rule and regulation by themselves. گل به استریه خو خود پاریده. The flower is making its own way to to protect itself. گلک حیوان هنگ بر رفه خو بذار خو هنگ جیب سیستمی خوی پاراستنی خود پاریده. So many different animals having so many different methods of protecting themselves. اگر کو سیستم پاراستنی وره ضعیف کردن خراب بی فساد شد بی ایدنا مقاومت نمینه. If the self-defense system is going to be destroyed, the nature will be destroyed, and it cannot be survived. Instant the Aliwi system of parastine hena. And human is part of this self-rule, self-defense system. What kind of biology is it? What part is it? Human is just like biological body and must protect itself. Jaliye kidin daji kain ki jivaki ya wak jivak jian dikhe khub paris. On the other hand, is societal body and must protect the society as well. Jibui ve ke ji irishin li ser jivak ya warin jivak majbure kuwa ki khazaye ke yani beshe ki khazaye aujo khub paris. Therefore, society like a nature must protect itself, and as a society, we can see if there's some attack. Or happen must protect itself. With the recent capital modernity, ra, che, biter, irishin le ser jwa ke gallek buite khub baad e khagirtun. The modernism, capitalism, made a big attack on the notion of society and people. Netane da ali fiziki da imhab ke, ali genocide ki jinsida, genocide ki kulturida, genocide ki jwa ki da. This notion of modernism, capitalism, made the attack on not only physical genocide on the people, on the society, but even cultural and social and other aspects as well. وظیفه پاراستن جوهری دیوی عالی داره تجوهران. Therefore, the self-defense in in essential way is became some necessities. جبوی ویژه پیوست دیگه کل همبر با سیستم کد خازه جوا که به همو عالی داغیر بکه جیونوسای دکی به همو عالی پیک بینه لازم هست پاراستن اتاد همو عالی دا وارد چه کرده؟ Therefore, as a reaction of stopping this genocide or attack from this must be prepared for all the aspects of the attack to make a defense for all these accordingly. اولی جوا که کانی بی یک دالی زانسته داد جوای که زناب کی دیده جوای که بیکی سازی مؤسسات همو بشه ویدا. The most important thing is to make people to aware of their own self defense and how to protect themselves and give them a knowledge about it. مجارا میکو پاراستن ال رجواهای کردستانو و پیوستی اوه هیا ام به ون نزدیک ونه نزدیکی رجواه بود. Our approach in Rojava to protect our people is coming from this philosophy to find all the aspects of self-defense and the protecting our people. The cut begin the Rojava in Kurdistan or the Syria. I'm not getting a blocking. Yan, a good government in Darwa, the Khazan Mudakhali Syria begin on regime. If you if you very carefully looking at the situation in Rojava now, we are no part of the blocks. Of those countries who they want to destroy Bashar Assad regime, or in the allies of Bashar Assad, we are in a third line as independent and based on this philosophy. Jiberko, mudakhale ek dukhastin ko Syria bringi ki Islam a siyasi Sunni bidim pesh. Hena kani dukhast dawlat a qawmi yani aku manhar rakhne kiri we. هنگ رفورم بچوک چه بکن و بپاریم. Because the notion of of changing the Syria, current Syria was coming from two two of two forms. One of them is a Sunni nation state for Syrian people due to the majority of Sunni Muslim, or making another hardcore nationalist Arabic nationalist in in Syria that we don't accept any of them. 
انجام و هر دو پروژه ای رو گل سوری جواک سوری ضرر دیدیم because the result of both projects is actually destroying the people in Syria and that what you can see clearly in Syria at the moment ایرو سوری 300000 کشتی ہے at the moment we have 300000 people victims killed سوری 300000 بریندار ہے 300000 وندائی ہے 300000 گرتی ہے approximately 3000 300000 injured 3000 100000 people in jail and let alone all the refugees out of the country the سوری دا 3 million مال ہاتھ رو خاندن about 3 million houses been destroyed 10 million زیادہ تر کوچ بر بھی 10 million approximately been out ex exiled and been 6 million kochbari hindra charji zedatir sune darwa 6 million internally and 4 million out of the country has been displaced and jami siyaset ko dawlat al gorai block e khadidin mashandin ev anjam suriya da darket urte the result of the politics that state will pursue in is making this all this chaos ام و مقارنه بکن انجام شرک و بنا دیدن پیش ل روجاوا چه درکت وی هاف تو ریزیست اند استراگل اند بیسد اون اور پروتکشن سیستم وات یو کین سی ناو ان روجاوا ان دیز کانتونز دات از ان اور هاند روجاوا یک مگوت ام وق پاراستنا روا ام اشخار اساس بکن دفاع مشروع یعنی وی جاست تراي تو پرسیو دا نوشن اف پروتکشن اند سلف لجیتیمیت پروتکشن رادر دن اتاکین اوورز نها كان بنرند انجام دا اف خطا مگرتي هشتي كو جواك ور پاراستن دد جواك بب سازي و زانا بب this uh, policy we just started made the society to understand and have a better self aware and uh, having a good protection system for themselves حتى نها نفوس سوري 23 مليون روجاوا جي بيستو سي مليونان سي مليونان حتى ني 4 مليونان تشيركي ا هول ذا بوبيليشن اوف سوريا 23 مليون ذات 3 مليون تو 4 مليون بيبل ار ان ان روجاوا ان ذيس اريا ذات وي كول روجاوا كل غوري 6000 سوريا تشي مري نسبه كردان کو بگیره لازمه 50000 کشتی 45000 کشتیش کردان هبا according to this uh, proportion from 300000 killed at least 50000 Uh, had to be Kurds because the population is 4 million. But all Rojava in Kurdistan, the Hindu Vishari Pen Salanda, 4,000 shahid. But overall, we have 4,000 shahids or, or martyrs or killed uh, people for the last five years. So the, the proportion is very less than this. Due yani to system of Parastana Rawa, system of Parastana Rawa, the Lineko Kushti Kembebend, Uj Lehamberi Weji, Sis Mudile Kichawa Hajiam became a brave over. It means our self protection system made us to have less victims and having better status. And Bauer and Koef system, Gov Gov Idena, Bauri Galangi Pichedbe. We think that this system we have developed uh, slightly, others will understand and try to convince that this is the best way for them as well. And Dwek and Atedana, Mudila Ko, Vez Hatta Madai Pish, Wak the Surya, the Debe Mudile Ki Kuchawa, and Idena, Galkane Hobreva Bebe. We only Rini Kugel Nukan Hobreva Be Meshkena. We just broken the notion that people cannot rule themselves and protect themselves due to our uh, struggle and we show the others that even them they can do what we did to protect themselves and rule themselves more than this uh, in the international level people are slightly getting to understand that this things is not longer just dream or some little talk but is real بنگهی بلوک دموکراتیک پیشنگتی یه پیگیر یه پیچه دهات چیکرند. Which we call it the block of democratic block rather than two other blocks before and with the leading of YPG and YPG, YPG and YPG. لهمبری بلوک فاشیزان یک داعش سرکشی دیگه. In front of the fascist block, which is ISIS, Islamic so-called Islamic State, is leading it. وقت شر جهانی دیدیم داشت چه وقت پیشنگتی شورشگرین یونان و اسپانان دا بلوکا دموکراتیک ها چه کرن ای روژی دا قرنی بیست و یکی دا دا پیشنگتی ها روژاوه دا تیچه کرن سیمیلر تو دا هستری او سیکند هو ورلد وار وین وی کود سی گریگ و سپانیش لیبریشن موفمنس مید دا دفرنس ات دا مومن این توانی فیل سینتری این روژاوه یو کن سی دیس دفرنس و هاوین ای دفرنس بلوک و دموکراتیک I can say there are some results on this, and I'd like to say a few of them. 
تنها تو سبو اوای نرست درکت گل که خود تنظیم بکه تفگیر بکه گل کانه خوب بپاریده جواب کانه خوب بپاریده. Before they said the only state can protect people and now we just made the real that no people themselves can protect themselves and you saw this. لهمبر داشت دولت بین کفتن اما ایرادا گل ایرادا جواب کب سرکه. In front of ISIS the state is being defeated but on the other hand, uh, couldn't defeat the people of ourselves uh, ruled, and we just defeated them. Other than, yeah. Yeah, Another claim that they said no one, like people, cannot help themselves. Them other. A powerful nation or states can come and help them. That was like that for a long time. We just make this claim even not true, and we can see people themselves without the hands of people of the powerful states made this uh, struggle, and you can see the result now. <laughs> Thanks for listening to us because we've been given only 20 minutes and both of us, we just made it and thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sahad. Thank you, Sahad, for a very clear and very succinct articulation of, um, of the notion of self-defense uh, in the struggle of the courts in Rojava. Um, it, was, it was very precise and, and I really appreciate Also, thank you for keeping to the time. Um, I think what is a very interesting thing that you said, uh, many things were interesting, but one of the, one of the ideas that you voiced is that um, your notion of self-defense is not directly, is directed not to the states, but to what you called capitalist modernism. So the nation state is part of this, but you also target industrialism and, and a certain type of financial, uh, financialized economy. Um, I, I would like to, um, to, to turn then this, this, this, uh, uh, these ideas to, uh, to our, our first respondent, which is, uh, which is Laila Khaled. Um, Leila Khaled has been a member of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine and its forerunner since 1959. Uh, she was born in Haifa in Palestine, uh, but her family was expelled during the Nakba, the Palestinian exodus of 1948 when she was four years old. Um, Khaled is most known for the hijacking of two airplanes in 1969 and 1970 to raise international awareness for the oppression of the Palestinian people and demand the release of political prisoners. Um, she is also a member of the Palestinian National Council, uh, the legislative body of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, and a regular speaker at the World Social Forum. Um, I would be, I think we would be very honored if you would share with us um, uh, your history and your, your ideas on self-defense, and especially on, on a question I think that, that also came up yesterday, which is really like, um, who is a terrorist to whom, and who decides who is a terrorist? I think that this is this is a question that always looms over a discussion where where some where, you know where there's a struggle against terror that is always and you see this in in terms of of course you see this in terms of of the struggle of the Palestinian cities in the in the in the struggle of the of the Irish it's always easily turned around so maybe you could also speak a little bit about that thank you I'm honored to be among you and for the organizers. Thank you very much to give me this opportunity to speak to you on new subjects. But uh, uh, I was not dreaming of getting a visa, but I told our comrades a miracle happened in the beginning of this year that I got a visa to Holland. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Let me say I, I didn't expect to uh, be a part of a, a conference 
that speaks about something very theoretical, stateless democracy. This is something very new to me. And I studied uh, history, and uh, I'm <coughs> a Marxist. I am educated with Marxism. Yet this is the first time I hear such uh, terminology about democracy. Um, the uh, participants who uh, yesterday spoke, they defined democracy just as a definition from the Greek language, the rule of people. Then let us uh, question ourselves. Have we witnessed up till now in the 21st century, have we witnessed the rule of people? I give an answer, I doubt. The democracy we are speaking about, <clears throat> the rule of people means the majority of the people. And the classes in the society that have an interest in democracy. While what we are seeing, or we witnessed up till now, <clears throat> we see democracy for the ruling class and not for the people. So this is not democracy. <clears throat> uh, classes that rule in the, uh, like the West and US, powerful uh, states, um, they, it's for the corporations that they own and not for the people. Still now, in the West, they are speaking about <coughs> the uh, medical care. It's uh, when there is democracy, then there is medical care for the people. So until now, it's discussed in many countries. So it's not the uh, example that we are looking for. We are looking for uh, a democracy that ensures human rights, not like what they say across the ocean, human rights there. They accuse everybody that uh, it's not uh, <coughs> defending human rights, but uh, according to uh, what the policies, uh, human rights in the United States differs from human rights in Palestine and Syria and China also. They look upon it that it's violation, while to occupy another country is not violation in their uh, uh, and thinking. So uh, we have to test the words and to test the word democracy. Is it implemented as it is defined? Again, I say no, it's not. And where uh, democracy begins? Is it by elections? I don't think I, I uh, <coughs> think that Democracy is a way of life, and it begins from the beginning in our families. If we are not democratic in our families, we cannot build a system, a democratic system also. We cannot build a democratic mm -hmm. system if we are not sensitive, gender sensitive. Women are half of the societies in most countries. Uh, yet still, we are discussing the issue of women and the rights of women and the position of women in, uh, in societies. I'm not going to continue speaking about uh, the definition, but in the heart of this definition, it is social justice and social economy. The wealth, in this world is for 1% of the people in the world. And the 99%, they are not enjoying 
real wealth of their countries. Then, those who are pretending that they are democratic, I think they are the terrorists. Because they are invading our minds, or they are trying to invade our minds with their values, the values of capitalism, the values of globalization, the values of exploitation, the values of oppression of the peoples of the world, as we see. Now, I came from a place where it's on fire. It's in Palestine, it's in Syria, it's in Iraq. And it's not an incident that we see that all this region is on fire. In Palestine, it's Israel there. And it's doing its job, just killing people by suspicion to kill. And they are doing it every day. Every day in Palestine these days, since three months, three people are killed every day. And now they reach to about 178 people, mainly children. And we know why it's children. Because <clears throat> this state that pretends that it's the democratic oasis in the Middle East is killing the Palestinian children in uh, thinking that the new generation will also fight this occupation. And they are killing our children. Can you imagine if they see a child with his bag on his back coming from school? They suspected that they have stones, so they shot them dead. <clears throat> One of them did not die. If anybody have the opportunity to, to see that child called Ahmad Manasra, now he is 14. Uh, he was 13 when he was shot, and all the soldiers were saying, die, die, die. And it was in the, on uh, YouTube, everybody saw it. In Israel, a child is uh, of, uh, from one to 14, while it's internationally, it's from one to 18. Hmm? And if they catch him or detain him when he is 12, they wait two years and they take him to court. This child was 13 and something. Now he ended his 14, he is 14. They took him to the court. And even when they, this child was interrogated, <coughs> we have seen a video when the two people, the Israelis, are interrogating him. And he was saying, I don't remember. I don't remember. When they asked him, they, he says, I don't remember. Then they were uh, beating him, and they, will t they told him, now you can remember. This, we have seen it. I don't know how it came out. But I'm giving the example of a state that was built and established by a resolution from the United Nations. That was after the Second World War. What happened in Europe by the Nazis, we were punished as Palestinians, not retaliating against the Nazis while retaliating against us and on the basis of uh, justice, the United Nations had a resolution to partition Palestine to two states without asking us. And before that, the Zionist movement worked hard to uh, uh, make the world believe its lie that Palestine is a land without people to a people without a land. By which they meant that no Palestinians were living there 
And the uh, Jews, uh, as citizens of other countries, have the right to come to Palestine and live there, and forcing the, the people of Palestine to leave. And this is what happened. Now, I am I'm born in Haifa. <coughs> I'm not allowed to go. Maybe many of you can go and see it. I can't see it. And other six million Palestinian refugees are not allowed to go back to their homeland. Although there is another United Nations resolution, hmm? 194, that was in 1947, uh, that uh, the uh, Palestinians have the right to go back. Israel has to accept the return of the Palestinians to their homeland and properties that we were forced to leave uh, them in 1948. But Israel did not abide by that <clears throat> up till now. And Israel considers itself above international law. Until this moment, since 68 years, Israel was built on our expense, in our homes, in our land. And we are deprived and denied the right for return. And the United Nations that calls and was established to solve the problems of the people and the conflicts in the world gave the right to a movement, the Zionist movement. And I'm in Holland speaking about Zionism. This movement is a racist movement built an apartheid state, it's Israel, building a wall on the Palestinian land for security reasons, as they say always, for security reasons, for security reasons, as if we are attacking. We are defending ourselves because we are under occupation, and occupation is terrorism. It's the highest peak of Terrorism, it's occupation. Occupation the land, occupation the people, and denying the right for the people to be on their land. We, as Palestinians, offered a solution. And that solution is to build a democratic state in Palestine, where we can live all together. On basis of equal rights and duties. Of course, they refused it. So the Palestinians tried from the beginning that this occupation cannot end without facing it with the people's right for resistance. And this is not a Palestinian invention to hold arms. It's the human invention where there is occupation, there is resistance, and it is also legal. So the violence that Vincent was saying about speaking about it, it should be faced not with roses. There is legal violence and there is illegal violence. Occupation is illegal, always, in history, now and yesterday and if it will, in the future, it's illegal. <clears throat> While the, and it is terrorism. They are the ones to create terrorism. When people resist, their media uh, denies it for the people to resist, and they label us as terrorists. Now, can you imagine yourself a bulldozer coming to your house and destroy it? 
like what's happening in Palestine. Every day. Now there are 15,000 houses uh, where families are living in. The bulldozers are coming to uh, destroy them. How would you react as human beings? How we react? A house that is built with sweat from the workers, the, the, the owners of those houses, they build room by room, not at once. And the family is in the street. Many, many uh, examples I can give when the uh, uh, people put a tent and the Israelis come and uh, also uh, destroy the tent. They want them to live in the streets. <clears throat> this means that the world have a deaf ear. I'm not speaking about the people and the progressive forces, no. I'm speaking about governments. And this global system that defends injustice and violates human rights. I don't expect anyone, a sane human being, to accept that his home is destroyed because the other one is more powerful. It means that one should defend himself. To defend yourself, you use all the means in your hand. You have a knife, you use it. You have a stone, you use it. You have a Kalashnikov, you use it. Because violence, reaction, reactionary violence, should be met by revolutionary uh, violence also. Why not? This is our right. And at the same time, we are offering, still offering, the human and democratic solution for this historical uh, uh, conflict. It's a democratic state in Palestine where all of us can live on equal basis in rights and duties. It took us 25 years to convince our people that we are not against the Jews. The Jews are human beings with a Jewish religion and all religions we respect. But it took time for us to educate our people that Zionism is not a religion. It's a racist movement, and it's a reactionary movement. Hmm? But <clears throat> still, we need more and more to educate our people that we can live together. But when? Not at this moment, when our children, our uh, young chaps are killed in the streets just by suspicion. <clears throat> because they are suspected to throw a stone or to have a knife. And the jails now are full to the extent that the department of the prisons in, in uh, Israel are saying that we don't have any more space. Now they are about 8,500 prisoners, including women and children. <clears throat> This is the way that makes our conscious and our mind think about words like democracy. We can't build democracy without a state. It's, uh, it's just something you know, theoretical. Uh, maybe uh, the, uh, what uh, our comrade uh, spoke about it. <coughs> this is only a step by defending yourself in front of any attack. And what, what is uh, uh, really, uh, I didn't hear it from yesterday, nobody is speaking about ISIS. This is the tool of the imperialists. They are using it like they uh, founded the uh, 
Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, and the Qaeda. Now, this they want to, and they used it, and it's enough. Now, Daesh or uh, ISIS. So, when we speak about destroying societies, we have to focus on why in this time that ISIS is spreading. This is a, a big question also. <clears throat> I, I, I think I have to stop now. Thank you very much, and I'll abide by Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laila, for, for, for a wonderful intervention. And I, and I think that there, is, there, there are many things to, to build on in, in what you said. Um, for example, when, when you said that, that occupation is the highest form of terrorism, I had to think that um, uh, actually the word terrorism and terror itself, they are related to the, world, to, to the word territory, right? So the idea of territory itself already presumes a certain certain amount of terror, and I think this is this is something we we could maybe keep in mind. Um, uh, however, you made a very clear statement that I would maybe like uh, Zuhat maybe if you have uh, if you would like to respond is is the very clear statement that you say we cannot have democracy without the state, and I think that this is obviously at the core of our discussion here uh, today. So I would really. Well, at the same time, I see many overlaps between the way you conceptualize your struggle. So it, this really seems to be a very particular point of difference. So maybe, Zuhad, you would like to respond to this particular point before I would like to go to the next respondent who is already waiting. Uh... Yes, please, yeah. Not 20 minutes, maybe five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Spas Nahal Vedere Nirini Nuem, Derdhan Pesh, Unirinji Bengahi, Dirukiem, Esas Degrin. Thank you very much. Actually, we are here for having more than one opinion, and it's good to have discussion on the other side of the ideas, not only then we say, and because of this, we're going to have more new ideas after this even. Uh, Madam Leila just even in her talk said that the state doing uh, pursuing so many anti-democratic steps and uh, blaming steps very much. What we see the condition is that for the whole long of the history, state couldn't pursue the democracy and develop it. However, state at this stage can be at least some help making in a position of the help to pursue democracy, but by itself cannot create or develop democracy by itself. We have seen in the history that so many times names has been changed, that democratic parliamentary state, democratic state, etc. But still we can see in the practice most more violence and more chaos have been seen actually due to the state production of this way of democracy. However, we can see the practice of some organizations or uh, groups, is better way to say, out of the state, that we can see the practice 
in a natural way without making all these kind of uh, rule and regulation that today state pursuing, we can see some notion of democracy and practical democratic behaviors within these kind of groups out of the state. Because the, the character of making the state is coming from the production and making the economic more interest production. Because of that greed cannot be democratic and cannot be pluralist to give all others the same opportunity. Devlet plus democracy. But we are thinking of different approach, which is we have state plus democracy. We have an equation that whatever the state is strong, democracy is weak, and vice versa. That's why we try to go this way to make democratic. Uh, groups, uh, democracy stronger in order for states to be weaker and just coordinator. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, it seems here again we come back to the, to the distinction uh, that was already made in, in the previous panel, which is the difference between the government and the state. So I think again here we have to, to make clearly this separation. Um, at, the, at the same time, um, I would um, like, let, let me put it like this. Um, there is something I think that, that should be articulated with it, which is that on the one hand, as I said, I mean, you share many different, many, many similar viewpoints in the way that you approach your struggle. At the same time, um, it is very clear for all of us to see that they are happening in very different conditions, in very different territorial situations, um, and at the same time um, uh, must therefore like find ways to deal with problems that appear at very particular moments in time. Um, when we were talking this morning, uh, Jennifer made, made the comment that while we may be completely stuck in our, in our own very specific struggle, at the same time there seems to be this circulation between struggling movements um, that learn from each other, that take over from each other, and maybe this is also some aspect I think that is very important to emphasize that it's not only about this, this very specific, as you said, theoretical differences, which I think that in the end, you know, I, I imagine that a lot of practices could be implemented in a future Palestinian state that, that they are developing, and that the way that you talk about struggle has actually been implemented by them as well, before they had liberated parts of northern Syria. So um, I would like to give the, the microphone to, um, to Jennifer. Um, Jennifer McCann is from Sinn Féin. Um, she has been elected member of the Northern Ireland Assembly for the Irish Republican Party uh, since 2007. Um, Sinn Féin is a democratic socialist and currently second largest party in the, sorry, in the North, Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, McCann was imprisoned uh, as a member of the IRA, as a political prisoner for over 10 years in the Armagh jail and in the Mugabri women's prison during the 1980s. I think maybe this is also an aspect uh, that, that you could address in your, um, in your presentation, in your response. Um, and at the same time, um, there is a very particular situation in Ireland at the moment that they are uh, confronted with the 100 year centennial commemoration of the Dublin Commune, which brings about, again, the question of nationhood in this case, and the way of commemorating liberational struggle. So maybe this is also something you would, would like to address. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd just like to, to thank the organizers for inviting me here today um, to talk about our experience. Um, I have been told that you know our accents sometimes can be very difficult for people to understand, so I'm going to try and speak as slowly. Um, uh, we, we do tend to speak quite fast in Belfast, but I'll try and speak um, a, as slowly as I can. Uh, I think, uh, uh, as Vincent said earlier, you know we were talking, um, and Leila and Gorka here from the Basque country, 
Um, and I suppose, uh, in, uh, as you mentioned, while no two struggles and no two conflicts are the same, there's certainly been relationships have built up, particularly between the Irish people and the Palestinian people, and the Irish people and the, ba the people from the Basque country, and indeed other people that I have heard speak in the, the Kurdish movement. I have met with, with um, people from that, that movement also. And, and we do, you know, even, even I suppose, in, in sense that while there's no conflict now in, in, in Ireland, as, um, that really we still, you know, um, I mean, many members of our party travel right across the world. We go to, um, you know, and, and recently we have been in Colombia as well. Just to, you know, and, and it's not as I said, I mean, because no two struggles are the same, no two peace process, processes are the same, but it, it's just to, to, to try and, you know, um, give our experience of our conflict uh, and give our experience of how we are where we are today. And, and I'll come to that when I'm finishing up at, at the end of my talk. I suppose, uh, as Vincent said, I want to start at the very beginning almost, um, and it's not to give people a history lesson here, because I'm sure you, you know the history, history of our country. But, you know, given the, the, that this year is the 100th anniversary of the 1916 Easter Rising uh, in Ireland, I think, you know, um, it's, it, it's very apt in terms of what we have, and, I, and I've listened to the discussions over yesterday and today. But as for, for us uh, and for Irish Republicans, that was, that was one of the, the clear indications, you know, that, that we, were, we were actually saying we, we, uh, we were wanting to overthrow the British Empire, but overthrow the occupation of our country. And what those handful of people did in 1916 to go out to have the proclamation. And the proclamation, really, the, the whole basis of the proclamation was cherishing all the children of the nation equally. It was about equality, it was about social justice, and there was also, um, it was also about gender equality as well, because for the first time, women were actually mentioned in the proclamation, Irish men and Irish women. So I think that it was a very, very, it's a very, very important sort of historical um, uh, place for, for us to be in this year, in 2016, as we go into the 100th anniversary, and I know even as I'm here this weekend, we have, uh, were, the, were the leaders actually at the end of, um, when, when they were coming together, they didn't want to cause any more bloodshed, they said, and they, they were sort of negotiating their, um, between themselves uh, their, their surrender. And really, that was in Moore Street, 16 Moore Street. And as we stand now today, this weekend, the, the Irish government in the south are, are looking to demolish one of the key places in Irish history. And I think that there is, there is now an occupation of Moore Street, and there's a big rally there tomorrow, um, which unfortunately we'll miss. Um, but again, as I said, you know, that, that and, and I want to come on to that and later, you know, just where, where the heads of, of the, the, the Irish, um, the, the southern state is at the moment. Um, really, I suppose in terms of um, then we, we, we had the, the 1916 rising, we had the, the execution of the leaders, and then we had partition. Um, and really, in partition, um, it divided uh, the north and the south of Ireland. And it divided the six counties, and the six counties were very, very clearly um, still under British occupation. And because of that uh, partition, there has been, throughout the decades, to, to, um, to the, the, the recent conflict, which ended um, in 1994, we basically had um, other sort of uh, uprisings in that, um, but... Again, as I said, they were all centred around partition. And as we were talking earlier, a response to that partition. Um, but going into our, our more recent conflict, um, and I want to sort of make, the, make this, the, the, the sort of similarities here, because we talked about terrorism um, earlier. And it's that definition, because very, very often, we in, in the Republican movement um, in the IRA have been sort of put out there right across the world as being the terrorists in the conflict. And I want to, to, to sort of uh, try to, to, to tell people now how that was never the case, and where actually, where that resistance came from, and where that struggle came from um, uh, in terms of where, where we, it was a response to oppression and the, the, the oppression from the British state. So obviously, uh, the uh, late 1960s, um, 
inspired by other, other places like the US and other places we had the civil rights movement, which came about in the north of Ireland. And that was basically a movement that came together um, to challenge discrimination against nationalists, against republicans and against Catholics. And they, we had a northern state from its inception in 1921-22, basically was a state that discriminated against one side of the population. And that discrimination was right through in housing rights, it was right through in terms of jobs, in education, and they even created a system, we call it gerrymandering, but they created a system where even um, people were, who were trying to elect members um, onto the, the, what was called the, the state then, when they were trying to elect members, they actually tinkered with the electoral system so there could only ever be a one-party state. There was only ever a one-party state. And I know it didn't matter what way you voted, because of the way they tinkered with the system, there was always just a one-party majority state. And again, that one-party majority state had the whole apparatus of the legal system behind it, had the whole apparatus of policing behind it and justice, and had the whole, whole apparatus of all those other things that actually um, kept that state going, discriminating um, and, and treating another section of the community totally, uh, uh, with, with, with, uh, totally uh, unequally. And what we had as part of that state then was the B Specials and the RUC, which were the Royal Ulster Constabulary, which were the, was policing at that time. But we also had a formation of a loyalist grouping in the late 60s as well. This was all around the same time uh, of the civil rights movement. And we had those lo that loyalist organisation like a paramilitary force, another arm of the state and supported by the state. And what they did was they carried out a bombing campaign and they carried out um, shootings of Catholics in 1966. You've heard of, of, of the, the, the people that were shot then, I'm sure. We had also then um, a Battle of the Bogside in 1969, where we had hand-to-hand -hand fighting with police, because police and the B Specials would have attacked marchers that were out in civil rights um, campaigns and, and, and marching for their civil rights. And in Belfast, we had a, a particularly violent programme in terms of we had those loyalists, paramilitary forces, along with the B-Specials and along with the police force at that time, attacking Catholic homes and burning Catholics out of their homes and indeed um, shooting Catholics dead. Um, and that's what was, if you like, sparked off the, the, the conflict um, that we, we, we saw um, for years in the North then. And really what, what Republicans and what the IRA did was defend themselves not defend themselves, but defended their community. That there was no one else there to defend the local people who were getting bombed out of their homes, who were getting shot at, because the whole state was, was against, or, or was lining up to actually attack Catholics, attack nationalists and attack Republicans. So that, you know, um, when, they, when they call us terrorists, that's what we, we, we were born out of um, in those days. And, you know, Coming into then, in, and I'm going to just concentrate a wee bit because Vincent has asked me, in West Belfast, West Belfast at that time, we had curfews, and we had also curfews in, in other parts of the north, but right across the north we had special uh, powers acts, we had internment where people could be arrested and interned without trial, we had a conveyor belt system that actually imprisoned people for long, long years, we had something like 25,000 Republicans went through the jails through the, through the conflict, which was quite a high percentage given, you know, we, we are an island of, of six and a half million and in the north there's one and a half. So we had, we had really basically those special powers where you had non-jury courts. You were tortured during interrogations in Castle Ray and Gough Barracks and other barrackses. You had British Army on the streets. West Belfast was one of the most militarised zones when I was growing up as a child there um, than anywhere else in Western Europe. You couldn't go from A to B without getting stopped by, by armed British soldiers. Uh, and, and, and, you know, that there, that there was the reality of people people had to, to grow up into. You had shoot-to-kill policies by, by the British state. You had the use of plastic bullets. Many children were killed by plastic bullets. So you had all those sort of human rights abuses 
um, and, and the state-sponsored violence. You also had a, a level of collusion, which is only really getting um, exposed now uh, in terms of, of uh, families bringing cases through coroners' courts or bringing cases to Europe. So you had either the state directly killing people or you had the state indirectly killing people by the use of the death squads um, in, in the loyalist paramilitaries. So th that, that, that was the situation that you had, and that was the situation that people were fighting against, were fighting against the oppression and repression. Um, and I just want to touch a bit then on terms of the, the prisons. We had, um, when we had internment, we had what was called special category status, which meant prisoners who went into jail had um, a special sort of political status. And Margaret Thatcher and, uh, and others um, obviously uh, took, tried to take that away from the prisoners in 1976. And the prisoners who went in, particularly, um, I, was in, I was in Armagh Women's Prison, and we were lucky as women that we were able to wear our own clothes. But the men in, in the hitch blocks of Long Cash um, had to wear... Uh, they, they were trying to force them to wear a uniform and they refused to do it. So the jail system then became another site of struggle for Republicans in that they suffered the brutality of um, you know, being beaten and they suffered the brutality of being strip searched. They suffered the brutality of having to lie in their cells for years without being able to go to the toilet, without being able to wash and without being able to see family, family members. So that brutality in those prisons resulted in the, the men embarking on a hunger strike in March of 1981. And, you know, I, I just, and, and I tell this story because, you know, uh, people sometimes say, you know, about, you know, uh, and I, I will say when I was speaking to Lila earlier, she was one of my heroes whenever, you know, um, in, in the 70s and that. And people would talk to me about Bobby Sands. Um, and I know for a lot of people, Bobby Sands, you know, even at home, you know, for, for a lot of our young people, is, is inspirational and, you know, would be up there with, with, with, all, with all sort of, you know, personal heroes that people have. And I knew Bobby. I was very, very lucky to know Bobby. He, he was a friend and I was a friend of the family. And Bobby Sands was just an ordinary person. He was someone who cared about his community. He was someone who, who totally cared about his comrades in the jail. And that was why Bobby wanted to be the first one to go on hunger strike. Because Bobby knew that people were going to die on hunger strike. He knew that you know, they were dealing with a, a government and a state who was totally intransigent and didn't care what was happening. Um, so they basically, he knew, and that was what, one of the reasons that, that he, he took, took on to go on the hunger strike first. And we know that, that, that Bobby wasn't, unfortunately, the only one to die, that there was 10 of his comrades died on hunger strike as well. And that was a really, really difficult time within the prisons. But the prisons were, were places, as I said, of brutality. They were places of, you know, where, where people... And, very, you know, some, some people were very, very young when they went to prison. I mean, you're talking 15, 16, 17-year-olds going away for long periods of time, being in, in, in, and, and beaten during interrogations. A lot, a lot of people, you know, forced to sign confessions to, to, to things that they didn't even do. So, you, you know, you had that real brutal system there. But just to go on, I suppose, in terms of uh, where we are now, because I know Vincent wanted me to talk a little, about it, a little bit about that as well. And, you know, we, we did, um, in 1994, we had, um, we, we sort of had the, the IRA ceasefire. And what the ceasefire did um, was the ceasefire created a space, if you like. There had been ongoing peace talks um, taking, taking place. And you've heard of the Hume Adams talks, and our leader, Jerry Adams, um, w w was, was part of those talks, as, as some of our other um, party leaders were. And we then, we, we, we took those talks then um, further and went into negotiations um, with the, the British government. Um, and negotiations with the unionist parties uh, in the north as well. And I suppose that, that those risks were taken um, and initiatives were taken to try and give a space, to try and build a confidence and to try to, to, to sort of way, create a space, if you like, um, for, for to get that peaceful sort of way to try and end partition, if you like, beyond that. 
And where we got to them was we had the international agreement, the, uh, probably the most well-known one was the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. And then we had subsequent agreements in terms of the St Andrews Agreements and other agreements. And that has taken us, I suppose, today, um, for our party, um, you know, uh, we, we have had a great electoral success. But it's just not about electoral success for, ele for, for election's sake. Because just all during the conflict, communities in, in areas that were facing that repression actually became very, very strong, vibrant communities. And I just want to give one example. In, in West Belfast, for instance, because of, of the, the situation during the curfew situation and during those other sort of times when it, when it wasn't safe to, to, to really to, to come out onto the streets or whatever, we, the, they used to take you know, the, the bus services off and they used to, t to leave people without sort of services in terms of food and that. So what the people did on their own, they came together and created cooperatives they created a transport system, which is still there today. I don't know if any of these have been over, but it's the black taxis. And that's where the black taxis come out of. It was, a, it was just necessity for people because people in those days didn't have cars and it was just to get them for, from A to B. So all those initiatives were taken. And one of the, the big initiatives for me that was taken during those days, because it was quite a lot of the men who were interned and quite a lot of the, the women who went, or sorry, the men who went to prison. And therefore, women started organising um, you know, in terms of, you know, in terms of being the ones who who was being uh, a response to the repression, uh, a response to the, the oppression, and it was actually women who broke the Falls Road curfew, where women come out and took on the British Army and says, "No, you will not tell us to go back into our house." We need to feed our families. We need to, to, to, to see what's happening to our neighbours. We need to, to find out you know, what, what's going on. And we, we have a right to walk our streets uh, and do that. So it was women who broke the curfew. It was women who broke many, many other um, sort of, in, in terms of marches, for instance. And in, in, uh, we had the first march ever into Belfast city centre. Nationalists were not allowed, or Republicans were not allowed, that space in, in the city centre. On International Women's Day, women actually took to the streets, and they were the first ones to push through and get, up, get through to the city centre. So I think that, that, that in terms of, of women's and, and, and, and gender equality, you know, for me, it all came from then. And we, what we also had was we had... Uh, women on the loyalist uh, Protestant side, meeting with women on the Republican Catholic side, coming together, and I suppose to you know to, to fight issues that were actually you know uh, that related that were sort of important to them. So you had that unification there uh, long before you even had the where well, the conflict was over. But I suppose that that's basically the story that I want to tell and. You know, and I'll take any questions that people want to ask. We are, as I said, facing into um, 2016 um, and the 100th anniversary of the rising, and particularly the 100th anniversary of the uh, proclamation, um, which is, is very, very important. And really, you know, for, for us as Republicans, that's still where we want to be. We want to end partition. We want to, to have Ireland unified. We believe that it doesn't make economic sense it doesn't make social sense, and it certainly doesn't make political sense to have a country of, of six and a half million where one small part of it is still occupied by, by, by the British state. And in terms of the economy, it's very, very clear also that we have two different, sec or two different tax systems. We have two different uh, sort of uh, health systems. We have two different education systems. We have two diff different currencies. We have two different systems right across policing and justice. And what we're trying to do is join those two systems more together in a working relationship now so that we're trying to look um, at, in terms of creating that all-island economy. But the important thing for us is to end partition um, of our, our country and for to have that proclamation that, that they went out with, cherishing all the children of, of the nation equally, and we want to see that, and uh, that's, that's where we're, we're trying to, to go to now. So thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks. Again, we are... Time is running very fast. I would, keep, go, I would like to go quickly to uh, Gorka uh, Elge Barrieta. Uh, Gorka, um, 
Uh, Gorka is uh, responsible for the international relations for the Bar Basque political party Shortu, which means create, and they are the first political party uh, in the Esquer Esbertalia, uh, the, the patriotic left in Basque country. Gorka, I'm going to ask you something very concrete. Um, you have listened to like three very different narratives that nevertheless seem to, at, at crucial points, overlap in ways, in the ways in which these three different movements conceptualize their struggle. Um, on the one hand, how would you relate it to the struggle of the best people? And on the other hand, um, what would be questions that you know, we can start formulating to, um, to ask ourselves about states and statelessness, the question of the role of democracy in it, and self-defense in relation to this, to this dichotomy between states and statelessness? And then I would like also to open the question to the floor. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a lot, I'm sorry. I, yeah. I share this uh, panel with a Kurdish, a Palestinian, and an Irish uh, comrade in a room where uh, an insurrection took place against Spain. So the first thing I have to say is that uh, I feel at home. <laughs> then, we are a stateless nations. That is a fact. Not for the Irish. But we didn't choose to be stateless. We are grown-up grown up people, and grown-up peoples as well. We long ago left uh, Kingdom Garden. Yeah. And uh, we think and we want to take responsibility for ourselves. And not for the sake of doing it. We believe we can promote, we can create a better world. In the sense of what we are discussing now, I have to say that uh, violence has always been used as an excuse to prevent political agendas from being developed. We were always, always told by the Spanish and French authorities that we have to choose between voting ballots and ballots. And that in what they call, or what is called their democracy, every political goal could be defended peacefully. And we knew that was not true. And the recent developments in the past country have proven us right. The same could be said about Catalonia, for instance, or, or others. Nancy yesterday said that the spying law in the US was a bad law then and a bad law today. And I, I can think that we, we will all agree if I say that proscription and listing of national liberation movements is the same. It was a bad decision then. A decision that gave even greater levels, levels of impunity to states against national liberation movements. But it is a big problem today. A big problem that is creating many difficulties for dialogue spaces to be uh, built up. It can be said that about my country, but also about Colombia, Palestine, Philippines, and many others. Self-defense. I think we should not understand self-defense only as, as a defense mechanism. We were not born here just to resist. We believe a better world can be, can be created. And in that sense, we have to promote all kinds of different initiatives in order to reach a more just and equal society. We are democratic movements, and we truly believe that the best way to develop such processes, to resolve such conflicts, is through dialogue and negotiation, to reach agreements with your enemies or opponents. But what, what do you do when you face a government that doesn't want to talk to you, that doesn't want to agree with you, that is making your life and that of your people miserable every single day? What do you do? Wait. No, I mean, we are fed up of waiting. We have been waiting for too long. And I think that what we are seeing today in, going on in Kurdistan, in Catalonia, in the Ireland, Basque Country and elsewhere, is the result of that. We are, at the same time, promoting very dynamic networks where 
many people from different sectors are participating. But at the same time, we are doing it unilaterally, without waiting for the permission of the states. And I just want to end up by saying that uh, we have always have to bear in mind two equally important dimensions. The first one is the work you develop in your own country. And the second one is the one you develop internationally. I believe international solidarity and cooperation between national liberation movements, stateless nations, and progressive forces is positive for all of us. There is no one-size-fits-all solution to everybody. So if for, for, the, for the Kurdish, a stateless democracy is the right path, good for them. If for us, it is to create an independent state, good for us. But we have many th things in common, and I think that what we should try to reflect on is how we can help each other, because otherwise these kind of forums are empty wars. And we need to try and find ways of cooperating. And there is cooperation. There is a lot of spaces of cooperation. We know each other and help each other for ages. So how can we do it in the future? That will be my last uh, reflection. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gorka. Um, I think we have some time for questions from the audience, of which I presume there are many. With all these people in the room that have never been in the same room together. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I have, I have a question for the uh, representative of the PYD. Uh, and and um, in, in the talk and in the responses, the emphasis uh, on self-defense was on military self-defense and violence. But what I understood from what I've seen in, uh, in Rojava is self-defense also understand in terms of language education, of cinema, of poetry, of drawing, of a, a range of cultural activities. So I, I would like to hear some more about self-defense from the cultural perspective. Spas, bu ipirsi. Naha mel demokul ser parastine ukir. Çiteki xazayi megut ku herkesek parastine zati ti dahe. Jide dikeunda yani. Hamu jisey mi kuna. Thank you very much for the question. We have said during our talk that uh, every creature even has some kind of notion of self-defense, not only human. Or I can say that in Rojava at the moment we have a revolution of protection. First of all, through organizing our people to know themselves and how to protect themselves. This is the first organization, organizing ourselves. And second, in the education system, our people were deprived from having their own education system, education in their own uh, will and to their own language. And now we have established the education system based on the will of the people there. said Ali. Third, when we are establishing organizations to protect our cultural themes and cultural uh, importance, uh, because we can see there are big media or uh, propagandas on us, attacking us, that uh, trying to just uh, deface our culture, and we are having the response for this in a cultural way, and we have organizations to uh, make uh, our cultural uh, identity more visible to us first and to others. 
یا هر اساسی جی لروجابای کردستان ام جیانا خا وکی جواکا می هی ام دخاتن تفگر بکن بره با ببه نه وکی کو سیستم باس یعنی رژیم باس لسر ما فرد کربو کو جیانا که ام جیان بکن وکی گل کرد چه و قدر خا بلید که ام ویتان دید بکن And more important than all of this we try to write our destiny and our uh, need by ourselves rather than what the Al-Ba'ath party and uh, regime Uh, previously was deciding on behalf of us what we want and what we are. At the moment, we are uh, writing our rights by ourselves. Another important point is about the protection of women and protection by women in Rojava. نهال روزابال سر اساسی راستی از جن تفگیر کردن تیچه کردن جن آزاد بی اراده خا قرار خواب ده تبلیجیانه بود. We not only ended the oppression against women for the long history we had this, but now women are organizing themselves and us and and others and whole society actually and women are leading the revolution. So the change in the status of women is very visible and very crucial point of our. Uh, daily life at the moment in Rojava. Jboi veji shiddat tu o irisha ko genocide da hamu ali dal ser matekrin lhamber we sistema shamil top yakuni yani sistema betawawi a parastine a jiana kho jwaka kho hamu ali. So since the attack on us a multi dimension our protection system is multi dimension not only physical not only with the weapons against one particular force is coming at the moment is very multi dimension and we are pursuing all aspects at once system of palestine mara chekriye hishti ko bawari che bebe ko amkan kho parizin amkan kho reva bebin amkan bhavra jiyan bikin aba ba sha aba hivi ki nud nav galanda chekri beri ku dawlat ed nav galanda bawari hivi ki nad mispar through this system we made ourselves first of all sure that we can do something for ourselves and the system we made and we built and we are in a Uh, process of building it more and more it uh, made us to have a different life and we are keeping it and protecting it more thank you I saw a question I know we want to clap all the time but I'm going to move forward um, short I'll, I'll try um, I would like to direct my question to Leila Khaled um, you, you present um, the Palestinian cause as Um, the Israeli occupation versus the Palestinian people, but between them is also a Palestinian uh, government. And this government is seen more and more. Um, it is more and more in a position that it actually has to guarantee the safety of Israel. For instance, in return for funding from uh, customs, taxes, etc. It's seen by a lot of young Palestinians that their own government is playing a uh, policeman for uh, Israel. And a lot of young Palestinians think that the PA should actually uh, step down in order to reveal the occupation in all its appalling uh, clarity. What, what is your opinion on that? The question is, who's, who, who needs the protection? Who needs the protection? The occupiers or the occupants? This is a crucial, it's an important question to say. Uh, and then uh, the Palestinian government is bound by uh, Oslo Accords where there is a, a coordination and Uh, for uh, security reasons. And uh, the Palestinian government, between parentheses, because it has no authority. This government is, uh, has a mission to protect the occupants by pointing at the activists <coughs> and giving them information about the activists. Uh, when there is occupation, the people need the protection. 
all the time we were asking the United Nations that we need uh, an international protection for the Palestinians because Israel all the time is attacking. Look what happened in Gaza for three wars now, and it's destroyed. In addition, it's besieged, and Israel refuses any uh, uh, attempts to break the siege or to end the siege for 1,800,000 people. This is an open prison for uh, the Palestinians. The same thing goes for the settlements. Israel confiscates land, uh, the Palestinian land, all the time, and building settlements and bringing settlers to live there. And the settlers are playing another role, besides that it is a civilian, uh, called civilian uh, uh, settlers. They are militias also, and they attack our people. So the, uh, even the uh, uh, negotiations for 22 years mm -hmm. We, we lost more than half the land of Palestine because of the widening of the settlements and building new settlements. Every day there are building uh, of settlements on our land. This is beside the change that uh, Israel do in, in uh, uh, Jerusalem. It's changing the, the uh, uh, development of this city and it, as you know, this is a sacred city for Muslims and uh, uh, Christians and Jews at the same time. <coughs> but Israel doesn't abide by any uh, law. So they are Judea, uh, making it as a Jewish uh, uh, city and expelling uh, the uh, uh, people who are living in Jerusalem and having a new law that the Palestinians in Jerusalem uh, have uh, a residency as foreigners for 10 years. After 10 years, they have to leave. This is a law I mean, uh, drawn by the Knesset. Uh, so what is in, I, I said it, what is in the hands of people who uh, face such policy? And uh, our comrade uh, uh, spoke that it's no more, we don't have patience to wait. We are defending our humanity. So if we have any means, and it, uh, the means of resistance is uh, uh, guaranteed by the United Nations Charter. It's item eight in the Charter saying people under oppression have the right to resist by all means, including armed struggle. Is the, uh, is the stone an armed struggle? The Knesset drew a, ru a, a rule that who, uh, uh, a child throwing a stone could be uh, uh, put in prison between three to 20 years. Uh, I, uh, you know, they are making rules that show every day their racism nature, this government, the government of the settlers and the Likud, this right wing. Anyhow, <coughs> I, I uh, thank you for the question, but uh, uh, always people uh, who are, they don't have the arms to face this uh, arsenal, the Israeli arsenal, which is support, supported totally by the United States with all means of mass destruction uh, weapons. And uh, while for the Palestinians, all the time, they are th threatening us. The United States, I mean. That's why we call people all over the world for campaigns for BDS, because Israel up till now hasn't been uh, uh, punished for the massacres, for uh, uh, all what uh, it's doing in, in, uh, in Palestine. And I think, in addition, this is, uh, yani, uh, beyond the question. Militarism destroys those, the, the societies that the government do, uh, does for its people. I'm sure that it will reach 
after uh, it reached uh, its uh, being apartheid, it will affect the, the Israelis in Israel itself, and it will destroy it by the end of the day. We have the lesson of the Nazis. The Nazis, uh, the German nation, uh, followed the, uh, uh, what Hitler said. But what happened? The nation was destroyed. Europe was destroyed. Are we waiting for a third world war launched by the Zionists? Let's think about it. Thank you. Thank you. I'll stand here so I can put down my papers. Um, unfortunately, we have to round off the session because, again, we're terribly over time and, and there's another fantastic session tonight that I will announce in just a few seconds. Um, I think that, that within this panel that, that deals with the question of self-defense um, against the background of the question state or stateless, um, there are a few themes that came up in several presentations and I would like to pick them out shortly. So on the one hand, I've heard several times the description of self-defense as something natural. It's something not only that um, seems logical under, under, under uh, conditions of occupation, but is in fact, and this is something I thank you for pointing it out, is enshrined in an international charter that, that is valid all over the world. So this is again something that we constantly need to emphasize that it is not only natural, but it's also legitimate. Right? The, the second, uh, I think, very important point is to um, deal with the question of occupation as, as highest form of terrorism, the occupation of land, the occupation of places where people build their lives, whether that is through the forced expulsion of people, whether that is through the, the deliberate um, pollution of living areas of people, which of course happens in many other places around the world, as, as a form, as a key form of terrorism. Um, I would like to also to pick out the, um, the idea that democracy in a state begins with democracy in the house, which leads automatically to um, forms of gender equality. I think this is again a theme that came up in, in every single presentation and that is, that is something that should be, be emphasized. Social justice is what follows from democracy in the house. Um, I also sensed in several of the presentations um, a certain type of, not actually in all of them, an impatience that the question of whether we should have a state or not is preventing us from actually addressing the material conditions of people in which they live. And so what, what I feel, what, what came out of this, at least for me, um, is that maybe it's not so useful to speak about statelessness as a state, but statelessness as a certain type of practice, that we should talk about stateless practices, practices that change the state's taxes, uh, uh, Practices that undermine the state, as, as Gorka has pointed out, and practices that just ignore it and just shift directly to an international level and build coalitions that have nothing to do with borders or states whatsoever. And I think this is a very important thing that we can, that we can gather from this, from this discussion here today, for which, again, I would like to thank all the participants and the audience for your patience. It's incredibly hot here. I'm sweating. Um, but it's, it's, <laughs> that, is, that is a sign of the, the energy I think that what there was in this room, and I'm, I, I would like to thank you again for that um, to our speakers that were all here today. Um, now, um, in fact, it's wonderful because we can segue right into the next section, in, into the next session, of which will deal with transnational cooperation. So I invite you all to stay after the break of 30 minutes and after the third session, you are all invited for dinner, which is free, I was asked to emphasize, and so we can all share a wonderful meal cooked by Shim Hendricks, and uh, we can ventilate the room maybe also, right? Thank you. I see you in half an hour, which is 8.45. 18.45, fine.
What happened to my authority? Thank you for all of you for coming back on time. I would like to welcome you back again and I would like to introduce uh, somebody who's been a great inspiration for uh, my work who's, who is going to facilitate our block three and it's Radha de Souza. A uh, remarkable thinker, academic, Indian lawyer, uh, social justice campaigner, writer, critic, and commentator. Um, Radha Souza has worked with many different social justice movements in India, New Zealand, Zealand the Asia Pacific region, the United King Kingdom, and uh, internationally. She's currently teaching uh, law. She teaches law at the Westminster Law School. Uh, at the University of Westminster in London. And before joining the Academy, she, partic uh, she practiced um, as a lawyer in Mumbai, uh, specializing in cost constitutional and human rights uh, law. Um, there's a book that's forthcoming. I cannot wait to read uh, through it titled What's Wrong with Right, Social Movements, Law, and uh, Liberal Imaginations. It's forthcoming um, very soon this year. Thank you, Rada, for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction, Maria, and thank you all for being here after such a long day. It's a great pleasure to be here. And Jonas, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to be par participate in this extraordinary gathering with so much energy, so much life, and so much hope and expectations. Right? And I hope we will continue these conversations in the future in different forums. Okay, I have the uh, job, if you like, given to me by Jonas, of uh, chairing the last session, which is Stateless Democracy as Transnational Revolution. Now, the international aspect of our work is, I think, sometimes the most neglected. And so it's a very important issue, and I hope we will be able to draw out some of the themes that have come, uh, that the international dimensions of the things that we have been talking about. Um, last week, I received a email from a students' union in Mumbai who had organized on their own initiative a event, a uh, university event by the Students' Union on the Kurdish question. 
And I wrote back to them and I said, can you tell me what you know about Kurdistan, what you know about the issues? And I have no idea what they really talked about because obviously I was not there. But clearly, there is something about the Kurdish movement that has inspired people many other places. And I know that when Kobani was attacked and that was going on, so many students in India were inspired by it. And I asked them, what is it about Kobani that attracted you when there are so many other things going on in the world? And it was very clear to me why. Because as you know, many of you, India is home to the second largest Muslim population in the world, even now, even after the partition. And the Muslims in India are now being attacked by a Hindu fascist state. And people are looking for answers. They're looking everywhere to see what is it that they can literally latch on to. And the Kurdish movement provided the answer. You can be a Muslim nation, but a progressive nation who talks about women, who talks about e equality, who talks about self-defense, and you can still be a Muslim. So you don't have to choose between, you know, being a, either you're a Muslim nation or you have to pay, be obedient to the Indian state. So I think these kind of spontaneous things tell us something about the need, the craving, the absolute demand that is out there for some sort of an international dimension to what is happening in different struggles. So with that, I want to just go from what happened last week to what happened 100 years ago. Yeah? We heard from Jennifer about the Irish question and what was happening in Ireland. If some of you may know or some of you may not know, Ireland and India have the same colors on their flag. The Irish flag is uh, vertical and the Indian flag is horizontal, but it's the same colors. How come we have the same colors on our flag? Yeah? Because 100 years ago, our movements collaborated on what it started off as what is called the Home Rule Movement, where India and Ireland were part of a movement against the British Empire. So the question for me is, and in 1916, I may add, because Jennifer mentioned 1916, you know, the Irish movements collected money to support our political prisoners in prison. And there is an Irish regiment that was employed in India called the Connaught Regiment. And they refused to fire on the Indian people in their national struggle. And that is called the Connaught Rebellion, which is a very important rebellion in our thing. So we have this long history of internationalism. And I wonder sometimes why, where that, that kind of thing has gone and why it is that today we find it so difficult and it's become such a neglected subject. And I think I would like to suggest an answer to that. And that is because under the British Empire, we knew who our common enemy was. We knew that it was the British Empire that was our common enemy. And so we came together and we decided how to fight together. But suddenly, the enemy is something airy-fairy. There is, we can't see it, we can't hear it, we can't look at it. And that has become an important question in solidarity. But I won't go into more into that. We heard also about, from Lila, about Palestine. Yeah? And we, all of us, I'm sure, have been supporters of the Palestinian struggle for a very long time. I remember as a, when we were school children, and Yasser Arafat came to India, and we were all there, school children, waving Indian and Palestinian flags. I mean, that's how long it goes back. And I was in school a very long time ago, I can tell you that. <laughs> so, but at the very moment, yeah, at the very moment, when the United Nations Charter was being written, yeah, and clauses about self-determination of nations, clauses about equality, sovereign equality of states. When that was, that was being written, at that same time, Palestine was being colonized and occupied. So why 
is it that we don't make the connection between this UN Charter, which writes this self-determination clauses, which puts in the sovereign equality of states, and while it is doing that, at the same time, it occupies another country. Yeah? So, internationalism. I want to come to, again, Saleh Muslims' thing about self-defense, a very, very important question, because self-defense is not only about defending ourselves today, but self-defense is the only way we can secure the conditions for life in the future. Yeah? Because today when we live and we are able to survive, our children, our grandchildren, the future, everything. So we are not only protecting ourselves, we are protecting the conditions for the future. However, what we are seeing now is, I mean, I, and I agree totally that self-defense has to begin with us inside. Yeah? So because if our communities are not strong, if we are not strong, we can't resist anything. So it has to begin with education, with you know, all of those things that Saleh talked about. But again, the kind of forces that we are having to confront, yeah? you look at Palestine, they are using white phosphorus on people there. You look at Iraq, in Fallujah, yeah, the doctors have given, which was one of the big sites of struggle, the doctors have given medical advice to the women there not to have children because the depleted uranium that was used there is producing so many you know, um, uh, abnormal births that the medical advisory by doctors is to ask women not to have children. Where is the self-defense? Where is the future? Yeah? And so, and in the war in Afghanistan, which has nothing to do, you know, yeah, we are neighbors with Afghanistan, but the source of the river Indus is in Kabul, near Kabul. And because they are using depleted uranium there, it pollutes the river, it comes down to India, to Kashmir, it goes down to Pakistan, and our women are being producing, you know, um, uh, having deformed child, children because of some of those things. So self-defense now has become a very complicated business. And one of the things that I wonder, our European friends, many of us here ask, what should we do? And we have this idea that doing something means for us to do something out there. The point is, you live in the belly of the beast, so to speak. And NATO is here. The depleted uranium is here. Yeah? The white phosphorus is here. And what are we doing about this? So the reason I'm saying this is that our concept of internationalism has to become much wider than saying, oh, I support this country, I, you support that country, somebody else supports that country. Because it is a systemic thing. It is an empire system. And therefore, I think this is a very, very important subject, and I hope we will be able to touch on some of these things and carry on these conversations beyond today's session. Having said that, let me just throw up some very big questions. Let me just come down to our panel today. We have uh, Dilar Dirlik who will start off with the, uh, uh, well, who will speak, open up the question of transnational solidarity and international movements. Mm -hmm. Dilar is an activist of the Kurdish women's movement. She is also a PhD candidate in sociology in the department of, uh, uh, in, in University of Cambridge. And her work examines the role of women's liberation in articulating and building freedom in Kurdistan. The Kurdish women's movement, as we all know and we have learnt in the past two days, has been prominent from the very early days of the Kurdish resistance. And rejecting the state as a patriarchal, imperialist and uh, capitalist construct, the women's movement and their development of this idea of genealogy, which is very interesting, a woman-centered science paradigm formed a key factor in developing the philosophy and practice of stateless democracy in Rojava. 
and she write, regularly writes on Kurdish freedom movement for international audiences, and I have had the privilege of sharing platforms with Dirlik for, I think, three years now. So I'm very privileged again to invite Dirlik to come and say a few words to us. After that, I will be asking Miraya Wahi and Kim Arufat to comment on that, and then we will go on to Angela Dimitrakaki, who will also comment on that. So that's lovely, the structure. And uh, I look forward to hearing what you have to say there, like. Thank you very much for this very nice uh, introduction and uh, raising some very important questions, uh, Radam. And I would like to thank the team of the New World Summit, of course, for providing us with this uh, platform, and I thank all of the participants for coming here. And I hope we can really come up with some practical steps after this uh, summit to strengthen uh, what we will talk about now in a minute, um, transnational revolution. Because we have always said in the Kurdish freedom movement that we can never achieve freedom in isolation. We can never be free if our brothers and sisters and other communities are not free. We can never be free if women are not free, because that is our red line. So in that sense, I would like to um, talk about a couple of these issues. But before I do that, um, some people like Jos Jongeden have already mentioned that right now, as we speak, uh, there is an all-out war going on in uh, Bakur, North Kurdistan, Turkish-occupied Kurdistan. And uh, several people are trapped in a basement and seven of them have already been killed. In uh, places such as Jizre, Silopi, Nusaybin, and, and other places in North Kurdistan, the Turkish army is besieging the population. It is killing indiscriminately the civilians that dare to go outside because of these so-called... Um, you know, curfews, even though the translation would not be correct. And we can see that exactly what Daesh, the so-called Islamic State, did uh, one and a half years ago in Kobani, the siege of a city, the, an all-out attack on a city, but also the resistance. We can see the same thing being repeated at the moment. We can see that the Turkish army is doing the exact same thing that Daesh did in Kobani but is doing that now against the Kurdish population in Bakur. But nobody cares because this is the second largest NATO army. Because nobody cares because Turkey will keep the refugees out of um, Europe. Because Europe actually encourages the policy of the same state that causes all these refugees to flee due to its policy of active military, financial, logistical support for the so-called Islamic State. And at the same time, the same time that we speak now, the so-called Geneva Three Conference is either halfway taking place, is supposed to take place, whatever. They were supposed to take place this week. Uh, today also marks the second year anniversary of the announcement of Afrin Canton, one of the three cantons uh, in, of Rojava, Kobani, Afrin, and Gizre. Actually, exactly two years ago, in January 2014, uh, the Geneva II conference, which is basically the forerunner um, of this year's conference, Geneva III, was supposed to find a solution to the war in Syria by the same powers who have caused the problems in Syria. And, uh, of course, it failed because it was planned. It was supposed to fail. At that time, the same people who had started to form their democratic self-governance structures uh, together with all the communities who live there and with women as pioneers of a new society were excluded from the Geneva II talks. And the same week, uh, the people of Rojava announced their three autonomous cantons. Last year, in January 2015, on the same week of January, on the anniversary of the announcement of the three cantons, Kobane became the city that defeated ISIS. On the same day that the Kobani Canton was announced, the women and men, different people from around the world even joined them to liberate Kobani. And Kobani wrote itself down in history. It was not written down by the rulers, but the people in Kobani, the democratic forces of the world, wrote down history 
uh, as Kobani became to be known as the city that defeated ISIS. And at the moment, again one year later, the same week in January, we see the Geneva Three Conference on the agenda, and of course it is supposed to fail. And actually, we need to understand when we talk about these things um, that this is a message. The fact that the Kurds and with them all of the other communities that have worked together to form this self-governance, this alternative in the Middle East, the fact that they are not invited to Geneva Three, but that reactionary forces, fascists, killers, rapists are invited is a message. This is being done consciously. This is an ideological attack. And this isn't just an attack for the Kurdish people, this should be understood as an attack on all people who believe in freedom and democracy. And I'm not saying this in the classical sense, but in real freedom around the world. This is a message to the peoples who struggle around the world to say, no, actually we will not allow another world to be possible. The status quo does not want peace in Syria. We all need to understand that. And if we analyze this situation, the exclusion of um, the most democratic forces, the only people who really meaningfully have an alternative to Daesh, that they're being excluded, this is done on purpose. So we shouldn't have any illusions about the fact that this is some kind of big power game. No, this is something very conscious. I want to talk about ideological attacks in general, because I think the status quo system of the world is establishing itself through many different ideological attacks, especially on two instances. Ideological attacks on community, on the society, and secondly, maybe more crucially, on women. I will elaborate on that. As I've said, the resistance in Rojava has become a perspective for the world. And the status quo is, um, is establishing itself uh, through different forms of um, regimes, like thought regimes, uh, truth regimes, uh, with its own media, its uh, security apparatuses, its own history writing to legitimize and justify the omnipresence of the state. It violates, it brutalizes, it enslaves, it imprisons people, society, to legitimize itself. And we have seen several talks on that regarding the definition of terrorism, um, prison systems, surveillance, um, the silencing of dissent, criminalization, and so on. We've heard examples about that already. Dominant history writing, which denies the history of the marginalized, of the excluded, the poor, women, the indigenous people, is also a conscious tool, an ideological tool, to suffocate society and to especially legitimize the idea, the ideological nation state. So we can say, in fact, it, is, it has created a mentality, an enslaved mentality, which kind of makes us believe that the state is fate, that the status quo in which we live in is fate, that this is just the normal progress of history, that the suffering that we endure right now, the fact that so many people can drown in the Med Mediterranean, is just some kind of part of the system. This, the system has done through ideological attacks, through establishing itself first in our mentalities. When we look at economy, um, we can see that ev absolutely everything has been stolen from us. What is left for us? We can say definitely, uh, in the name of uh, industry, in the name of progress, in the name of modernity, the environment has been completely destroyed, indigenous communities have been annihilated, history has been rewritten, and we have nothing left. We're poorer than we have ever been. Everything has been taken away from, the, from us in the name of wealth and profit and so on. The nation state is an special ideological tool. It has the monopoly on uh, society and it's, it justifies several forms of oppression and it's a synthesis of capitalism, the state and patriarchy. It's interesting to see that all parts of the state uh, its economy, its um, claims for security, its social services, they have all mobilized themselves against society. They have done all they can in their power to mobilize and organize themselves against the community. Secondly, these ideological attacks especially target women. And we need to problematize the idea, the concept, the reality of patriarchy um, very well in order to understand the problems that we face as humans uh, today. 
We can definitely see and say that without any question, I believe, that history has simply been stolen from women. Women are not present in history. This is a conscious attack to enslave half of humanity in order to justify further forms of oppression, which in some ways or others are in fact extensions or multiple different forms of the same form of oppression. Patriarchy is ultimately based on subjugation, hierarchy, hegemony, enslavement, the abuse of power. So in many ways, the struggle of women and their oppression has universal characteristics. And if we look at the situation of women uh, through that lens, I think we can organize our ways of uh, struggle even more. We already have a transnational revolution, a potentially transnational revolution, which would be the revolution of women. And we can also, of course, um, it was again Jos Jongaden who mentioned uh, Ekin Van, um, a guerrilla fighter who has been um, killed and then stripped naked and then displayed on the streets by the Turkish army. And what does this mean? This is a message to struggling women. This is an attack on women who struggle, who dare to pose a threat to the dominant system. Displaying her naked, making her vulnerable, but she's a struggling woman. She will not be dishonored by being naked. Other women have been killed over the last six months on the, by the attacks of the Turkish army, such as Berivan Şengal, a young Yazidi woman who after the genocide and feminicide of Daesh on the Yazidi community, one of the most ancient communities in the world that still exist. After they have been killed, raped, enslaved, and sold as sex slaves, women like Berivan Şengal have joined freedom movements. She has joined the guerrilla in the mountains, and she was also killed by the bombardment of the Turkish state. So, of course, yes, these are very terrible things. And uh, when we talk about transnational revolution, we need to be more uh, enthusiastic, perhaps. But we, first of all, have to understand the urgency of the system that, in which we live in and all of our responsibilities. Um, we have seen, of course, over the last year, and especially a year and a half ago, it began with the fight of the so-called Daesh against Kurdish women in Kobani, which became a new perspective, a source of hope for struggling people around the world. Um, of course, uh, Dr. Rata Zouza, she mentioned already how students in India are now organizing their panels on the Kurdish movement. We can say this had very universal traits because it became a perspective for anti-system movements around the world. Because it seemed almost too... too um, like these two extremes were just so obvious, but people, of course, in many ways, misunderstood what was actually going on there. This wasn't a clash of civilizations between East and West or whatever, between religion and secularism or whatever. In fact, this, uh, this is a clash between two civilizations, but not the way the dominant system wants us to be. I will elaborate on that. The fact that on one side you have this system of darkness, of destruction, that was just aiming to kill and rape and just destroy women systematically, to draw all the colors of the Middle East, which is a beautiful mosaic in black, just like its dark flag. You know, it's uh, the fact that it has the same thought schemes like the nation state system, one nation, one religion, one flag, just one, one, one, one man on top and everyone else has to obey. And on the other hand, you had smiling women whose history has never been written as Kurds and as women, and especially as Kurdish women, that they were the ones who had the ideological as well as the, the, the emotional tools to defeat an enemy like that was not a coincidence. And we need to realize what was going on there, in fact. Just like it was not a coincidence that it was Kurdish women who had the heart and the power, not in the sense of the way the dominant system describes power, had the power and ability to defeat such an enemy, uh, we will actually see that this isn't a coincidence if we look at the geography. Mesopotamia is a place where actually the first state-like institution began with the ancient Sumer. This is the same place where the first ideas, the concepts of private property 
uh, developed. This is also the same place where patriarchy began to institutionalize itself. This is the place where we see in ancient mythology women fall, women clash with male gods, female goddesses being uh, destroyed. We can see this. There's enough archaeological evidence uh, to suggest that. But this is, you know, this is the same place where the, basically the forerunners of the modern nation states, capitalism and patriarchy began. This is also the same place where the first word for the concept of freedom developed, amargi, which means freedom. And coincidentally, but I don't think it's a coincidence, it also means the return to the mother. So the same place where all these forms of oppression began is also the same place where the first idea of freedom is believed to have emerged. So in that sense, if we look at that, we can see there is actually a civilizational battle going on, but it's not the classical kind of dominant history writing kind of civilization clash, um, described most prominently by Samuel Huntington, but it is a clash between the statist civilization, the hegemonic mainstream dominant civilization, and the civilization of the oppressed. The Kurdish freedom movement and uh, most prominently uh, the ideological leader, representative uh, Abdullah Öcalan usually speaks of two civilizations. One is the mainstream civilization and one is the democratic civilization. So on one hand you always, throughout 5,000 years of history, you had these empires, kingdoms, now you have nation states, so you have even transnational uh, agreements, institutions and so on, who always built their system of oppression and um, in a very conscious way. But on the other hand, you always had resistance. You always had democratic uh, struggles, or maybe we don't want to use the word democratic, we can use something else, resistance struggles of the oppressed, of the ex excluded, of the marginalized, of the indigenous, and of women. So in that sense, if we understand the, what's going on in th these terms, I think we will understand also ways of mobilizing against it. Um, we can see that it is not a coincidence, for example, that in, in the lands of uh, Chiapas, the Zapatistas have become an inspiration for struggling people around the world with their new articulations of what autonomy, emancipation and freedom means. It's not a coincidence that the struggle of the Palestinian people has become uh, a, an issue of uh, honor and dignity for struggling people around the world. It's not a coincidence that now the most marginalized, the most brutalized, violated, killed and imprisoned people in places like the United States now chant Black Lives Matter and have become the pioneering force of democracy in the United States. These are not coincidences that struggles, that new perspectives, new paradigms, all come from the places of the voices of the most marginalized, of the most excluded. And this is what we mean when we say there is a democratic civilization going on. And, going on. and if we understand ourselves within this stream, I think we will have a much more confident way of mobilizing against the status quo system. So what all these things have in common is a is basically, we can say, humanity's desire to express itself as freedom. It's based on collective memories of contexts of communities where there is still a collective memory of the fact that things were not like this before. Those who have been excluded by the status system still have uh, certain social characteristics that they still carry with them and they have maintained them through maybe millennia of self-defense, and we've already defined self-defense as something beyond just me merely physical self-defense, they have still retrained, retained those um, elements. And they are now those who are mobilizing this. So of course against the nation-state system, which has just arbitrarily drawn borders like rulers, we've actually spoken about 100-year anniversaries. This year also marks the 100-year anniversary of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which is basically when the French and the British took a ruler like this and just drew a line and said, this is now Iraq and this is uh, Syria. <laughs> just very easy like that. And we can see uh, the consequences of that still happening today. And the same states refuse to take refugees uh, from those places. So uh, we can see how capitalism has brutalized the entire world, 
how it has stolen everything from us, how it has just completely destroyed the environment. And we can see how patriarchy may be most recently manifested in the genocide and feminicide committed by forces like Daesh has once again just gone beyond its own limits. So I was in uh, Shengal, or you know, the official name is Sinjar, the homeland of the Yazidi people who have suffered the most uh, brutal forms of genocide in the recent past. I've said that before, where women were just killed, raped, and enslaved. And for me, it was just the most historic moment ever to see um, that the answer of these women was they were actually building their own women's council of Yazidi women. They were saying the only way to survive now is to organize. The only way to survive in a meaningful way is to mobilize, organize ourselves. So I want to slowly conclude because I don't have much time. I think we need to see statelessness for those of us who are classified as stateless nations. This is actually a chance. We, are a chance, we have a chance, we are in an advantageous position because we were always excluded from this really messed up, dirty system. And this can be a platform of resistance for us. Um, the only way to survive in a meaningful way to define our existence beyond mere physical existence is self-defense. We have no other choice. We have said, we have heard uh, Zuhat Kobani already talk about how we need to ideologically mobilize. So, a couple of proposals perhaps before I can conclude. Ideologically, we need to come up with new science paradigms. We need to read history anew in order to uh, analyze what has gone wrong. It, the history has been written by the rulers. We cannot understand our resistance by going by the same history. We need to have alternative academies. And these need to be in confederal structures because local knowledge is everywhere. We need to recover that. We need to benefit from thousands of years old knowledge. Against the democratic, uh, against the nation state, we need to strengthen the idea of the nations, uh, of the democratic nation. Against the nation state, democratic nation, in which all people will be part of a nation based on principles rather than ethnicity or religion. Against capitalism, we need ecology. Against the system of security and surveillance and uh, prisons, we need to have a new system based on trust, on empathy, on ethical values again. Of course, these are very difficult things to mobilize, but we can see examples like that across the world, and maybe most recently in Rojava. And of course, women's liberation must be our red line. Whenever I see a woman, if I call myself a freedom fighter, I must see a strategic ally in that woman's eyes. Without women's liberation, forget any talk about change or revolution for that matter. Against the statist ideas of foreign policy and so on, we need people's diplomacy. We, the struggling people, we need to be in touch with each other rather than competing about who's more oppressed. We need to build common grounds on how we can struggle. If I see a refugee dying and stranding somewhere, and if my first question is, was that Kurdish or Arab? I'm already wrong. I cannot talk about democracy or freedom or anything like that. All of these things will require sacrifice, solidarity, and we need education. And education not in this narrow sense of I'm going to read something and then I lecture or whatever. We need to educate a politically conscious society. Our friends have already mentioned the idea of ethical political society where we understand why we face the issues that we face and how we can liberate our mentalities. So in that sense, we must really question why the status quo, why the whole system has mobilized itself so efficiently, and we, as those who really have something at stake here, our lives, our place in history, are so def defenseless, are so vulnerable, because we do not cooperate with each other. Our self-defense will be our empathy, our love, the conscience, the ethics, the morality that we still have, but that the system ha has not. This can be our strongest weapon. So in that sense, let's build our democratic confederalist structures globally. Let's build our autonomies, local, autonomies locally. 
give each other perspectives, but also make these global confederations. And of course, women's autonomous structures everywhere in the world, they need to be our red lines. I think this is, especially this question, is where the Kurdish freedom movement can be of perspective for struggles around the world. That without this, none of, without the social revolution initiated decades ago in Kurdistan, you wouldn't see Kurdish women fighting against Daesh today, because this is not, this is not the real issue at hand. It's about ideological self-defense. So just my last words, nobody is here to do it for us. We will have to do it ourselves. And we have to see that women will be the pioneers of our new system. We have to build our alternatives. We have to build a new paradigm, a new structure, a new system, together with all struggling peoples, because this is the clash a war of civilizations, but not between different communities, but between different mentalities. And so I would like to just end by saluting all struggling peoples around the world, saluting people who struggle wherever they are, but especially right now in Jizre, where the people really need our, not they don't need our attention, they really need our resistance, they need our revolution, they need our power, because the system is not afraid to kill them. The system is really not afraid to kill them an EU member, NATO partner, whatever. We see the fight of Kobani as a universal struggle. It's not a Kurdish struggle. It was a struggle of humanity. And that's why I really want to salute, especially the struggling women around the world, and want to end with this, something that I've heard a lot in Bakur, where people say, and this, if we look at it from a universal internationalist perspective and see Daesh and also the Kurdish freedom movement are not just two unique cases, but they actually have universal traits, we can say the more Daesh or ISIS, the more Daesh they become, the more Kobani we'll get. And if this can be our international struggle, I think we can get very far. And I wish you all the best of success, but without cooperation, we cannot function. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dilar, for that very wonderful, inspiring talk that comes from the heart and from the people who are actually struggling. So thank you very much for that. And I think that you made an extremely important, uh, if you like, con um, contribution to or, or, or um, formulation of women's movement, because what you have done is to expand women's movement as not something only about women, but about the entire society. And what was also very radical and revolutionary, if you like, about your thing, about your conceptualization of women's movement, is your, the idea that the women patriarchy and the patriarchal state actually go a very long way back before capitalism before, and related to the entire structure of private property and state and oppression of women which have always historically gone hand in hand. So when we talk about women's liberation, we are not only talking about liberation of women from men but also a movement that crosses all those boundaries, and actually the basis of a new society. So that's very radical conceptualization of from what traditional feminists have done. And so thank you very much for that. And I love the idea of people's diplomacy. So I will now go on to try and be a diplomat, which I have never been in my entire life. And it's not me at all to be a diplomat anywhere. But now I'm going to call upon Miraya Wehi and Kim Arufat. Uh, Miraya is a member of the Catalonian Parliament, so we are opening up this transnationalism to 
another part of the world and another kind of struggle. And uh, it is also a candidate for the Popular Unity Candidacy, or the CUP, since the elections in 2016, January. And Kim was a member of parliament for the same party from 2012 and to, to 2015. Uh, and the CUP is made up of local assemblies. They have tried to have this a concept of autonomy and autonomous states and so on. So it's going to be very interesting to hear from you, Kim and uh, Maria, on, uh, on, on your experiences. And I would invite you to comment a little bit about your organization, its history, and what it has done. And very briefly, just so that we know, you know who you are and what you are and what work you do. And also, you have, Kim, I believe you have visited Rojava. So if you can draw from that what you have seen there and your own work in Catalonia about this and, and have some sort of comments on that. And lastly, if you can comment a little bit on the stateless democracy paradigm that we have been talking about since yesterday and what that means to you, and where you see the international connections, solidarities, transnational movements, do you see these things developing? So if you can very briefly, I'm asking you to do a lot of things in 10 minutes, <laughs> but if you can please keep to 10 minutes, I'll be really grateful. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us to this Congress. First of all, tell you that my English is not so good, so I'm going to read. And after Dila, it's going to be difficult to make it good. We are feminist, socialist, and independent organization that want to get democratic sovereignty for the Catalan people to decide about, about all aspects of our life. We defend radical democracy and the common property of main strategic economic resource. We base our political in the popular movement as the only way to activate social changes. Because of that, our strategy is based on the popular municipalism. In the last three years, we have got 400 city councils and 10 MPs, feminist, socialist, and independentist. In this period of time, two social events have turned sovereignty into a basic need for Catalan society. By one hand, the economic and social crisis. By the other hand, the demonstrations for the right to decide. We share with a lot of other peoples around the world and the Europe the idea that the big nations state and the economic institutions decide for us, without elections, without democracy, without sovereignty. Nowadays, the, mo the model of European Union is current built as a model of citizenship that excludes many people that don't have papers, people used as a cheap workforce without rights, as a model of productivity that condemn women to precary works and to carry on reproductive work. Patriarchy has already killed 11 women in Spain only this year. As a model of life that excludes many people and condemns them to live in a world of misery. For us, the struggle for the right to decide of the Catalan people is the struggle for the right to decide of all the peoples of the world. Well, as the, as the introduction said, we've been to Bakur, we've been, we've been to Rojava, We've uh, read and we've, um, the books about democratic confederalism, about the history of Kurds. Uh, we've cried with the Battle of Kobane. We've cried with all with the curfews on, in Gizre. We are um, following all, um, all all the days what is happening in Kurdistan. Not only because it is a tragedy, not only because of the big resistance of the Kurdish women and men, but also because uh, from the from the deepest darkness uh, of the world from that region where all darkness uh, come together, um, the, the, the most brilliant uh, light is opening. 
uh, new doors and new opportunities. Uh, and it's, pro it's, it's telling us about uh, new words, values, and ideologies that we want uh, to share and that we consider that we, without knowing before the courts, we were sharing in our uh, origin. But now we want to go uh, further. Um, we share, we think we share, and we are practicing in our country um, feminism um, as, a, as the key of uh, many changes in society, um, communalism, what we call people's municipalism, self-determination of peoples and uh, the love of, to diversity and the self-organization of, of these the, the diverse peoples, language and ethnic, uh, ethnic collectives in, in our societies, self-defense as a tool, as a political tool, radical democracy as a way to decide inside the party, uh, inside the society, in the local scene, in the, uh, in the national scene, ecology as the only way to preserve uh, our land and the values associated to our uh, culture, um, cooperatives as the way we wanted, we would like co uh, economy to work at the local and national level and self-organization of peoples as the only way that we can uh, fight back um, against uh, highest institutions and, and empires. These are all values we are trying to translate every day, um, well, to, to practice every day in, in our country, in our project, in our political project, and then we see in the mirror of the, of the Kurdish uh, struggle. We aim, as a summary of all of that, we um, want actually to decide as individuals, as, cult as, as, as a collective, as a community, as a society, to decide on our future. And this is something that is not allowed to peoples in Europe, to take the future in, the, in their hands, to decide over banks, over national states, over powerful people, to to get back democracy in its uh, deepest uh, sense. It is something that is not allowed in, uh, in the current European Union, in current uh, Europe. I'm serious. We have sacrificed the, if there were, at the beginning of the European, in the foundation values of the European Union, or the foundation values of European progressive and democratic uh, societies, we have uh, sacrificed these progressive and democratic values, procedures, and laws in exchange of some economic success. We've said if, we, if our development, development creates jobs and gives us some money and McDonald's and whatever, um, we can't forget uh, how we take our decisions, who, is, who takes decisions, who is organizing society, uh, who takes advantage of our misery, of our um, low jobs. They, we, have forget all, we have forgotten all these uh, principles. So we are more or less um, well in a society that excludes, that is based on exclusion of many different collectives, of migrants, of women, of minorities, of peoples, of cultures, of workers. You, the European Union we have nowadays is, our Europe, uh, is a European Union surrounded by walls, by wars, by fences, and by a big, big, big cemetery we live in called Mediterranean Sea. The European Union we have allowed to exist, and we do agree that exists, is a European Union based on uh, in inequality and uh, capitalist values that are bringing back fascism and racism in, to power in many different states. We talked yesterday about Poland, about Hungary, but in many other states that there are second force, third force, and when they are not in power, they have brought already their ideas with a very uh, big strength into societies and they are developing these ideas. We uh, live in a, in a Europe, in a European Union, who, in which we agree that many other concepts, cultural uh, concepts and minorities are excluded. Does somebody care that Catalan is not allowed in, in European institutions? It's not, it is not important. European Union produces money. So it is not a value that we respect that 10 million people speak Catalan and they, don't, they do not live in, Af in Africa or in Asia. They live in Europe, but it's not allowed to speak Catalan in European institutions. It is not a European language. It's, I don't know, a Martian uh, language or Basque. Or does somebody care that gypsies have no democratic representation in European institutions? And they are European people. 
A European minority, they don't, have, they don't have a state. They don't have a territory. They cannot claim for it. For it. Does somebody care that Basques have no international representation? They cannot go to any international forum because they do belong to France and Spain. So they have to be Spanish or French, but not have their own, uh, their, their own place uh, in the world. But they exist. It's not something that uh, literary or whatever. They exist. They have, they have a common life. They have a language. They, they want to decide. They have no place in the world to, to discuss their issues in, uh, in an equal position to other peoples or communities. They doesn't um, uh, exist. Uh, does somebody care that if Corsican people wants one day, now that they, they won the formal elections, uh, they want to decide a different future than what France is preparing for them, they have no possibility to do it because there is no democratic way, mean, in Europe or within France to let Corsican people decide what they want to be. It doesn't exist. We don't care. Because European Union produces money and McDonald's and we have, we have sacrificed many values, many democratic and progressive values, um, only for this um, economic prog pro uh, progress. I'm uh, already finishing, don't scare. Um, <laughs> <coughs> Kurds, uh, in which we have a lot of hope, have identified nation state um, as a factory of the worst values. And these values that um, make the nation state capable to survive um, in, in daily life, which is, which is our factory, which is European factory of the world's values we are basing our society on, which is our, is it, is it, is it the nation state? Probably. All nation states, is it Slovenia the same as Germany? Is France the same as uh, Denmark? Is it the nation states and the financial institutions, so the bank state, the bank state-based Europe, uh, what is uh, the factory of the worst values that are, are being reproduced in our societies and are, are being, um, um, in, in which our society is being based? We have um, a demand on courts, and I talk directly to them. We, uh, we, we really want democratic confederalism to be uh, also a European idea. So we, we do know that uh, maybe not in the exact, exact way you are practicing it or, or, or spelling it in the Middle East, uh, it, it, it will have its place here. But we need as European people and as European peoples and nations and societies and communities to the democratic confederalism to be translated into European language, to have a, an alternative project to the European Union of the banks and of the nation states. We do need it, and we, we ask you and we demand you, please help us to be the platform, the necessary platform, to unify different um, uh, ideologies, collectives, parties, movements, um, nations, or whatever of, uh, in Europe, to think by ourselves how to change um, uh, this Europe, how to make an alternative project uh, for Europe. And for, uh, as, as, as an end of, to my, of my speech, our struggle in, in Catalonia by the, by the coup, by the independentist left move, leftist movement uh, of Catalonia, our struggle has to be the struggle of all people and of all, all peoples of Europe. We do suffer with Greek referendum, we do suffer with Greece, we do suffer with Spanish elections, we do suffer with Portuguese crisis and mobilizations against social cuts. We do suffer about the Basque peace process. So these are all our brothers. So our struggle um, to, um, uh, to get the right to decide for the Catalan people is also the struggle for all our, uh, our brothers and sisters around um, uh, Catalonia. But we do need all these peoples mainly in Southern Europe, but not only in Southern Europe, in, in Eastern Europe, in Central Europe, in everywhere. We do need to to make true, to, to make become true one sentence we have forgotten. That people have the power to change things. People have the power, easy. We have forgotten it. We are not, not anymore used to see social and political changes made out by people mobilizing. Uh, we, we hoped it was in Greece, the, the first point of, of, of this um, um, new start. It couldn't be uh, Greece. It, we will try to, to, to make it 
to make Catalonia the first point of creating a new republic with other values, uh, if we get the right to decide, if we, do, if we fail, if we do not get it, then please, in any place in Europe, somebody has to start to make it real, that people have the power. Thank you, Mireya, for and Kim for that uh, very uh, succinct and clear presentation between the two of you of what you stand for and what you're trying to do. I was particularly delighted in seeing some kind of the diplomacy, people's diplomacy working here and a model of democratic confederalism between Basque and Catalonia you know, coming up right in front of us here. And I hope you will continue this and it becomes a model for Europe to have a more, uh, you know, feder uh, democratic and confederated Europe. So we saw a bit of that diplomacy and I hope you continue it. Um, and I was also interested that, uh, the, the, see, just seeing the, some of the common grounds that you share with some of what Dirlik said earlier, you know, the, the sense of we have lost our values. We have lost what it is to be a community. And we have lost what it is to be human, basically. And that's what I'm hearing from, you know, people everywhere saying and so on. But with that, and thank you very much for bringing out some of those points. With that, I just now want to turn to a, con a person from a country which has been on our minds for a very long time now. And, and been in the news for a very long time and a country's destiny that we have all followed as an international issue because Greece is not only about Greece, as you know, everybody in the world is talking about Greece as an example. And my suspicion is that part of EU's strategy about Greece is to make it an example for the world and for the rest of the thing, you know, I mean, you want to have a democracy, you want to have, this is what you will get. And that's what, at least I understand from what's happening. So I want to invite Angela Dimitrakaki to come and speak to us uh, about Greece and about the movement there. Angela is a writer, a kind of profession that is apt, very, very close to my own heart. Yeah, and all of us like reading novels, and I hope we get to read yours. She is also associated with movements in Greece as an independent person, but she is a Marxist feminist and uh, comes to us with, and she has actually written and spoken on the media about uh, questions about Greece, and she has reported on those issues from the standpoint of the social movements there. So she is, uh, and she has also been involved in organizing several movements in support of the Rojava revolution. She lives in Scotland and so has been involved in another, if you like, self-determination movement. So now we have her, who is uh, the struggle in Greece and the struggle in Scotland. So internationalism embodied in the person of Angela Dimitrakaki. So we are very much looking forward, forward to it. Th thank you. That, that was a little bit of... Uh, <laughs> that, was, that was a bit of an overstatement, but um, it is true that I have voted no in two referendums and they both lost in different ways. Uh, they were both connected. The reason they both lost, although they, lost, they got lost rather in, in different ways, has to do with ideology which was mentioned by our um, keynote speaker, so to speak. And so um, I will come to ideology in a moment. Uh, first, I want to start with art and the opportunities it provides. Uh, um, when I was introduced as a writer, um, I'm an academic, first of all, with uh, the University of Edinburgh, which means I'm a teacher. So, and I teach uh, very often about gender and art and um, to teach about the Kurdish women's movement, for example, in this context is something which I consider a form of um, um, 
some kind of work that can contribute, let's say, something to, to a, a more global moment of revolution. And at, as we speak, uh, things are happening also um, uh, in Greece. I should clarify that I am independent. I do not represent any party. And I'm just uh, someone who was, of course, in Greece throughout for, for over two years. I was away from the university and, uh, and in Greece, so I went through that uh, very important uh, process of radicalization and saw what happened to it. Um, and being, of course, independent means that me as a novelist, you know, to enter a novel with uh, two European women ending in, uh, in Rojava has been, for me at least, and hopefully for the people who read that, uh, a different kind of ideological work, a kind of counter-ideological work um, that we encounter in the mainstream media. As we speak, because art is still happening, and I want to come to the, to the issue of the definition of terrorism, um, there was a, a play, you know, the theater in Greece, which came down uh, recently, and people have been mobilizing um, as to what happened around there. It was censored because uh, the, play the playwright had used excerpts of uh, the notebooks or the diaries of someone who has been uh, convicted for terrorism associated with the 17th of November, uh, which as an organization was folded, we were told, a few years back before the Olympics, so we could have them, um, uh, by bringing the people who brought down IRA. So everything is really connected, is what I'm trying to say. Um, so this is going on, and... Um, Plays and art are very important uh, platforms, I think, for tackling certain issues and making available a different perspective. But what I want to say is that um, not only we need to, to ask um, who is defined as a terrorist, but also what happens to the writings, to the ideas of anyone who is identified as a terrorist. Okay, So, so in that respect, I think it's something we, we really need to keep this as an open uh, question. Now, coming back to ideology that was, uh, that was uh, raised before, I think that um, the reason that the Greek referendum, let's say, of the summer failed and we have this overthrow in effect and, uh, at that point, for me, it was an overthrow of the Greek government because we had an election later. And the EU succeeded in its objective to split the Greek left, as indeed happened with the Syriza party. And one of the main reasons this happened was, of course, the anti-Greek campaign that started right when the IMF took over the country in 2010. And we, we, we witnessed this anti-Greek campaign uh, that Greeks are, what are they? Yes, unproductive, lazy. They live of other taxpayers uh, in Europe. They, um, and they live beyond their means as if credit cards had not been invented, you know, many years back and debt and so on. So if it wasn't for this anti-Greek campaign that literally divided the European, the EU workers um, and presented Greece as an isolated case of exception, I really doubt that the undemocratic um, economic institutions, right, okay, in, in operating in Europe with, with no transparency whatsoever, without uh, the meetings being minuted, things that we found out about in the summer, I doubt that this campaign would have succeeded. So, um, I think that the mainstream media are certainly a very important platform, and when we talk about solidarity, I don't think that the European left uh, had a plan, a counter plan, as to how to uh, kind of really undermine the mainstream media of Europe. So we can say whatever we want about solidarity, but the specific tactics uh, within a, a kind of bigger strategy that we could have are very important to, to rethink. And... Um, to address the question, of course, of this extraordinary uh, revolutionary moment that we find in, in Rojava and in Kurdistan, I think that, in my mind at least, there is no doubt that um, if global capital considers this experiment as something exportable, as something that can be taken up by others elsewhere, it's going to attack it ferociously. As long as it is an exception, that a non-Western exception, as it is being presented, um, it poses no risk and it can be used, you know, in various uh, insidious ways to, to, to, to achieve certain things and especially... Uh, with a little bit of compliment because they front the, the struggle to, against uh, the, that horrible uh, fascist formation, ISIS, which of course names itself, itself a state. 
So um, what I uh, wanted finally to, to say um, is that these three words, democracy, nation, and state, um, as much as terrorism, which I mentioned before, they need to remain open at the moment. We really need to rethink them in the phrase um, a stateless democracy, our aim, of course, is democracy, not necessarily, stateless is an adjective. Uh, we can use a state as uh, a strategy or not, depending on our social, economic, etc. context. Uh, there is not one strategy that fits all uh, revolutionary uh, movements or social movements and so on. Okay, so democracy is also a word that really needs to be qualified. For me at the moment, um, uh, one of the speakers said previously that we have a democracy understood, interpreted in terms of a majority. Of course, this is how the minorities remain minorities. This is a strategy. We don't need a democracy of counting votes, which is what we have now. We need a democracy of qualified social demands, of understanding antagonisms, we are not a we, we are fractured societies, we, have, we exist in different genders and especially social classes, so we cannot forget that. Um, and of course, the nation. The nation is, um, in many parts, I think, of uh, so-called progressive Europe, uh, nationalism is a taboo. We, we, it's not being liked, but of course things are not as simple uh, because even nationalism can become a vehicle for emancipatory values. Certainly it can. And this is something that the left needs to, to, to understand. And of course, um, it is ultimately the left values that we need, the anti-capitalist values, the anti-patriarchal values that we need to protect. So I would not even define democracy as pluralism. I think this is something that we need to, um, to, to, to have a very serious conversation about, as I think it was Jody Dean who mentioned this before. Um, and yeah, I think I'll stop here. I think I had my 10 minutes and we can carry on with uh, discussions and questions from the floor. Thank you. I want to thank all three of the commentators for really keeping to the time. I think it's, uh, you've been very fair to the audience here who are waiting to ask you questions. So, I mean, it's not, yeah, it's not about, uh, you know, cutting you out, but about allowing a facilitating a conversation. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I want to just now turn to Karim Abdian, and uh, Karim is an executive director of Ehwaz Human Rights Organization, and he works with uh, the Iranian Arab communities who are located in the southwestern parts of Iran, and one of those communities, many communities within states who are oppressed and who are marginalized within the state system there. And uh, Karim works with uh, Ahwaz Arab, Arab Alliance, which is an alliance of Democratic Solidarity Party of Ahwaz, or DSPA. And uh, he is uh, uh, also, uh, he strives to promote political and cultural rights of Ahwazi Arabs as minorities in Iran. So Karim, if you can just reflect overall on all of the proceedings and what you've heard so far, that'll be great. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, first, I would like to thank Jonas and all the um, organizers, uh, your team and whoever contributed to, to provide this space, great space, great people, lots of great ideas, excitement. Um, I think what I'll do, um, you know, I'll reflect about what happened yesterday and today. And then, um, uh, yesterday we talked about uh, democracy, failed democracy. Today we talked about various models, autonomous models for the realization of uh, self-determination of peoples and nations. I will talk about that. I'll perhaps I'll critique, uh, you know, one of the major ones that was 
And then at the end, I will um, submit to you, yes, a solution. I talked about my solution in September of uh, 2014 in, in uh, uh, Brussels, except then I was given 50 minutes. <laughs> Today I was given only 10 minutes, but nevertheless, I'll try. You see, uh, nation states, nation states, truly, we talked about nation states. That is the heart of the problem, but it's not the only problem. See, it has two uh, pieces. Uh, nation and state. But let me say something. There are nation states that are democratic. There are nation states that are oppressive. Yesterday we talked about the failed states. I and others said that those so-called democratic states, they are really not democratic the way we define them because they are devoid. They are empty of very important principles. Social justice economic justice, equality, solidarity are not included. Nevertheless, you know, we'll leave them alone. I will concentrate on oppressive states. Those are the problems. If you look around the world in the Middle East, all the hot spots, Yemen, Iraq, uh, Turkey, uh, Syria, uh, I don't know, every, Egypt, uh, Libya, the problem is that there are nation states who are uh, multinational, multicultural, multilingual, multireligious, but one of these ethnic groups rules. Okay, that's what it is. In Iran, there are, like every other country in the Middle East, is non homogeneous. In Iran, there are Persians, Arab, Turks, Baluch, Turkmen, Kurd, right? But the imperialists always gave those states to one of those nation states. In Iran, the dominant uh, na uh, ethnic group, Persian, actually is a minority. The rest are the majority, at least 60, 70%. But nevertheless, you know, uh, Shia is the sole uh, religious and Persia Persian language, the sole spoken language, and so on and so forth. So there are oppression. Arabs, I arguably, Arabs of Iran are the most oppressed nation in the world. Why? Because these five to seven million people, 90% of the oil comes from our land. You think 20% or 10% of is given to the people? Zero percent. Literally, people are dying from hunger. In the past 15 years, since Ahmadinejad, about 420,000 acres of land have been expropriated. You know, the names of the rivers, cities, state, everything has been changed from Arabic to Persian. Okay? Uh, and there are active uh, assimilation, ethnic cleansing, cultural genocide, okay? So that's why when somebody said there is an emergency, true, there is an emergency. So this is not just an academic exercise, but actually there are, like Derek said, uh, uh, there are people's nations who are living today, who are suffering, they are being annihilated. Arabs of Iran, the reason the, the central government wants to annihilate us because they see that there is a, uh, a national awakening among these Arabs. They are going to fight to get their land back. They're going to fight. So they have to forcefully assimilate them, kick them out of their land, bring non-Arab. So that's going on. But I am supposed to talk about internationally, but that goes on in most of the people, in uh, most of the countries, the, the, the problem in Syria, the Shiite, 10% Shiite, Alevite, you know, uh, uh, rule over others in Iraq, the Shiite, or in Pakistan, the, you know, uh, the uh, Baluch and the Sindhis, or in Afghanistan. So then, what's the solution? You see, I criticize this confederalism <clears throat> because 
there are two levels, these states who are oppressive, and unlike Syria, where there is a weak government that cannot annihilate the resistant, right? But you think in Iran, people can create a, a parallel community? They will annihilate you. Even, I argue, in Syria, if it were not for the support of some regional and international powers, you know, our comrades in Kurdistan will be <laughs> eliminated by Turkey, you know? But Bashar al-Assad is paying the politics, you know, Arabs versus Turks and uh, Kurds and everything. So, so there is the nation state. What are we to do, okay? If we say we not, we request the, ro the, the, um, uh, the, the rights of self-determination, why aren't they given to us? Isn't on the books? It is on the books of United Nations, right? We're denied. By whom? The nation states. But is it the nation states? We can rebel. There's another level, the so-called international community. You know? The United Nations. So these, inter, uh, uni these nation states, they have their clubs, their unions, United Nations represents them. They have their armies, NATO. They have their banks, the World Bank, the IMF, right? They get together at uh, Davos and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Aspen and all. So they will uh, deny us the right of self-determination. Why? They think 100 years ago, uh, the uh, British and the French sat down, in fact, a hundred years ago, Sags Pico, and they divided the Ottoman Empire, you know, among them. So the today's borders are based on colonial interests. But this international community regards this as sacred. Really. Go ask any diplomat, what is your job, diplomat? Diplomats get up in the world and they wish for the status quo, right? That's why the international community says that the uh, right of self-determination is meant for people and they're colonial. You Arabs, the colonials are not oppressing you, but we say, what's the difference? In our land, uh, there are none Arab army, police, uh, Arabs are excluded from every aspect of the society. We are marginalized. It is colonialization. What difference does it make that he or she speaks uh, Persian or Farsi or no English? So therefore, we fight for the role uh, the, to, to, uh, uh, to, for independence. They say, no, no. The 1996 UN came up in Barcelona. They said the um, right of self-determination has two parts, external and internal. Okay. I'm very sorry, but you're, you're Can you give me just a No, no, sorry. We have to round up. Okay. The solution, the solution is when you say confederalism, that means it triggers a reaction. They said that's secession. We would love to have secession, but they won't allow us. But confederation, a strong federation like the Swiss uh, uh, uh, experience with a very strong constitution that says people are on the, uh, the resources, the uh, above resources, below resources, and they have all the rights like the uh, uh, American, like the Canadian, like the Swiss, okay, so that we don't confront the so-called international community and their sacred uh, goddamn borders. On the other hand, the nation states, we cannot confront them because they have more uh, uh, arms and everything. So that this may be not 100%, maybe not secession, maybe not sovereignty, but perhaps it gives us 60, 70, 80% where we can out rule our own, build our uh, civil society, build our national uh, police and, and arms and everything until the time that we could, in fact, 
in fact, with the solidarity among other liberation movement, then come up with a better solution. Thank you. Thank you, Karim, for the Okay, thank you, Karim, for that very interesting, and I think you brought an aspect that maybe many people here are not aware of, really. I mean, we know that, you know, Iran is a place where the Baluchis, we know them because they are also our neighbors, and, and like with other things. So I think thank you for that, for that very good uh, intervention there. Uh, now I'd like to open up the floor to questions, and if you can just... Uh, Keep your question brief, and if you want a particular contributor to answer to that, please mention that, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm, okay, maybe, uh, I don't know who wants to answer, maybe Dr. Karim or other. What I understand about the um, uh, confederalism, that um, especially about pay uh, there for courts, that means for them that they will have their democratic state, and even the Bashar Assad would be there, and, but still they would have the democratic state. But what I heard about um, um, Madame Delec, I guess, that she said that no nation can have a democracy when their neighbor have problems. So how the, for Payede that said, for them it is equal, we are kind of biased in this game, that Bashar Assad leave or stays, and still we're gonna have our state, so, um, how we can understand the confederation and having democracy. So I would have asked it about what if happened same in Iran. So what if the people of Iran do the revolution, if every nation gonna stay uh, alone and say, it is, I, I care about my nation and goes to other nation, I don't care about their future. For example, if there would be any revolution in Iran, if again a person would have say, okay, we want the freedom, we want a democracy, but only in our language, and I don't care about uh, other nations. I want to know uh, what is the solution of confederation in these areas when we are facing this, demo uh, this dictatorship with our neighbor that they are also under, under the pressure of these dictators. Maybe Dr. Karim can answer me that, or any other they want to answer yeah, that I question. Think that, I think that's an extremely interesting and a very important question that you raise. So maybe, you know, I mean, the question of confederation, is it something that works within the state of different nationalities? Or is it an international concept beyond the existing states? How does that work? So I was wondering if maybe, you know, Dilar, you could open it up and then Karim, you could respond to it. That'll be great, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the uh, respondents uh, for you very meaningful um, questions and uh, I really liked the question that uh, our friend asked about uh, that so I think it should be understood that when we say we cannot have freedom in isolation of course that means we will have to struggle for everyone so when we say we want democratic autonomy in Kurdistan we also say we want to democratize Turkey we want to democratize Syria Iran and Iraq and we want to have this as a transnational project because we do not consider ourselves as a nationalist movement. And in fact, if you look at um, what has been done in Rojava over the last couple of years, um, and similar things have happened in other parts of Kurdistan, is that there was a, a very, and I think the people, some people here are from Peyede, Zuhat Kobani had to leave, but maybe some people from the Peyede can also answer this better because they're actively involved in that diplomacy process is that, um, I mean, most recently the Syria Democratic Forces have been built, which is an alliance between the Kurds, Arabs, um, the, the different Christian peoples, uh, the Chechens, and et cetera, in that region to have a common military front. The transitional parliament of Rojava consists of uh, every component of that region. The social contract has been drafted by all these communities together. So in fact, in 2004, the Assad regime committed the Qamishlo massacre uh, in Qamishlo against the Kurdish population. And since 2004 and before that too, uh, the Kurds have been massacred, imprisoned. I mean, since the 60s, since the rise of the Ba'ath regime, there has been this, uh, the, the, the, a lot of 
active policy to marginalize and discriminate against that region. So it's not like the Kurds have never suffered under the Assad regime. Since 2004, especially, we have seen several uh, proactive engagements of the regime to just destroy that population there. So in that sense, when the uh, war in Syria began, especially in 2012, when the regime withdrew from the Rojava areas, what the Kurds have said, we will not align with Assad. We have always been against Assad. And there's, I mean, they have been massacred by the Assad regime. And on the other hand, they have seen that there, I mean, of course, there, there was a very beautiful civil society in Syria, a very strong democratic uh, movement. And the people who went out on the streets in Syria, uh, just like in many other Arab countries, were really people who wanted to democratize. They really want to change. They really said, it's enough now. We can no longer suffer under this. And similar things happened in Iran uh, before that. So when... Um, so this is, of course, this is just like we say, this is another manifestation of these democratic forces. But then, unfortunately, uh, for all peoples of Syria, uh, the opposition became increasingly handpicked by... Uh, global powers and by local powers. So Assad, unfortunately, uh, I mean, he has said it over and over again, there is no opposition in Syria. There was an opposition in Syria and they have killed it. They have killed it. And what the Kurds have said is we will not be on the side of this uh, so-called pseudo-opposition which is supported by Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, the US and so on. And on the other hand, we have this oppressive dictator. We want a third way. So what you have, especially in this, I mean, first of all, I mean, the board, what borders Rojava is Daesh. It's not the regime, it's Daesh. So right now their priority is Daesh, right? And they say, we want, I mean, and this is clear in every institution in Rojava. I've spoken with Arab people, I've spoken with the Christian people there. They are active in the armed resistance forces. They're taking part in the politics there. They're active in the civil society. So many people, Arab people from different parts of Syria have gone there to see, is this a model that we can also implement? And I think this is what matters to us. We really, uh, I mean, after the Kurds were not invited to Geneva 3, um, Ilham Ahmed, um, she's a, a woman, who, she was supposed to be part of the Rojava delegation to Geneva, but it didn't happen. She said, our opposition, our fight, our solution will be inside Syria. We do not, we not need conferences like Geneva. We will build a democracy on the ground. And I think, really, it would be it would have been so much easier for uh, Rojava to just assert this kind of Kurdish-dominated region. But really, at least I know that so many Kurdish people feel that we say this from the bottom of our heart. We, we do not want freedom for ourselves. We really mean it when we say we want peace and justice for all peoples. And I think when, uh, when you look at the project of the People's Democratic Party, Dilek Ocalan is here as an MP. Uh, she had to leave, but uh, it's basically a return to the unite, uniting of the Kurdish freedom movement with the Turkish left and with all democratic forces in that region. Now this is the first time in the fascist Turkish parliament which says every citizen of this country is Turkish that you have Armenians, that you have Christians, that you have uh, Assyrians, uh, Yezidis, Alevis, Muslims, everyone together under the umbrella of the same party. Because this is the kind of freedom we want. And that's why we say Kurdistan is in many ways universal because it's not about the Kurds. It's really not just about the Kurds. The fact that we've been divided into four has taught us a lot. And in that sense, uh, we, I mean, nobody has ever said, you know, Assad, the, maybe the things that you're referring to are things like, you know, it's, it's not just about Assad. And I agree, it's not, it's not just about Assad. And it's also not about uh, just Daesh. It's also not just about Al Nusra. It's about the system. What we want is to change the system, the, the look, premises can I, can of the I system. Can I just say, if you can just. Yeah, summarize. sorry. I really just wanted to give a good answer to what she says because yeah. it's really, it's so important. And platforms like that are here to communicate, really. This is a war that, uh, this is a revolution with all peoples. It cannot go just uh, without them. Yeah. Thank you. But I'm sure question. the audience have many more questions. Yeah, there are really two, two aspects of this. One is, I think, any good idea.